Real Life Street Stars. We're here with Jaguar Wright. What it is? Legend in the building. You really need no introduction, but for those who are deaf, dumb, and stupid, or just mad young, because we got a lot of are just young. mad young. Well, then I'm glad they don't know me. <laughs> Want to know why? Tell us why. Because it's nice to be new 20 years later. Hey, Amen. It's nice to be you new 25 years later. People always, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. Please. That means I still got work to do. That means I still got, I got room to run. See, when everybody knows who you are, now you got something to live up to. And if you don't live up to that, then you're old news. I'm always new news. Always. <laughs> I, go, I went on my feed today and I, I, 20 people, I feel so bad. I never knew. I, oh, my God, I can't. I've been hearing that every year for 25 years. See, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. <laughs> it's not a sprint. Not at all. Hey Amen. Tell us how you got your start. <laughs> right. You, we, don't have, we don't have that kind of time. This is, give a, is there a summarized version? <laughs> I'll do my best to abridge it. Um, okay. I was born gifted into a family of gifted people that had no appreciation for the entertainment industry because my grandfather was a song and dance man and missed his big shot at the Cotton Club and never let anybody in the family forget it. So... I had the gift. Um, I sang before I spoke. The first sentence that came out of my mouth was a song. I didn't talk until I was four. I didn't trust people. At four, you didn't trust people? No. Damn. You should see my baby pictures. You should see my baby pictures. Damn. There is not a picture where I'm not like this. Am I lying? Todd, will you tell him about the picture? With me and my family picture, and I'm sitting there looking at the camera like, what you looking at? I've been that way my whole life. I, can't, I, I was born like this. So, um, yeah, I started playing piano at five. I became a concert piano by the age of 10. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long, sordid story. I sang in the church. I started uh, doing jazz quartets when I was 12 because I was the only person that was free during the summers, and I knew how to sing everything, Billie Holiday, Nina Simone, you know, the whole nine yards. So that's what I did for a summer job in music anyway. Um, and then uh, I decided I wanted to be a writer and I, I, I decided I wanted to be an MC. That was my life. Did you get in the game as a writer first or, a, or as artist? I got into the game as an MC first. Gotcha. What was your first song? I'm just curious. My first song? Your first, like the first my song. My first song released on the your radio? Your first song released on the radio. Can You Feel Me by the Fat Cat Click. Mm, Co-produced by Jay. Yep, Co <laughs> from Philadelphia. Yellow Wallet. From Philadelphia. The Fat Cat Click. Who and of course they thought they were being clever because they hired Jaguar to write the hook. And um, it was uh, co-produced by James Poyser, who is now on the Tonight Show, on the Fallon Show. That's crazy. So, yeah. so you got that was on, the first record. So you got on as a, a solo MC first. Yes. Out of Philadelphia. Yes. Right. Um. From there, what happened? Like, I mean, did, did that propel you to a different level to get noticed from different people? There's so or? many. You see, like I said, it's a hard story to tell because right. there's so many facets to it. Um, I, started, I started interning at Philadelphia International Records, The Sound of Philadelphia, for, you know, my, my, my godfather in music, my uncle, Kenny Gamble, and Leon Huff when I was 11 years old. So I was actually in the studio. I, I got to see Phyllis Hyman sing Meet Me on the Moon. I got to see her record that record. I was empty in trash cans. I thought Uncle Kenny was being cruel because he put me on the trash detail. What I figured out later was it put me in every room. So I got to see every session. I, I grew up with Gerald Levert. I, he was my first mentor as a writer. Um, I started writing for him, me and Scott Storch, when we were kids. And, um, you know, Gerald was a friend. You know, he, he was my everything on so many different levels. Huh? Yeah, I know. Rest in peace, Gerald Levert. Uh, Love and Consequences. My mama used to jam that every day while she was cooking. And that, I saw that's that album made. Album. Hey, that's big for me right there. I no saw lie. that album made. That album a classic. Uh, Gerald, I'll never forget one day, he came into the studio when we were writing at Sigma. And this was when me and Scott were dating. And um, briefly, 
Scott Storch. And, um, oh, Scott like he, he brown sugar. <laughs> Scott like the black women. Huh? That's all he likes. Unfortunately, he likes used vagina rather than pristine vagina. So me and him didn't last long. Well, when you start dating porn stars, oh, when you start dating porn stars, I was like, nigga, you like everything brand new except for pussy. But can what you, are you can doing? You blame the white man for wanting some black porn star for You don't bring Heather Hunter home and try to and try to wife her up. Yes, you do. Why? <laughs> Heather Hunter. She brought her work home Prime with her. Heather Hunter. She brought her work home with her. <laughs> Not feed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to come home. Oh, honey, we're almost finished recording this scene. You don't want to see your girl like that. <laughs> Have you seen this generation of women we do right now? See, Only fans you know what? You just proved it. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. And you want to know why I can say that? Because I remember a time when being a drug addict was a bad thing. Thanks. I remember a time where being a caught up hoe ass chick was not the thing you wanted to be. See, I don't know what happened in music. Um, we went from high vibration to low vibration. And somewhere along the way, being a drug addict with no fucking vocabulary ran through at 25, ready to die, played out like a fucking Jerry curl. It's cool. I don't know that. I don't, I don't, we don't, I'm my generation, and we were generation X. I don't understand me, that. Me and, I don't uh, understand uh, these girls. Uh, I, I was having this conversation with somebody and I had a theory. I felt like as a people, we've gotten to well, the younger generation. Well, all of us, not all of us, but young and middle, We've gotten to a point to where we're just so sad that any type of stimulant. Oh, you're not sad. Oh, okay. Sadness is an emotion. Fact. You feel no emotions. You are all numb to life. You have been trained to be numb to life. You have been desensitized beyond your comprehension. So you can't use words like emotions when you don't have them. You're not sad. It is sad, though, that you have the loudest voice in the world and you'd rather be mumble rappers than show people how brilliant you are. You'd, ra you'd rather be dumb for money than be brilliant for legacy. It's sad. Babe. I mean, I can go back and remember <clears throat> some of my first rhymes from when I was... I remember when we went through the whole don't curse era. Right. You know, Don't Curse era was early 90s. Nobody was cursing in rhyme. We wanted to show how smart we were. We were. I carried a thesaurus and um, a dictionary in my backpack with me right. every day. I've read the dictionary 15 times. I've read each, thes each thesaurus from Webster's on to the, to the no-name brands about 25 times because I wanted my vernacular to be so tight, see. But y'all school system was probably a little bit better than the South. When I first, and see, and this was back when I was on my organized confusion, like organized confusion, they were the revolution when hip hop was changing, you know. And um, I had a song that I wrote called Soul Snatcher. I did it for. Um, <laughs> hold on, wait, wait, wait. I did it for the, you, ain't just gonna, you ain't just gonna casually say Soul Snatcher. Are we, what, what kind of Soul Snatcher are we talking about? Okay, so basically, <laughs> um, let me see if I can remember it, because uh, I wrote this 24. Five, six, seven years ago, uh, to snatch and not to snatch. That is the question as I come for your soul with aptitude. My attitude is very shaken. Like an abandoned child by their mother, father, sister, or brothers with your mothers, I'm killing you, killing you softly with poisonous venom so vile. And exhale, I strangulate whole nations. Termination be my specialty. Come and play with me if you choose. I deal on dangerous levels like a high risk abortion, extortion, my middle name. You play the game and I shall shame your name and claim you in the name of my master, demonic possession, the only chapter I spill. The rapture will catch you up, abruption, destruction, and Annihilation, desolation, catastrophe. Fees I charge for my diabolical ideas. Careers I have destroyed. Employees I have exploited. Head over your head, it is gone once again. See, my friends are few and my enemies are more than few. Miss Cone Strew, if you want to, and Jaguar is coming for you with the wrath and the rage of all law. God is my witness. I'm going to end this meaning you. And I'm trying to remember the rest. Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. So. Well, I did. I just said I had a I, I had a whole hip hop crush on Pharrell Munch. <laughs> um, and then you know, there are things that you know I, I started bending, um, bending my 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 flow into songs. See, 
So I never stopped rhyming. Um, it was funny because I was talking earlier about it, how at one point in time in the city, everybody was like, yo, Jaguar the MC, she hot, she hot. Oh, no, I know Jaguar the singer. It got to the point where people were arguing about who the real, I don't know about no fucking fake singing, bitch. Jaguar is an MC. And then when they would meet me at the, the trade shows or at the, they were like, well, are you Jaguar the singer or are you Jaguar the MC? I was like, I am. I am. You, what do you mean you are? I am all of those things. That's all you? And then, you know, the gimmick with singing and rapping females became hot. Missy and then Lauren. And Honestly, I sat down with my Uncle Kenny and I was like, I can't do both because everybody's doing both. It's a gimmick. It's not going to make me special. What, what, what do I need to do? He said, pick a lane and drive steady. That's what Kenny Gamble said to me. Pick a lane and drive steady. So I, I chose singing. Think that was, hindsight being 2020, do you think that was good advice or bad advice? Of course advice? it was. Hmm. Who wants to be a female rapper with the shelf life? Hmm. A, female, a female rapper's shelf life at maximum is 12 years. By then you either have to have an acting career or a product. Otherwise you're done. Who's booking Rod Digger? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, like yeah. I said, <laughs> you have a shelf life, and then by that time, you have to have something else. Luther Andros died a vocalist. Whitney Houston died a vocalist. How many female MCs you know died a female MC? What? See, they, they get you to put your ass in your titties, you know all out, all over the place, see? It didn't used to be that way. See, being the sexy, cute tomboy used to be the way. And then Biggie Smalls came in with Jessica Rabbit, Lil' Kim. What I find interesting is that for the past 25 years, everybody's been trying to be Lil' Kim, and all Lil' Kim was a figment of Biggie's imagination. He figured, all men probably get off on the same shit that I do. We can make a lot of money. And now, everybody wants to be this archetype. It wasn't until Little Kim that sex played a factor in whether or not a woman got signed. Makes sense. Yeah, so does crack. <laughs> Nigga, that's real as fuck. So does crack. Crack sells, still sells. Heroin is big and crack is still selling. You want to aim high or you want to aim low? So, how do we repair our culture? How do we repair this? Well, number one, you have to, you would have to strip yourselves of everything that you think you know. You, you would have to be willing to say, everything that I have in here is total and complete bullshit, and I need to start all over like I'm two years old and relearn life again. That takes dedication. Because see, most of you are comfortable in the lives that you live. You like your party, you like your car, you like your girlfriend, you like this, you like that. What if I told you that in order to become a billionaire, you would have to be homeless first? Believe that. Would you do it? See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? <laughs> Am I guaranteed to become a billionaire? Just ask. What guarantees do you have in life other than your hard work and sweat? What other guarantee do you have? None. Yeah. So at the end of the day, see, do you see how you went with that? Before you actually said whether or not you could commit to it, you had to, you, you had to have a, um, um, a, back, a backup plan. Okay? There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee you're going home today. Everybody wants guarantee. Everybody wants an instant gratification. It's going to happen for me. It's going to be this way. Yet the best things that happen in life are surprises. Want to know Why? Because you didn't know them. You want to know why you didn't know them? Because if you had known them, you'd have fucked it up. That's why God don't let us see certain things. Because he knows as human beings, we are designed to hate ourselves. When you go down and you, 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 you start fucking with somebody else and boom, 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 everything that you're picking out about them is everything that you hate about yourself. You can only talk about what you know about. 
If you know about that man's demise, it's because you live in the same one. You're just hoping that people look at him and don't look at you. See, I call that the dirty cheat, the dirty t-shirt test. Now, you take somebody with a fresh white tee and put them here. And you take somebody who has some mustard stains and they wash it, but they didn't use no bleach and they in the middle, it's clean, but you know, yeah. And then you take the motherfucker with the dingy ass shit with the stains all over it. Now I want to ask you a question. Who do you think the person with the, with the not so dirty but dingy t-shirt wants to stand next to? person with the fresh white tee. Why? Because he going to... The fresh white tee look white. His shit don't look so white. Yeah, because next to that dirty nigga, he doing great. I feel like you're so wise. Like, I feel, like you can only get this type of wisdom going through some shit. Yeah, like, I've been through some shit. Yeah, so let's let's get it, <laughs> let's let, let's get into it, man. Let's get let's get into it. All right. You 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 you've been in the headlines. You've been yeah. in the blogs. You've been in the blogs. Um, my conversation on it's gonna be minimal. Facts. Okay. Um, and the reason why it's gonna be minimal is because I do have other interviews to do, and what I don't want to do right. is give too many details. Facts. For the interviews that they need to pay me for away, so that they don't have to talk to me at all. That's a fact. That's so, a fact. That's a fact. If I give you the greatest interview right now. They don't have to pay me at all. They can just pick through yours and come up with their own story. That's a fact. So let's touch on what, what can we touch on? I mean, you could touch on whatever you want to touch on, and I'll tell you <clears> what <throat> I can answer and what I can't. Okay. So but I promise you, right. I, you will get detail. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So um, let's start off like this. So from you being an MC to you getting into the Roots, how was that transition? How did you get into... I didn't want to be a part of the Roots. So how did you... Why did you become a part I of I fell in love with Richard Nichols' mind. I wasn't allowed to go to art school. I had to turn down my scholarship to Juilliard. I was supposed to go to Syracuse, and then from there I was supposed to go to law school, Harvard, and become a corporate litigator. That's what my father wanted for me. I decided to become a drug dealer and a pimp, and I got thrown out of school in about eight months. I had to, you know, I did shit. <laughs> That's, that's, I was from North is, Philly and it was easy money. Right. So would you say that you were just a, a product of your environment, like the, the surroundings led you to I'm, do that? I'm, or? I'm a product of everything. Yeah. I, I grew up amongst wealthy people and poor people all the time. I left the suburbs to move back to the projects. Interesting. When my friends would come home with me in the summer and they would see the big house and the big yard or when we would go down to Atlantic City to my aunt's store or when we would go to the horse ranch in Hamilton owned by my family, my friends would say, y'all got all this and you want to be in the projects? I'm like, yeah. Why? Because they sell hugs at the corner store. Mm. I love hugs. They sell oatmeal pies. <clears throat> I can't get that in the suburbs. They play double dutch until the lights come on and then it turns 3D and then we keep jumping. I can't do that. Yeah, it's I can't, different. It's, I can't do that different. on Centurion it's Drive. It's a little fun in the hood. It really is. Yeah, you're right. That's a fact. I was who I was. I grew up in the projects. My family got it together. They moved to the suburbs. I went back to the projects. Then I had to go to boarding school. And when I went to boarding school, on the weekends, when classes were over, I was on the first thing smoking in Brooklyn. See, I am the street. Right. I've been the street. I've dealt with everything from true gangsters to corporate billionaires. My friends are trash men. They're congressmen. I'm just the street. Right. Just like Malik was. He was the street. Right. Just like Bahamadia is. She the street. Some niggas live in the streets. Some niggas just are the streets. There's a difference. So, so hip hop, the roots, all of that. At the time the roots were approaching me, we had just started Black Lily. I figured it would be a good shot to build up my name in Manhattan. I didn't expect it to get as big as it did. It got huge. Right. <clears throat> Lines wrapped around the corner week for week for week. Right. You could walk through anywhere in lower Manhattan and people say, who you going to see on, you going to see Jaguar. Yeah, and you said you built that up from being the person that was first and everybody end up wanting to see you to the point where you had the headline. I had to go on last. <laughs> right, you had the headline. Mani the, the, the Roots management didn't make me the headliner. Right. The owner of the club did. Right. Because the bar was losing money because every time I got off stage, the club emptied out. Right. 
They had to put me on last. It was a smart business decision. So, so from that, right, I mm -hmm. know Meg Thee Stallion, she had a quote that said, black women are so unprotected, right? And just hearing your story, it sounds like the same case, like nobody- It's not just looked, black women either. It's well, all that's women. true. That, that's, that's a fact. But, you know, me being a black person, I'm just going to target, you know, we're going to focus on- I got it, but you on, know what, though? I'm going to tell you something <clears> right now. When a woman gets raped, it doesn't matter what fucking color she is. Oh, okay. So, okay. That's, hurt pussy is hurt pussy. Yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. Ain't got shit to do with color. That's a fact. That's a fact. Because they'll rape a black one, they'll rape a white one, they'll rape an Asian one. And then guess what? Some of these women have children from their rapes. And now you got a mixed kid who's confused, product of a rape with a mother that doesn't really know how to love him. Like, it, it, I am not saying that we don't have to be cognizant as African Americans. I'm saying the biggest problem with this fucking country is that that shit actually matters. Right. I'll never forget when I first got sent to London. I was getting in too much trouble in them streets, see? And I had to go to London. And I'm sitting there looking at interracial couples. Man, black as tar, woman white as, white as snow. And I was the only fool staring because I was the only American present. Mm. This is the only country where your color matters, which is why I'll be retiring in France. I will not get old in America. America doesn't like old people. That's crazy. So that that whole experience, like, like you said, that's 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 some deep thing, you know, right? That's deep. You know I'm what I'm saying? Tell you something right now. It's common. It is that's common. Crazy. That's crazy. Do you, is it? So how are these how are these people able to keep going on with the career? What do you mean doing these heinous crimes? What do, what do you mean? Like I'm just saying. You ain't like, never had a boy that you know did a whole bunch of dirt and you let him make it. You telling me that never happened? You never had somebody in your life who you know was dirty, who you know did dirt, and you let them make it. I, hear, I see what you're saying, but... Think about that on a corporate level. Right. On a corporate level. That's wild. R. Kelly was the first corporately sponsored pedophile in the United States. Everybody knew. That's why I couldn't really watch that documentary because half of the people that was in there, I can't believe he did it. Nigga, you used to go get the bitches too. I watched you, dog. I watched y'all make these deals. Don't nobody want to talk about Aaliyah. Don't, want, don't nobody want to talk about that. Let's talk, let's talk about it. There's certain things about that I won't talk about. <laughs> I'll let Dame Dash talk about it. See, that's his business. Thanks. And when he's ready to talk about it all, I'll corroborate every word that he says. But it's not my story to tell. But it's real. It's real. How does a 14-year-old girl get married and no adult in the family knew? Unless, I'm just saying, I heard you uh, say something earlier to the effect of... Um, it's fucking awful what they did to that woman. It's fucking awful. She was amazing. Aaliyah said, was um, amazing. Yeah, she really If she had been alive now, there's a lot of people that wouldn't have jobs. Funny how that worked out for some people. You know, one thing I learned um, about in jail, when I was in jail, fighting, clear my name, I learned how to move niggas around, see. See, when you in county jail, you want to really survive and be cool, you got to learn how to move people around. Oh, this chick going to be a problem. She likes to fight over the ice. Hmm. What code violation can we set her up for? Oh, you got to go to PC. You learn. They do the same shit in the industry. They move niggas around. You know, it's all fun until the rabbits got the gun. Uh, I heard you say earlier that um, this shit doesn't, the music shit doesn't really bother you because you were so busy being great at other things. Yes. How is it that you are able to 
have gone through so much. Things that would physically have put have people in like facilities. How do you still? How are you still able to cope? Because it this was you know. It oh, I had like a nervous PTSD. breakdown. Yeah, it sounds like PTSD almost. What do you mean? I've had PTSD since I was seven years old. I'm from North Philly. Yeah, that's, that's facts. North Philly is PTSD on steroids injected into your neck. First time I saw the man killed in front of me, my uncle did it. He blew a hole through somebody. All I know is we was playing jacks on the step. I heard a man running, screaming, no, no. And he jumped over our head. He took off running. He didn't make it but 50 paces. And then I seen the hole go through. And then I, heard, I felt the smoke and, and, and the gunpowder fall on my head. I was three years old. First time I seen a man's guts all over the concrete where we played jacks and hopscotch. I know what it's like to have your cousin high on LSD, acid and everything else, and accuse you of stealing money that's sitting there right in front of you and bend you over and sodomize you for stealing what is right there in his face because he's too high to see it. And then dump you in a closet and tell you to go to sleep. That was 10. Fuck you been through. I ain't been through shit. It gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. Imagine sitting in your living room, minding your business, watching uh, Mari Povich or something. Back then it was Richard Bay. And five men come through your front door and they stay for two days. And we didn't talk about the weather. I've been through more things than, than most of you will ever fucking be able to understand or know. I know what it's like to wonder whether or not when that door come up, are they going to let me out or are they going to blow my fucking brains out? Y'all niggas is soft. Y'all kids, you're fucking soft. You like to shoot up everybody and shoot up everything because you don't know how to fight. <clears throat> I wish a nigga would try me even right now. I wish a nigga would. I could use the practice. I'm serious. Life has been serious for me. Yeah. Let me ask you this, like any 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 female entertainer or artist trying to do music, right? Yeah. What would be your advice to them? You know Don't. what I mean? Oh. Unless you built for it. I would never wish this career on any woman. There's only three different kinds of careers in this world where a woman's safety and, 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 and respect for her body are, are totally disregarded. Strippers, sex workers, and female entertainers. We are treated no different than prostitutes because we're entertainers. Well, that's what, that's what the word actress used to mean back in the 1800s. It meant prostitute. We're the meat. Judy Garland used to say it best. They come and they love me while I'm on stage. And then I go and I take the, I take the, the clothes off and it's just me and the bag of bones. Wondering when it'll all be over. Judy Garland said that about her experiences. She was in one of the greatest American films of all time. You remember? What's the name of the movie? The Wizard of Oz? If you knew how many times they took a piece out of her while she was going down the yellow big road, she was probably clicking them damn shoes hoping that they worked for real. Or how many young child stars get passed around at parties? If you actually knew the stories about Michael Jackson. If you actually knew what they do to children. What they did to my, 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 my very close friend, Latoya Gaines, Rosie Gaines, daughter from New Power Generation. Her and Tevin Campbell were very close. I, I know Tevin, but we're not friends. Him, him and Latoya were friends. 
How does a boy with a voice like that, that had the records that he had that could have easily transformed into one of the greatest male vocals of all time, end up prostituting himself for drugs and change on Hollywood Boulevard? How does that happen with a gift like his? My advice to any female who wants to get into this business, have a thick skin, do not drink alcohol, never get high in front of anybody, keep somebody close to you that you know at all times, summer. Has anybody bothered to ask why she all of a sudden became claustrophobic and couldn't perform anymore because she had anxiety? Yeah, she got anxiety. Somebody touched her. I don't know it for a fact, but I seen it in a, I heard it in, I know, I know the sound. I can look in a woman's eyes and tell when she's been touched. She don't trust none of the people that she around, so she just gonna stay off the road, you see. Now for every name that I can tell you that you know, I can give you about 55 to one of all the ones that didn't make it, but got the stories. See, those are the ones, those are the worst ones. Because you got ran through, you, got, you went through all of that, and then you made it to the deal, and then, and then, and then you ain't get no deal. But, but you got all the horror stories, though. That's why women in this game go so hard. This is my spot. It's my spot. And it's worse in hip-hop than it is in singing. Guard your loins. Until we find a way to change the way women are treated in this industry, guard your loins. Because it doesn't make any sense. If I go to work and I sing my heart out and I do a concert and I got to do the meet and greet and I got to do to this and I got to do to that and yada, 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 whoop de whoop de woo When I get on my bus, I'm going to be what? I'm going to be tired, right? I'm going to want to get some sleep, right? Right, right. Am I going to want to see a whole bunch of noise and hear a whole bunch of foolishness? So me walking into a fucking gangbang and niggas saying, oh, let me move out the way with your dick in somebody's mouth. You could get in your bunk. I don't know whose juice is laying all over this shit. Who the fuck want to deal with that? Really? Crazy. Or got to worry about whether or not when I get in my bunk, if somebody's going to cry, climb in my bunk with me. It's the only fucking profession where women can be sexually assaulted and there's nobody to go to because whoever they would go to would rather make the money than do what's right. That's how R. Kelly became R. Kelly. Morals. Money over morals? What morals? Saying, what it's the music like, industry. Yeah. Where the mo wait, what morals? No, I'm saying it's, they're choosing money over morals. But Listen to me. It's deeper than that. It's not even money. See, it's power. It's dominion. Are you spiritual? Of course I am. So, it, do, do you, like, this praying and, like, how do you... How did you get through this? Because it's a lot to carry. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of burden to carry. You know what I mean? Like Alcoholism for a while. You know, I, I used to think I was taking a drink and the pills to numb the pain in my back because I have severe scoliosis. Right. It was to numb my head. Because I would walk off those buses and leave those girls there. I would walk out of those hotel suites and leave those girls there knowing what was going to happen to them. And I didn't say shit because I had to keep my mouth shut so I could keep my spot. Speaking of um, scoliosis, you, you came up um, with your own products. Yes. Triple D. Yes. Uh, Triple D Cafe. Yes. Um, CBD, um, your own brand that you made. You said that it actually helped you deal with some of that pain. Oh, correct? absolutely. Especially oh. my salve. I mean, my salve is a miracle. It's infused with sour diesel, CBD. CBD sour diesel. Okay. Here, smell it. Yeah, come smell. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you. <laughs> On camera. 
<laughs> Does anybody have any aches and pains? Do you have Do you have any aches and pains? Uh, like, do you have issues with your knees or with your wrists? Sometimes my back hurt, you know, okay, well, from heavy lifting. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he did right, say right, it smooth. Right. Like, well, I didn't mean it like that. But, so you know. <laughs> right, right, right. I didn't mean it in that form, but you know, I do have back pains from lifting heavy material and stuff like that. Are you hurting anywhere right now? Okay, now Nick see that no that I, I that I can work with. Yeah, that's more professional. Lift your sleeve up. <laughs> All right. Yeah, right. I can't say. I can't. I can't go in like this. Yeah, shout out! Shout back. out to uh, Jaguar Wright, real life. Yeah. Shout out politicians. Shout out to black. Shout out to this black queen with her products, man. Triple D Cafe. Y'all make sure y'all tap in. I got some of this juice. I don't know what what that's the watermelon what, tea. This the watermelon tea, tea. Mm -hmm. man. This shit is so delicious. So what is this right here? This is what, my salve. Right. What is it called? Other than it's salve? called salve. Like, I mean, like you know, CBD salve. Oh like, no, it is CBD. Okay. This okay. is CBD. So oh, you, jag salve. Jag salve. Mm -hmm. So the jag put a salve on a dog. Canine keys. Mm -hmm. Canine keys. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Animals gotta look out for each other. Right. 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 All right. You can pull it down. I appreciate that. I'm about to notice them. I had a, a fight a few years ago, and I just give it a couple session. minutes. Relax. Yeah. So, so for, for for you, you just rub some salve. But can you explain to the audience what that does? Um, it does. You said it helps with the pain. So, like, let's say I have severe back pains. Can I use this product? Actually, you know what? Can my husband tell you? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Come, come, on, husband, come on. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> just grab. You can just my grab. My husband them. is a war veteran. There you go. You can just grab the mic. You ain't on camera. All right, all right. <laughs> so. Uh, like she said, I'm a war veteran. Operation Iraqi Freedom, Second Wave. We did Shout a whole bunch salute. of movement. Yeah, you know? thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. thank you for your support. So, with issues with my knees and stuff, we'll take a hike, and my knees start burning. So, we'll probably do like a two-mile hike, come home, and can't move. Right, right. So, uh, Jack made the salve. She said, let me rub this on your knee. So, I don't know, baby. You know, I don't know if it's going to work. So she put it on my knee. As soon as she put it on my knee, within five minutes, it stopped burning. That's now my right knee was still burning. So now she rubbed <laughs> that one. Yeah. And after that, so I got up gone. and I could go play ball if I wanted Let's to. Let's go. You know what I mean? So Let's go. Brand hey, new it's, knees, it's a miracle, miracle. I've tested it on white people. I've tested it on Asian people. I've tested it on African-American people. Different ages. Different everything. And... It's the same result. My mother has severe arthritis in her hands. Her hands will swell up to here. And you can't see the veins, you can't see the bone, nothing. I gave her a hand massage. That was, what, six days ago? She couldn't move her hand. She couldn't even get into the refrigerator because she couldn't do it. She's walking now. She did full body, body rub down. She's walking now. And her hand went back to normal. And it has, and it hasn't swollen back up since. And, and, it, and these are your own homegrown products that Absolutely. you are creating. That is a Absolutely. blessing. Um, can you also talk about some of the um, the food that you have? Also, you have. Well, I mean, because you're a chef now, people yeah. need to know that you are a chef. Absolutely, let's get it. Absolutely, I mean, I do everything. Um, I specialize in 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 you know classing up comfort food. Um, I think comfort food is amazing. I think a lot of times it's just not properly imagined. So, I mean, when I was on tour, a lot of people would want to go sightseeing and stuff like that. I would go to five-star restaurants and I would volunteer. They call it staging. So I could learn from master chefs. I volunteered in kitchens with Anthony Bourdain to watch that man cook. I learned how to make sushi in Okinawa from a, from, from a real fish god, they call them. There's only about four in the world. They literally get up, they go down to the, to the water, they, they catch the fish, and that becomes the catch of the day, and the sushi meal is made out of that. Nothing fresh and nothing better. It's to the point where he can look in the eyes and not have to cut it open to know exactly what the fat content is. That's how in tune he is with fish. Wow. Real life is coming to invade. <laughs> we coming up here. I want some of that. Well, <laughs> what you need to do is you just need to let us know when you're coming. We do tasting parties once a month where we do full medicated tours from CBD to THC. We create the entire ride. So this way you're coasting and you're chilling and you're having a great time. 
and we try, we'll try not to download you with more than 3,000 milligrams in a full meal. We'll try not to. You have, you have the, the cooking, the salves, the treatments. Um, How's your you, shoulder feeling, by the way? Oh. <laughs> True testament from K9 Keezy. His shoulder is relaxed right now. So y'all go, y'all go tap in. Where can they get these products? Can they get it online anywhere, or is it just you got to pull up? Uh, I'll let my partner let's tell go, you. Let's go, let's go. You can go to Cafe Triple D on Instagram. Uh, also, Triple D Cafe at Gmail. Just drop us a link. Drop us what you like to order. We'll be putting our shipping, our shipping uh, orders out, you know, our directions. Um, you know, if you go wholesale with us, you know, uh, and you do, uh, you know, anything over $200, your shipping is free. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the truth is, is I want to help heal the world in every way I possibly can to make up for our, all of the destruction that I, I brought to it. The things that I say to you, I don't say them to you to, to look down on you. I say them to you because I was worse than you. Oh, I understand what you're saying. I do. I, 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 I really do know it's always a deeper way of thinking and uh, people experience things. Don't play and, it so light. And, and you you actually, are an intelligent yeah. black man. You are the master of your own fate. The white man has been scared of you for years because of everything that is in your blood that all you need to do is activate and you will become the captain, the man of whatever you set your mind to. For 400 years, we were held in captivity. We built this country for them and they still expect us to pay taxes. And yet, we've managed to thrive. They didn't have to do no work. They have 400 years of free labor. And we still have become millionaires and billionaires and this and that. Imagine if we actually really took that and put it to work. Imagine what you could do. Stop playing it so light. You're heavy. Talk heavy, baby. Talk heavy. Talk heavy. Straight out. You got any shout outs? Yeah. Shout out to Jill Scott and Erica Badu. Hope your streams are doing well. Hope you're streaming amazing. I told you, bitch, I hope you make all the money in the world. You can, because you're going to need it, because you'll never have friends. I mean, with the two of you have each other, so shout out to y'all in a big way. In a big way. And, um, you know, strap up. Oh, but wait, but Bundle up. It's a cold world. Before we get out of here, can we, can we talk about the track you previewed? The who? The track, the, the track that you just showed Oh, us. sure, absolutely. Takashi 69 Takashi 69 Look at Me. Okay. Which will be featuring Bahamadia. Hey, when I tell y'all, hey, she bringing it back, that real music, <laughs> that shit that I like. Yo, can, 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 you, can you talk about, you know, your comeback, you know, in music, to the Takashi 69 track, how that came about? It's so interesting because um, I never stopped writing. I never stopped performing. I never stopped recording. I just stopped doing it here in the United States. That's all. I've been releasing projects consistently or been a part of some kind of awesome project every year for ever. I just, I had to play it light because I couldn't make no real money until my son turned 18. I promised my ex-husband he'd never get another dime from me. I meant it. You know child support? Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Like, I can't put no well, I mean, when we were getting divorced, he wanted $8,000 a month, you know? Mary J. Blige can pay Kendu. I wasn't paying that fucker. You can pay him, bitch, like you should, because you stole from everybody else. Now you sitting there paying for all them fucking kids, you ain't even have them, dumbass. Hold Fuck on. Mary J. Blige, too. Hope you're doing well. Shout out to Mary J. Blige. Hope your streams are doing amazing. Hope they give you another season on Umbrella Cal um, uh, what is that? Umbrella, Umbrella Ac Academy, and you actually learn how to read your fucking lines. So, man, what's about what happened in um, the dance arena? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never, I never stopped doing music. I actually have, um, I'm a music hoarder. So I have 
over 565 songs vaulted that just need to be mixed and mastered. I, I write at least 50 songs every year. Oh, wow. So... Yeah, um, I don't know if I would call it a comeback as much as a release. Okay. You know what I mean? Because I just have all of this great music pent up. And then, you know, there's there's the three rock albums that I wrote. I have four jazz albums that I've written that all have not been released. I'm saving them for my play. Um, yeah. Uh, like excellent. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I mean, the truth is, is I'm just, I'm an urban legend in real life. I've always been there. I'm always there. I still pay people for information in the streets where I don't live. That's how much I like to know what's going on in the world. You know, I'm just, I'm G'd up. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey. For anybody who want to get, that wants to do any type of work with you, whether it be the products, you know, or music, how would they get in contact with you? <laughs> We're a team. We're not here. We're a team. Dollar Delphia Productions, 214.5 at Gmail. D A L L A D E L P H I A Productions, 214.5 at Gmail. And I know he's a shooter. Hey, look and, look and, at his and, eyes. Quick, yeah, and quickly. <laughs> Um, Rakim Al Jabbar is that's the homie, man. Um, that's my little brother. I know that's that's why I thought that was throat. Um, super dope artist. Um, can quickly touch on some of the people that you're doing music with and um, uh, Rakim Al Jabbar, Ruben Lau, Just Mandy, Kerryon Johnson, Lala J, formerly of the Badu team. I don't know if she's gonna be on it. I don't, I, I don't even know if any of them are gonna have jobs after I'm finished with them. UPS is hiring. Um, I ain't gonna lie, that UPS hell. It's hot as hell. <laughs> hey, that UPS. I remember one. Now I remember. Hey, good to miss too. I'm gonna tell you like this. I'm gonna tell you like this. I don't know what y'all got going on. I don't know what y'all got going on. My name is Paul. That's between y'all. But I know if somebody say UPS hiring. They done fucked up. That's all I'm like. That, that shit hell. Like, I'm going to tell you my issues. I'll tell you my list of grievances very quickly. I don't like women that are betrayers of women. Number one. And I don't like smart girls who like to pretend to be dumb hoes. Erica Badu has put a stranglehold on this marketplace for over 25 years successfully. Putting herself as the elite and everyone under her. There's 25 Grammy winners, and some of them multi-Grammy winners. In the DFW area, why doesn't nobody know it? There's nothing but monsters here. Rakeem Al-Jabbar, DQ, QP, even Flower Child, though I don't fuck with her. Even Flower Child. I mean, there's amazing talent here. Leon Bridges, Keith Young. Sean Martin, outside. You know what I mean? It, it, it. How can you call yourself an artist and you cheat people out of the opportunity of being artists themselves? Oh yeah, you can be an artist as long as you work for me and I can pay you pennies and I tell everybody you're only available for me and tell everybody that you're not that good and you can't do this and you can't do that. Give me this one reason. The last RC and the Grits album, did you hear it? Why not? They from Dallas. Why didn't you hear that album? It was a dope ass album. It even had a feature from Common on it. Somebody else that she was supposed to be fucking that she never gave no pussy to. But my point is, why didn't you hear the RC and the Grits album? It was phenomenal. You're from Dallas. Why haven't you heard it? I'm actually, I'm actually producer. <laughs> it don't matter. He from Texas. <laughs> I knew he was going there. That's why I told you know what I'm saying. I ain't going to just claim Dallas like they know. Like, you ain't got listen to me. Listen to me. Do you? Then claim Toby. Claim Toby because he the shit. <laughs> she on this nigga. <laughs> But my thing is, is you know who Toby is, but you, you never heard the RC and the Grits album. Now, I want you to think about this. 
who was the who was the celebrity uh, um 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 features on Toby's projects? Nobody. Now, if he had had some celebrities on it, it might have took things right, right? So why did RC and the Grits have multiple celebrity features and nobody even knew that the album was out? He is Erica Badu's musical director, been her musical director for over 10 years. Did you see her putting any post up saying, hey, go buy RC and the, and, and the Grits' new album, the shit is fire, it, it's certified, certified Badu? Did you hear her say that? That's why you never heard the album. But he still works for her. She Harriet Tubman, yo. And she told people she was going to get him to the promised land. And instead they moved to the other side of the plantation and they working for her and they still waiting to get off. How many years before they get off the fucking plantation down here? Another 20? Do we got to wait for the bitch to die? For there to be another star in goddamn Dallas with all this motherfucking talent here. That's why I came here. I'm an anarchist at heart. I came here to set the whole fucking thing free. There's nothing but monsters here. Dallas is constantly underrated by Houston, by Austin, yet two thirds of the talent supplied to Austin come from Dallas. Why the fuck you gotta go to Austin and make it? Shit. Why? Shit. Why you gotta go to, why, do you gotta, why you gotta go down to Houston and make it? <gasps> why? Irvin? Fuck you can't make it from here I'm gonna tell you why Cause there's motherfuckers that don't want you to And y'all celebrate them anyway Fucking haters 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 When are you gonna start a podcast? I'm, I'm subscribing <laughs> day, you, got motherfucker. you gotta do it Oh god damn it man You gotta do it hey, yeah. We'll come shoot it hey, god damn it. <laughs> We'll come shoot the motherfucker <laughs> Excuse me? Say what about what? <laughs> oh, Houston the business. Toby is everything. The only problem I got with Toby is that he did that idol worship with that Badu record. Uh, Erica Badu thinks I'm dope. Miss Badu told me I'm dope. I don't know if that song's going to be so hot now. Because her fucking opinion don't really fucking matter for shit. It's a great record. It was a catchy tune. But I always tell artists, jock yourself. Don't be running around here jocking, jocking. You don't know who these fucking people are. They're fucking animals. They're degenerates. And that I bitch is the biggest fraud anybody ever seen. She came up north. We treated her like shit. We ain't think not no fuck about no Erica. She wouldn't go on stage an hour before me or an hour after me hoping people would forget how dope I was so she could slide in with her mediocrity. Tariq Trotter told her to her face, your lucky Kedar Massenberg is paying us so good because I think you're whack, bitch. And Malik B is the only person that ever showed her any respect and she couldn't even post for him and she called herself an okay player, a platform that I made cool. Fuck you, hoe. Who the fuck gives a fuck what you think about what's dope? Because anything that you think is dope, you slumping. So yeah, that, yeah other than that, Houston's awesome. Toby's the shit. He, he might want to change that song and find a new hero. He might want to find yeah. a new hero because that bitch ain't the business. And Jill Scott, you shouldn't have fucked all my, you shouldn't have fucked all my dudes. You shouldn't have fucked all of your girlfriend's dudes, you hoe. That's why that nigga Joe robbed you. That's why he robbed your house. That's why you got ushered out for bringing all that ghetto shit to Hollywood. Fuck out of here. Fucking Joey Zaza. I'm glad he fucked your place up too, bitch. I ain't here to vet your dick. Ooh, Jack fucked him. It must be good. Fuck you. Find your own tree. Man. We used to be best friends, you know? It's personal. It's personal. Jack Fuck her. Jaguar. I hope your streams are awesome. <laughs> Man. Hey, Jaguar, you, you the motherfucking business out here. <laughs> Podcast drop. <laughs> Man, hey, we love everything we're doing. You love your music, man. You got products. Your products are amazing. You have juices. Go back, Triple go D back and check my feed about 2016. I did a post. I think I'm going to repost it today. 
I said in the post, uh, somebody asked me what I was doing in Dallas. And I said, I'm here to help. Dallas mm -hmm. is awesome. And I'm here to help. And that's mm -hmm. what I've been doing. And you are a real life street star. And unfortunately, if I got to have to move some niggas around mm. to make it possible for the floodgates to come open for all of the great artists that we have here, I'll do it for them. I did it for my home back in Philly. Why wouldn't I do it? I live here. My husband from Oak Cliff. I am Dallas too. Now and always. And the same commitment that I have to Philadelphia is the same commitment that I intend to have to Dallas. And I will not leave here until my work is done. I will not leave here until Rakim Al Jabbar is a multi platinum artist consistently every time he releases. I will not leave here until Lala J wins her Grammy. I will not leave here until Ndambi gets her Grammy. I will not leave here until Madaku Chenwa is actually getting $20,000 a track, like he should be getting paid. Considering how many Grammys he's won. For Miss Badu, by the way, who robbed him. The only smart man in the whole crew was Ty Macklin because he said, Nope, I ain't having it. I want my money. And they still mad at him. How you gonna be mad at somebody for going to court and getting money to somebody owe him? That ain't robbery. That, that's called pay your fair, bitch. You mad at him, you got everybody mad at Ty Macklin, don't nobody want to go to AOE because Ty is a traitor because he wanted his money? I'm sorry, when you go to work, don't you want to get paid? Who don't want to get paid for work that they do? And you can't always pay people in pussy. You're going to have to come up with some bread, eventually. Yeah, that, yeah, that pussy get old. <laughs> Listen to me. Do you want to know what my uncle used to say about vagina? What is it? The only thing better than good pussy is new pussy. No, I had, uh, I you had, stop being new pussy after the first night. I ain't gonna lie. I had this little freak I used to deal with back in the day, mm -hmm. and uh, she really put me on some game. Uh, no two people you sleep with feel the same. Like that's. I never just thought about it like that. Like, it's, it's like that. Well, yeah. I mean, if you want to put it to the test, strap up. You know what I'm saying? Just strap up. You can put it to the yeah. test. Just mm -hmm. strap it up. Yeah, yeah. Right I had on, my man. fun. So. People ask me all kinds of questions about myself. I was a fucking rock star. Mm -hmm. I did rock star shit. And what? Well, I mean, there's no need in judging. All my girlfriends were prettier than most of the guys that I dealt with anyway. <laughs> I, I, you know, I used to tell my ex-husband all the time, you, you need to stop fucking with me because I'm the only reason you still get good pussy. You are an alpha female. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I call you yeah, Jack. Are you a Leo? I don't lie. No, I'm a Taurus. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure yeah. this out. Yeah. Two days, two days before Malcolm X. Three days after Raphael Sadiq. You do the, the, the K out the window. <laughs> Nigga! Yeah. Miss oh, like, Jaguar, you are a real life street star. Thank you for coming. Triple D Cafe! Triple D Cafe, it go, was go, lovely. go fuck with it right now, man. Can, can I say one thing to you guys? I like what you're doing here. We trying. No, I like what you're doing. Do more. We're going to come more. shoot your podcast. <laughs> Fuck you mean. <laughs> and, and, and on that, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. Good night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out real street stars, nigga. Moving. Hey. What's up, y'all? I'm Jaguar Wright. You might remember me. And I just got finished doing another interview with Real Life Street Stars. It was awesome. So subscribe and keep coming back, even for other people than me. They got dope people. Yeah. Real Life.
Everybody start clapping right now. This is this is some legendary shit. Super legendary. Double down there. She gave us a verbal spanking. <laughs> Put us in a black box. She back. Black woman went viral on our channel. <laughs> somebody Look, had to do it. I somebody guess. had to do it. And nobody was better. Had Look. no idea it was gonna be me. <laughs> Look, look, um, your interview dropped uh, two years ago. Um, one of the most epic vi interviews I had the pleasure of being a part of. Interview dropped, going crazy. My sister calls me. She says, do you know who y'all interviewed? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. She was like, no, you don't know. You have done no research. You don't know who you have on your platform right now. I was like, well, I met her. I talked to her. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know. She was like, no, you don't know. I was like, I, look, I was there. Look, finally, I was there. Jaguar motherfucking right in the building. Put some respect on it. Um, first and foremost, I would just like to say it's a pleasure to have you back. Um, it's been... Can you please let the people know you weren't mad at us? <laughs> like, because they, they think you was just killing us. <laughs> and we had a mad, cool, respect, a dope vibe, all that prior, after you showed us some dope music. Let them know that you fuck with us, man. Because they Completely. think. <laughs> Listen to me. If I didn't, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Mm, How about that? First and foremost. And if I was really mad. I would have had something negative to say to y'all when apparently I had everything negative to say about the whole world and I never did. Amen. So, um, matter of fact, if anybody ever asked me, I, I said it was a great time. They're great kids. We'll take it. <laughs> hey. That's and, what uh, I would say. It, I, I was like, no, they're super dope. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they're going to do in the future. Amen. Like, that's always been my attitude for you guys. Um, People also have to realize that at that time, it was at the beginning of my tailspin. So everything that happened after, I had no idea it was going to happen. But when Mousequake said to me, Jag, talk to him, do the interview. And I said, that's okay. He said, no, give him an interview. And I'm like, oh, an interview. Not an mm. interview. An interview. An inner view. Oh, I like that. I like that. Now, it's crazy because you were told that uh, it went viral when they, when they told you that. You woke up like, hey, you're going viral. You thought it was, hey, am I sick? Am I yeah, because of the pandemic, you know. I'm, <laughs> right. What you mean I'm viral? You know, like I'm... <laughs> and I'm like... What's going on? He's like, no, auntie, you're going viral on the internet. And I'm like, I am? <sighs> I'm like, babe, they say we're going viral. He was like, we're going viral. I'm like, yeah. So I got to ask. Let's see where this goes. There was a lot you unpacked in that interview. Oh, yeah. Overall, did you feel like you did your story justice in that interview? Just for the topics you touched in on. In your interview? In our interview. I stand 10 feet tall, 10 toes down to the ground on every motherfucking okay. thing I said. Okay. Okay. Even down to Summer Walker. Yeah, 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 yeah. With her and very troubled self. Yeah, I was going to say, this is it's unraveling as we speak. No, that's the beautiful thing about being the kind of honest I am. Because what I'm saying is true, because what I'm saying is backed up on honest to God, complete integrity, I can say something like that. Let everybody be mad about it and step the fuck away. And let's see what reality say. It ain't my fault I be ahead of the curve. It really ain't my fault. I'm just operating in my principle. And then I heard about some of the troubles that came to your door. But if I'm correct, I want to say this while we on camera. When we finished the interview that day, didn't I give y'all some warnings? About things that might happen. Yeah. Because of this interview. Yeah. Things happen. 
Was I wrong? No. Oh, but was I right? Yeah. <laughs> so, some, of, I, I, some of the some of the things the Tim and Campbell thing was interesting to me because we just hadn't heard from him and he just kind of popped out of nowhere. Why do you feel like he had felt the need to respond? <laughs> I think it was a great marketing move for him. You know, to go from waiting for them to include you in an award show every now and then. Um, they, they treated him, this business has treated Tevin Campbell heavy handed and neglectful. You know, it's like the way they've shunned him, the way they've treated him throughout the years was absolutely terrible. So for me, even saying that in that interview, it wasn't me blow, blowing up his spot. Yeah. I'm literally sitting here advocating for this nigga. Right. Like, I'm literally sitting here advocating. Right. Now, maybe you didn't want nobody to remember about the Hollywood Boulevard. Maybe you were hoping that was so long ago and because it happened before Facebook, it didn't really exist, you know, kind of thing. But it did exist. And there's a whole fucking police report. There's a whole detective that said you propositioned him and you got in the car, you made the deal, and then he put the cuffs on you. That's in a record. If somebody goes and checks my record, now they're going to find things on my record. Uh, I was charged with child abduction. Mm. It's a, a six, five, six felony. It's real low, but it's still considered a felony. So... If somebody brings that up about me, is, is it favorable? Does it leave room for you to have to explain certain things? Yeah, but it's your life. It's, it's what you lived. It happened. And if it's on public fucking record, then it's on public record. Mm. I'm not speaking about it because I'm trying to slump you. I'm speaking about it because that's what the game did to you. And if you tried to forget, I never did. It was wrong. Definitely. It was wrong as fuck. He was a young kid who came into the business. His family depended on him for income to live. He was the family business, like so many star children are the family business. And he got left with people. He got left with people that did things to him shaped his personality and his, self, and his choices before he had a chance to do it himself. Meanwhile, make a hit record after hit record and we sitting there dancing while this kid is being fucking just fucked all over every which way. Best he was probably treated was at Paisley Park with Prince. Mm. And then not long after that, Tevin Campbell disappears and nobody hears about him and nobody speaks his name until he gets arrested. And then it makes national news. And then they start playing his records. Oh, you remember when he was? <laughs> that is facts. And then after that, all that talent, all of these motherfuckers, all of these people who were millionaires and made millions off of him while he was a kid. And you left him out there. So I'm going to say it to you right now, Tevin. I'm glad you came out. That's what I was going to ask. However it happened, I wasn't trying to put you out on Front Street. But you never had an excuse to hide in the first place. <clears throat> Whoever you are, that's you. And you should have the right to be you, to not have to lie about you or defend you. And I pray to God that you do whatever you got to do to get everything they owe you, because they owe you, nigga. They owe you big. Mm. So would you think the industry created that or that was always innately in them based on just your knowledge? I don't know. Because I didn't know him as a little child. My strongest connection to Tevin Campbell was through Rosie Gaines' daughter, Latoya, who we call each other sisters. Mm. You know, and... Her and Tevin were always together at Paisley Park. 
I bumped into Tevin at events and stuff like that, would see him from time to time, but we didn't have a friendship. It, it just killed me though, because I knew everything that was happening to him because he was with Latoya and Latoya knew everything. Mm. And I would just sit there like, oh man, I hope he wins, I hope he wins, I hope he wins. Mm. And then he disappeared and then people just stopped talking about him. You know, it's, it's, it's fucked up. The Can you have come out back then? Up. Huh? Can you have come out back then? Like right now we have like the little Nas X's, the um I forgot the guy, Frank back Ocean. In the 90s, Frank Ocean. No. Yeah, could that no. it's almost detrimental to your career. He if, couldn't have come out, but the thing is, they were still busy trying to push a narrative. They were trying to push a narrative, like trying to make him appear. I mean, but they do they did it to all the guys. They did it to all the guys that were gay. You know, so it's just like, it's super unfair because you are who you are, but you have to pretend not to be who you are. But then the same executives that are telling you, make sure the girls fall in love with you are the ones sitting there diddling you. Yeah. You can't be gay in public, but please be gay with me. Like, I mean, it's, <laughs> right, right. it's kind of fucked up. It's kind of fucked up. It's kind of fucked up. Listen to me. After you finish licking my balls, I want you to do some push-ups <laughs> and get ready for this video. You know, Hello. like. Hello. Now, it does make us ask because a lot of things happen in an interview to where, um, you know, I got to, you know, before we even ask, talk about where you've been. Yeah. Uh, you touched on, you, you brought a lot of light to R. Kelly in a Leah situation. Yeah. And this is prior to, this is when Surviving R. Kelly had just kind of started. Yeah. And you had shown some light on that. And then to see where it is now, to see 30 years given. And you were like saying, this is what was going on. I mean, do you, do you feel like the documentary did that? Um, or do you feel like this was just, what, this was going to happen with him still living the way he was living or just based on not, never owning up to it? Like the way you would own up to, okay. I think he was an acceptable monster at the time. Do I think he deserves it? Absolutely. He should get a fucking year for every year he was operating. That's how I feel. You had your fun, now you gotta pay the piper. Pod piper. Even you have to pay the piper. So good for him. Good for him. I hope he sings during, you know, meal breaks and shit. How do you feel about him Get being able to drop a whole album yeah, today? Some album today? Huh? He dropped a whole album today. R. Kelly? Yes. A surprise yeah. album. But but Spotify and all of the platforms took it down. Yeah, like, hey, this is do you think platforms should get into that at all? No, first, no. I it think was, they took the music No, st hold on. Stop. Okay. They called it. They, no, before you, it was called I Admit It. I Admit It. That was that was the name of the yeah, he has, he has the project. A, he has a song where he says the Aaliyah situation that was love, the sex tape with the thirteen year old girl that was love. That's what he said in the song. They took that shit down so fast. <laughs> yeah, they took that shit down. Yeah. I gotta get your I got. <laughs> I, I admit it. Yes. He said the Aaliyah. This is quote in the in the song. Aaliyah. That situation was love. The thirteen year old girl hit sex on the tape with was love. That's what he said. Then he said. Then he says something about the one that he peed on. Yes. Then he that said. Love. That's what he said. God. He says he likes old and young women, but it's not pedophilia. He says this in the song. Oh, and, and he, he says all of this in the song. Yes. And he wrote all of this on some Tupac shit in jail from jail. And it sounds good. I don't know what the fuck they doing now. Wow. What the fuck they mixing and mastering in jail? No, he's probably on the phone. Recorders oh, these these and engineers fooling. Into recorders and then they taking it and they matching it up. You know, they, they doing what they doing. They What's the doing right in the jail? Um. <laughs> You know, fuck him, fuck that. I'm glad he admitted it. You know, thanks. Um, love, love, love and urine. Uh. 
love and fucking urine. He loved that 13 year old little girl. He pissed all over her face. That's love, huh? He got excited, huh? Like, um, what's them, the caca spaniels? That every time they get excited, they pee? A little caca. <laughs> got it. So, with them taking his music love off. Love and pedophilia. Of- awesome. <laughs> He well, like him young, he like him old, he like it all, you know. Said. That's what he said, that's what he said. I admit, I admit. Yeah. I admit. So, so we got to ask the question. I mean, he obviously got some type of mental situation going on no, there, right? No, I just think that he desperately needs money on his books. <laughs> oh, shit. That's what, oh, because they, they took away the, but they took away the money that his fans was giving him on his book, so. I don't yeah, know. but you know, who knows? Maybe if they keep sending more money, they'll let him, you know, get him, let him get some money. You know. Do, do you I agree? thought it was so funny when Boosie started talking about, you took his commissary. Yeah. Nigga, you got some money, you put some money on his books then. Yeah, he the greatest to you. Since you give a fuck about him so much, then put some money on his motherfucking books. Since you love him so much. See, I don't like rape deniers and rape sens- um, sympathizers. I just... I don't bang with it. Right. It's fucking whack. It's whack as shit. Because if it was your daughter, or if it was your niece, or if it was your little cousin, I truly doubt you would be so liberal with the shit that you're saying. And then there's the other side of that pancake. If it's cool with you, then that tells me every fucking thing I need to know about you. Yeah. So let me ask you this about, because Fuck yes, they're taking- noodles. Yeah. Fuck all of that. But but fucking summer sausage. <laughs> right. I hope somebody summer sausage is you. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just so funny because everything that I said, didn't it? Yeah, just it's kind of just manifesting old. like a muffin. Manifesting. But but let me ask this. Okay, so where do we draw the line, right? We have artists literally talking about killing other human beings, yeah. right? So should that also be you know, sh- should the platform step in and take that music down too? Because if, if you're going to take down that, where do they draw the line? Well, I mean, we're at a very interesting time in humanity. We are. Period. I think we're all struggling with humanity. Period. We can talk about that project or we can talk about all the drill records where niggas is literally committing crimes to make records and record deals are signing them and getting life insurance policies on them from the time, knowing that they're about to die, either in the course of or before they get to make their next Uh, record. And you've got all kinds of crime, just random crime happening all over, I mean, like if you turn on YouTube and you just watch the national news on YouTube, mm-hmm. I usually do that. Yes. Just to chart and see where is it popping off. And it's all simultaneous, this area here, and then the next thing you know, the next crime wave comes through here. It's, it's almost simultaneous. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's be honest about the shit that's influencing our environments. I got a bigger problem with fucking Grand Theft Auto than with some of the not so cool music. Yeah, hey, that's. Hey. I got a much bigger problem. You saying that. something? You saying something? I and do. It, and you know, I'm glad you touched on that because now you have artists creating servers and letting people, young children, get on these servers and live this gangster life mm-hmm. through the game. Yeah. Like I didn't see it ever getting to this, but it's just. Why not? Everything that starts out as something good has the potential to become something very bad. Yeah. Transportation. The car was invented to cure what problem? Pollution. Horse shit. Really? Think about it. Wow. Horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. They're big animals. They have to eat. They shitting everywhere. And the more people you had traveling on horses, horse shit everywhere. So they invented something that didn't shit, or so they thought. It was just a different kind of shit. It's called pollution. And now it done ate up the ozone. <laughs> now we got, you know what I mean? Like, we tried to cure one thing and it, oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's, 
When I think about video games, I think about Atari, I think about Pac-Man, oh, yeah. I think about the early, you know, Super Mario years. Oh, yeah. I think about the crazy tech. Please, let's not even talk about Mario Kart. Like, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. shit yeah. like that. Yeah, the fun, fun. fun stuff. Fun stuff. Fun. Oh, total yeah, shit. Fun shit. But now it's like, a game ain't gonna crack 100 million sales unless there's some kind of violence, some kind of killing, some kind of something going on. Mm. We got video games teaching people how to be criminals, how to be murderers, how to be thieves, how to be rapists. And, and they're sitting there watching this shit and playing this shit anywhere from 10 to 25 hours a week. If you done kill 80 million people in your video game, Damn, just 80 million. Isn't it realistic to think that you might want to try how it feels in real life eventually? Like, I mean, that's just, you become programmed. You become desensitized. <laughs> and, and then you're playing a video game and then you're listening to this nigga at the same time. And this bitch suck up on my dick. <laughs> I'm so high, I can't feel it. <laughs> Give me some, shoot my, shoot, like just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's. This is what they're listening to. This is what they're playing. This is what they're listening to. This is what they're playing. Fucking 20, 40, 60 hours a week. And we're surprised at the shit that we see happening in the world. They've been practicing this shit. Hour after hour after hour. They've been listening to the theme music. Pop and Molly. You know what I mean? Pop everything. I think that shit had fent. No, oh well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, damn, niggas is no. <laughs> no, you're right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> you're like, absolutely I'm, right. So, like, Jamaica went ahead and said we're gonna stop like playing violent music on the radio. Yeah. You think that's a route that even America should take, taking away that freedom of speech if it's causing know, real problems? See, is it freedom of speech or is it promoting oh, yeah. destruction? Yeah. 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 See, freedom Psych of speech is tricky. Things. Freedom of speech is tricky because you can say whatever you want to say. The question is, what's the integrity in what's being said? What do you, what's the purpose you're saying it for? You know what I mean? And, and everybody wants to put the word art on everything like that shit is hot sauce. I put that shit on everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, that's art. Oh, that's art. Oh, that's art. What happens when... Um, our first pedophile decides he wants to do an art show with all the kids that he's diddled and calls that art. Right. See what I'm saying? Like, there's, you can't, we got too many crazy motherfuckers in positions of influence now. Like, that's the scary thing about the internet, which I've come to learn. Like, I've been drugged into the technology future, whether I wanted to be there or not. And what I've learned while I was there is, that influencer shit can be very fucking dangerous, all depending on the hands that it falls in. Because there's somebody for everybody. And there's millions and millions of bodies mm -hmm. out there. You know what I mean? You got fucking crazy, who the dude that was just with Trump? The Fuentes something. What's his name? He was with Kanye. Yeah, yeah. You know, this nigga's young. Mm -hmm. To be on this um, Hitler shit. Right. Yeah. Like, he's young. Jones, Jones? No, not the Alex Jones. The dude, oh. the other dude that went to Mar-a-Lago with Kanye when he asked Trump to be his vice president. And I would have loved to have been there for that. That would have been fucking awesome. So, but anyway, I, his name is Fuentes, something... You know, I, I, I choose not to, like, remember divisive people's names unless I need to, but I believe his last name is Fuentes. But he's young, and this dude is, you know, kill them all. Yeah! <laughs> like, pretty much. Fuck them all. Yeah, I'm racist. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but he has... <laughs> Nick Fuentes. Nick. Nick. Nick Fuentes. Nick Fuentes. This motherfucker, he rolls with Alex Jones, too. And these people got an audience. And because of the way algorithms work, 
All you have to do is fall into the right niche. And now all of a sudden you stumble into this whole new audience you didn't even know was out there for you, but they was looking for somebody like you. And boom, it's a match made in hell. You know, so I think the conversation really needs to be in America. What exactly do we want our future to look like? Like what kind of societies are we aiming to really aid and build or renovate? Like how do we really want the future to look? Do we want this shit to look like Denmark and everybody be fucking harmonious and shit and great and everything's lovely and dong? You know what I mean? Like, like what do we want as a society? I don't think America knows what it wants anymore because it's been so busy being fed what, it want, what they want them to want. Like, we got to realize in this country, there are people who choose and select everything that we do, everything that we eat, everything that we wear, where we live, how we see ourselves. All of this shit is selected. Do you think we're too, do you think we're too free in America? I think we're so free we don't realize we're not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Facts. Yeah. Facts. For real. For real. <laughs> I think we finally reached the moment where the first movie for the Matrix series is really fucking relatable. Mm. Yeah. You know, um We there. No, nigga, we in the pods. Right. In the pods. No. Pucker than the motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Skin all <laughs> tautin. Now um I have to ask this because um, I, I'm, I'm going to derail this conversation for just a minute. Oh, because you know, please. There's no derailment. Take, <laughs> us, take us where we're going. Uh, it's a journey. With you, you, I, I feel like you had the potential and the power to wield, to create a movement of beings who could have some real thought mm -hmm. and really think for themselves but uh, you were just gone. And I, 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 and I want, why were you just gone? Because my life was being threatened. Okay. And not figuratively. Literally, we were being hunted. It took about, what babe, about four months for us to shake, shake them off. Yeah. Um, so, not long after we did this interview, um, and then the Storm Monroe interviews, mm -hmm. which was all infiltration. Um, Tasha K, I'll say allegedly for y'all, you know, <laughs> right. so ain't nobody talking about no defamations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't get to that. We don't want nobody talking about no defamation. Right. She in Africa. So <laughs> allegedly, um, the gold shoe bitch, um, <laughs> She was, she was hired to target me. And, you know, when I started the women's group WCW meeting, um, we opened up the Zoom room every Wednesday for women to come. And we were building it little by little, piece by piece. Uh, I found out, it took me about a month and a half to figure it out, but three of the women in the group all worked for Tasha Kay. Oh, damn. Um, one of the women who had positioned herself to be my right-hand woman to help me build it, I mean, this bitch actually came to my house. She was invited, I invited her to my house. Oh, wow. um, so Tasha Kay had somebody in my fucking home amongst my family. It wasn't until after she came by, because we were having a barbecue that day, and just out of nowhere, even though she lived in Alabama, she just happened to be in Dallas for the weekend meeting her boyfriend, who she never saw again after that, um, and just happened to be not that far away. And I was wondering if we could get together and meet while well, I'm having a barbecue at the house. Oh, I didn't know that, but bitch, I posted about it and said I was. Mm. I know your notifications is on. <laughs> but it's cool. Come on. 
The family's here. We just barbecuing, smoking, eating, spending time. Sure, I see you every Wednesday on Zoom. Come on. What, somebody tried to break into the house, what was it, honey, about a week after that, maybe a little less? And then um, somebody faking to be an insurance agent who had an appointment with someone in the house, even though they had the wrong name, asked for their credentials, didn't have any credentials. Then we had to call the police to document it and yada, 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 so on, so on, so forth. It, 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 um, when they tried to, when them essays was following me while I was walking the dog, that was the day. They was um, slow creeping up the street, and they didn't realize, they were so busy following me that they didn't realize that my husband was sitting in a car. He, he didn't have it turned on. He was sitting in a car, and he was watching them, and then when I walked up, he turned the car on. He was like, these motherfuckers have been following you up the street, slow creeping. The second that I did that, I turned around and looked at them, and these niggas start taking off. So I go jump into the car. We start following them. Mm. We got out to the main thoroughfare, and then that was that. They were gone, and I'm like, okay. We not safe. Right. Got it. So then we started figuring out, you know, are we going to stay in the city, or are we going to move around? And then we had a house guest around that time who we found out, um, family friend who had flown down from Philadelphia to spend some time, found out that he was informing on us, um, giving information to certain people about how we live, what we're doing, you know, what's happening in the house, who we're talking to, if anybody's coming by. When we found that out, that shit, that shit kind of fucked me up. Because this is somebody that I, I revered you know what I mean, like an uncle. Um, and then we had to put his ass on a plane, get him the fuck up out of here. And then we were like, you know what, let's just shut down the house and let's figure out what we're gonna do. And then um, right before we left town to head west, we, uh, we went out to Arizona for a while with friends. Um, yeah, and you know, we, we needed to spend some time with the people that were in my life to figure out because there was, there's been a lot of sifting through. I got 25, 30 year relationships, you know what I mean, with people in this industry and I don't know who the fuck I can trust anymore. So um, we decided to go out west, but right before we left, we had stopped up at Clyde Warren Park because we needed to walk the puppy, he was still a puppy. So I'm walking him around Clyde Warren Park because we're like, okay, we're gonna get on the road, we're going to beat it through here. We'll be in New Mexico by, you know, by nightfall. So I'm walking. The dog, i just gotten out the car. He was still in the car at the time. And car pulls up. Behind us to park. Now, this is like 1230 at night. <clears throat> so it's like, okay, maybe they're pulling aside too, just like we are kind of. But then it was like this, they were at the top of the block and then they started inching down closer and closer and closer towards the car. Little by little, like just creeping up. And Husband says, get in the car. And I'm like, all right, so I pick up the dog. We get in the car. And then they start pulling up even tighter. I'm like, fuck it, let's move. You know what I mean? We had a burner in the car. But if it's gonna go down like this, nigga, we about to have some fucking fun. Mm. So we take off from there, we pull, they follow us. And I'm like, are we paranoid? Are we too high? You know what, let's, let, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm like, fuck it. Let's, let's figure out what it's really fucking hitting for. So we pulling up to the red light, I said, this one's going to change, and then this one's going to change not long after it. Don't stop. Run the fucking light. So my husband takes off. They follow us. First red light. They continue to follow us. Second red light. The safety off. 
<laughs> oh, it's about to go down. Yeah. <clears throat> so, boom, we going. He's like, I'm like, uh-uh, pull up to Fuel City. I want cameras and I want lights. If motherfuckers is going to see us busting shots, that shit's going to be documented. So, boom, we go. They fire on us. Ooh, peel off. Next thing you know, we pull off, turn the car around. We sitting there facing the street waiting for somebody to drive the fuck up. One car takes off, skids off, gets back on 35. The other one rolls right down riverfront and speed, and I mean both speeding off. It wasn't one car, it was two cars. There was one that came to approach us. There was another one there for the ambush. They weren't Damn. expecting us to start running lights. Damn. I guarantee you, if we had a sat at that light, that's when that other car would have came up. Damn. And it's business time. <clears throat> So we had luggage in the car. We were all packed up. Everything that we needed in the storage unit was in the storage unit. We headed west. We have friends out there, and we have friends out there that have anger problems just like me. So it worked. Um, and we were there until we weren't. And, you know, it was kind of hard because you go viral, so it makes it a little bit harder to hide in plain sight. So, of course, no matter what state we popped up, it's Jaguar. Sure we right. What's up, homie? <laughs> but but during but during that time, you uh while you were on the road, you were doing. I seen you doing a lot of interviews with Stormy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So actually, did, that was right <clears throat> before we left. Got you. Storm happened before we left. Mm -hmm. When we had to leave was the, when we did the Tasha K interview. Got you. Got you. And Storm wasn't supposed to get what he got. Right. But I gave it to him. Right. See, Tasha wanted him to fluff me up. She was supposed to get the big interview, but I gave it to him. I knew what I was doing because I wanted to see what the fuck she was really all about. You've planted <clears throat> people in my life. You've planted people around me. Y'all dox me. Then we went to Vegas. And that bitch Toxic Diamond, who also worked for Tasha K. And all of this was leading up to surviving Jaguar Wright. We're doing an interview at a Las Vegas station. All of a sudden, Toxic Diamond just moved from Atlanta to Vegas. Living out of a hotel on the strip. The night before we did the interview... Somebody hit us with a message, hunting jaguars, all this demonic shit, the Illuminati's coming to get you, Clive Davis is coming to kill you, and, and, and you know, whatever, whatever. But it wasn't until we got sent another message from the same fucking account, from the hotel right across from ours, and the shit was facing our hotel window. I'm like, oh! Oh! Oh, y'all playing, playing, playing. So Shit. we ended up having to leave early. Um, we got a phone call from a trusted source. We had to leave because somebody was coming up the service elevator for us in an hour. And I'm glad I still have friends in Vegas. So then they tried to stall out our luggage because we weren't allowed to take our luggage down. The bellman had to take it. Our luggage was rifled through and robbed from the time it came down from the suite to the car. They kept trying to keep us there. I had to press the issue to get my car. And I'm like, y'all motherfuckers is doing too much. If I want to check out early, I should be able to check out early. Oh, well, this is only happening because you're checking out you know, early. What do you mean because I'm checking out early? If I want to check out fucking early, I should be able to check out early. Right. Right. You, you starting to make it sound like you're trying to keep me here. Is there a reason why you're trying to keep me here? See, there's a moment when North Philly just <laughs> kicks right in. I'm sitting there talking to the valet guy. Ma'am, I don't know why it's taking so long to get your car. It usually doesn't take this long. And I looked at him and I said, I want you to understand something. You getting me my car right now? It's good for you. <laughs> because if they come, 
I'm going to grab your ass and hold you close. <laughs> and you're going to get touched right with me. Now go get my motherfucking car, bitch. And you knew I wasn't playing. Oh, you don't want to get my car? When the motherfuckers come, you're going to be my shield, baby. Kevlar! Mm. Got my car. You were able to finally get to the luggage. He had to go and track the luggage down. Couldn't find the bellman that had our shit. He went on break. So he came up to the room and took our shit to bring our shit downstairs to meet us in the lobby with the car. But while he took our shit, he went on break. <laughs> I made enough noise. We did what we had to do. We Got back in the desert. So I, I got to ask, when, when you speak your truth, does that make you not want to actually speak out and actually keep it as real as you kept it in these interviews? There have been days where I thought to myself, maybe it's just too much trouble. Oh. And then I remember that's my fucking purpose. And that's their purpose, to make me as uncomfortable as possible. So I won't want to speak. That's the objective. So all I can do is make smart choices and believe that everything that happens, happens for a reason. Even if I lose my life, it was meant to be that way, like I said talking to y'all earlier about faith. Yes. What, we re what do I really believe in? I believe that everything that happens happens within the will of God. Happy mm. Shabbos. I believe that everything that happens happens within the will of God. That means everything that I've said, everything that I've done, everything that I happened, that has happened, that's about to happen, is happening as it is supposed to. Oh yeah, amen. For me to argue with that is for me to argue with what I really believe in. So, so I have to, yeah, uh, that's, that's that. So you mentioned surviving, surviving Jaguar. Mm. So, Ooh. I know. It's you wanna like, know what's funny? Yeah, go I'm ahead. mad because I've been surviving me too. <laughs> right. All my life. So the first question is, you have not watched it. Let's just. No, I've you, seen clips, but clips. I've never watched. Okay, so after our interview, um, you Stormy, uh, Tasha K, you, you know, mm -hmm. and then this uh, surviving Jaguar is a trailer comes out for it. It's coming out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you have wind of it that it was coming that you knew it was building because you had mentioned that there's a reason she has the numbers to the people that she got anyway. How does she get the X number? How does she get? I gave it to her. I texted mm. it to her. For You're what, welcome, bitch. Yeah, for what purpose? What purpose? What, that was to say, okay, well, let me just give you other people that could tell my story? Or Have you ever heard of the saying, it's an old Chinese proverb, beating the grass to find out where the snakes are? You know, sometimes in still grass, everything looks normal. But if you just stomp or you throw something down, you'll say, Phew. You see that too. Or even just the movement. You might not even see the snake, but you know that shit ain't moving by itself like that in, this, in that pattern. And at that point in time, I was doing a lot of that. See, I know my ex-husband is a narcissist. I know he's a liar. I know he likes the attention. <clears throat> but I was more interested in seeing what he had the balls to actually fucking say out in front. See, he lived off of me. He lived off of my fame. He made relationships off of me, off of my fame. I know he missed it. That's why for a while, I shut my shit down. Mm. You love me? Let's see what you fucking love. I'm going to take all of this shit the fuck away. You love me? Or did you love what I could do for you? 
Mm. I'll never forget the first time I went to my dad when I was contemplating divorce. And I said, you know, I know this shit ain't working. I know it's not right, dad. I know he's the wrong one, but I feel bad because I made that commitment. I said forever and I haven't been an angel. And he keeps saying to me, he can't live life without me. I said, and it looks so real, it looks so genuine. Am I just that cold hearted? You know what I mean? That I, what am I missing? Cause it's not adding up. My father looked at me, he said, baby, it's because he's not lying. He's telling the truth. He can't live this life without you. That nigga's nothing without you. Damn. <clears throat> he said, it ain't got nothing to do with loving you. But losing access to that life, he ain't never going to get a taste of that nowhere else. He means that. That's why it looks sincere and genuine. Yeah. <laughs> Where he going to get another you? I got I to gotta ask. There's one thing that he said that blew me away. He said, sure. when y'all were living in a, in a, I guess y'all was living in the hood, you retiled the whole apartment to make it, make it feel like a home? Is that real? Well, see, there's a whole part of the story that he's leaving out. When I met him, I had a roommate, a guy roommate, and we were friends. Um, he cared for me greatly. We tried dating. It didn't work, but we were great roommates and great friends. So when my ex-husband came into my life, you know, we were living off South Street, like living in Deep Ellum. And I had this boyfriend now that was over all the time. Next thing you know, he started bringing clothes over. He had his suits in the closet. And I'll never forget, Lost we woke up one Sunday morning because me and Joe would do that, my roommate. You know, we would turn on Marvin Gaye. He would go out, get the bagels. I would start making the eggs and he would grab the locks. And like we had Sunday and then sometimes friends would come over or whatever. So he went downstairs. He was like, Jay, where are the car keys? And I'm like, they're not where they always are. He said, I would think that someone stole my car, but my keys, where are the keys? And I'm like, I don't know. We shared everything. He shared his car with me. This nigga decided to get up and take the car. <clears throat> You're a guest here. This is my roommate. We're friends. You just don't get up and take this nigga car. <laughs> It's not my car. Yeah, I'm always in it. Jack, that was a red flag, though. I'm going to throw that out there. <laughs> but you can't just take this nigga car. Yeah. <laughs> there was lots of red flags. Yeah, but that was red flag number one, right? Lots of red flags. <laughs> but my shit was weird in that, at that time. Because I wasn't quite sure whether or not I really wanted to be with this nigga. You're 22, he, right? Yeah, I was 22 at this time. Yeah, we are. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, see, you don't understand. I was kicking it with, with Common, and I was fucking with little X on the side. And my ex-boyfriend had billboards all over Manhattan for Kevin, Cl um, well, no, Kenneth Cole mm. reaction. Yes, he was. Uh, okay. Yeah, the light-skinned nigga with the blue-green eyes back in the day who used to do the backflips with the shoes, the Kenneth reaction. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was my nigga. So I had all of this, this, this action, all this option, but he clung the tightest and I really didn't want a celebrity relationship. Mm. And I knew that being in a relationship would make it possible for me to work with the niggas that I wanted to work with and always have an out to not have to fuck them. So he was a convenient option <clears throat> because he clung so tight. So after that, he came back with the car. Oh, I didn't think it would be a problem. I'm like, all right. I got to get him the fuck out of here. 
because you're changing my friendship now. So I went and I found the first thing that I could find. It was a dump crap apartment, Volpe Apartments. Actually, it was the first apartment that he and I lived together. It was in the same building where M. Night Shyamalan on the same block in South <coughs> Philly, uh, St. Albans Street, where Haley Joe Osment lived. Right. So I actually lived in one of those. Now, of course, they didn't look like that on the inside. It looked like what it looked like on the outside, but, and then they created a set, but I lived in that building. I was like, that's the only thing that makes doing this dope. Six cents, right? Yeah, the six cents. So I, we lived right there. The church that he ran to and did that was all right there around the corner. So, um, and then all of the Roots crew, we all lived all up and down St. Albans. We all lived within like two or three blocks of each other. Uh, we all use the same realtor. And um, it was a fucking dump, but it was last minute and it was quick. And I had to get this nigga out of my friend's house. Um, so yeah, it was a fucking dump. It looked like a whole crime scene. I got a cab, went to Home Depot, bought everything that I needed, <clears throat> stopped at the, um, the carpet place, told them I needed them to come there and re-carpet immediately. And, um, I turned a crime scene piece of shit into a decent one bedroom apartment. Yeah, I, I laid all the tiles myself. I oh, he didn't help? <laughs> did all of the painting. No, he, he, didn't, did, he didn't even know how to fucking caulk. Oh, that's red flag number two. You know Jack. what I mean? <laughs> Again, there were many, and I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, but he like really was like, he really thought that was dope. And I, I thought that was like, damn, that's, that's kind of. I did a lot of great things yeah. for him. Like his birthday, when I had the Ritz Carlton, because he, he couldn't get off of work, I had the Ritz Carlton come and cater him a champagne brunch oh, wow. for him and his coworkers. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, damn. Oh, yeah, no. Nah, like, yeah. it was so funny, because people kept talking about how he was talking about his illustrious career as a pool player, as yes. an amateur pool player or whatever. First pool stick he had, I bought him. <laughs> Shooting in he the gym. He wouldn't even fucking know anybody in pool in Philadelphia if it wasn't for me. They're all my friends. It was so funny, because remember, baby, when we went home after that shit? And we was over there, Kevin Hart's brother, my boy Forty, he owns one of the old pool halls we grew up. So, you know, Ball Busters is still there. And it was me, you, cousin came through, Reggie was there, Big Reg was there, then Shiz came through. Um, and we was in there just like, and it was like, why this pussy gonna sit up there talking like he the fucking godfather of fucking pool on this shit? It'll be great for us. He was like, he was like, he went too far with that shit. Wasn't nobody trying to hear all that shit. Can the boy play? Yeah, as much time as he spends doing it, he better be good at it. <laughs> Man. <laughs> I mean, he was shooting pool like 40, 50 hours a week sometimes. Like he was round the clock. He would be shooting pool, he would get off work. Go shoot pool. He was on like four or five teams. He was always doing some shit. And it was funny because I never joined the teams. I was a street hustler. I played for money. I played for purse. I didn't start playing teams actually until after I finished my second album and I came back home. And I had some time. And I was like, you know what? I'll start playing teams now. Um, but he lived by it. So like it was just really fucking interesting. And Reg and then they were sitting there clowning him and and I'm like, it's just kind of sad because it sounds like the interview that he did was more like an advertisement for his self. There was like some he advertising. Was trying to sell his own personal brand. Yeah. Um, I was good to that bitch. And, you know, the reason why I was good to him was because I didn't love him. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, explain because. Like I said, he clung to Titus and he was the most effective option at the time. Common was sketchy, and I already knew if I got into it with him that people would think that he was the one that put me on and that my career and my success, I never wanted to fuck with nobody in the game until I had made it because I wanted equality. Uh. I never wanted anybody saying the only reason she made it is because she's such a such girl. The only reason she made it is because it's, mm-mm, no. I, I wasn't trying to go the Mariah Carey way. You know what I mean? It's, it's um... You know, when I think about how she got signed to Sony, it still kind of fucks me up because when you have that much talent and you still got to suck dick, 
to get your demo tape mm. approved. <laughs> and this was after being, you know, the lead background for Brenda K. Starr. Just a demo And building tape. Brenda K. Starr and all of that. Like, this is after that. Everybody knows what happened between her and Tommy Matola and that motherfucking shit on the way to her first listening party. They seen her coming up from giving him head in the back of the shit. And everybody knew. Everybody talked about it. Mm. That's why she got the access that she got. She ended up marrying him, didn't she? Then she made him divorce his wife and made him fight her for alimony and child support after that woman had been married to him for 25 years. But do you respect the girl that got good head enough to get, make that happen? Or is it? Listen to me. This is how I feel. Whole shit is whole shit. Yeah. Music shit is music shit. Mm. Worst thing that ever happened to females in music was that they started using whole shit to market music. Mm. Ah. Like, there's supposed to be a fucking difference. So, That's um, like going to a Catholic church and your priest ain't really a priest. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> he, he got, yeah, he be, you know what I mean? The holy, hey. most pimp pope. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, you, like, oh, you know what I mean? Rather than the instant thing, this nigga coming through burning sticks. You know what I mean? Like, you mixing the wrong kinds of shit. Now, I'm... I'm glad you touched on this because women hip hop right now is pretty much the hottest thing going, like as far as period. I mean, is it? How many records does Sweetie sell? Oh. That bitch got 80 million followers and she sold 2,000 fucking sh um, things. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, I was, I was going to lean more towards Glorilla. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not very familiar with her. She's uh, very. She's from Memphis. She's very talented. That's uh, what I've been hearing. Yeah. But I'm still stuck on Rhapsody. Yeah, right. Right. As you should. Like I'm still waiting for Rhapsody to have her fucking blow up moment. Like big blow up. Like I'm really not even trying to hear about another female rapper to, rapper until Rhapsody get her fucking flowers. Yeah, if not for real, we, we need that to happen like, immediately. We needed to happen. We needed it to happen three years ago. Let's just keep it all the way 100. All of the hottest female rappers are all ex-strippers. Yeah, that, that seems to be the brand. All ex-strippers. Yeah, yeah. Or they and build let's them. keep it all the way 100. They don't write their rhymes, allegedly. Nah, they don't build their bodies either. It's just all come put together. <laughs> let's just keep it, let's keep it straight. This is playing make-believe at its highest level. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, there's real MCs, female MCs that are writing their shit. Like, I would even appreciate it if they would let the real talented female MCs and ghost write for these bitches. Mm. But the women ain't ghost writing they shit. That's the it's niggas. Yeah, it's the niggas. Niggas is writing these bitches shit. Hey, man. And I was talking about this the other day on my live. All of these women are out here buying into all of the shit that all of these bitches are saying that's being written by a dude. This is a dude's perspective on how a woman should be talking, and then the other women listen to her and be like, ooh, that's how she's talking. That's how I'm talking, girl. Yeah, yeah girl. Hold up. Hold up. Oh, fuck with it. You Hold know up. what I mean? Like, we all over here. But meanwhile, all of these words came from a man. Yeah. Who the fuck's power and who? I don't call that empowerment. I call that impimpment. Mm, oh, shit. Impimpment. New word. Urban dictionary. Write it down. Cosign. You yeah. ain't empowering shit. This nigga is spitting old fucking pimp shit and, and juicing it up and putting a bitch word here, there. You spitting it out on his behalf. Like, for real, for real, when you look at it, these ghostwriters is pimps and the artists are they bottom bitches. Mm. Oof. You paint a, you paint, you, yeah, 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 it just moved to the rap, I guess, because you, you paint a, you paint a very interesting picture there. I mean, seriously. Oof. So, but you, so you whoever's get, spitting the game, whoever's, whoever's writing the game, right, is running the game. That's a fact. That's a fact. Party. <laughs> one Period. You want them? And they all strippers. Yeah. And all of them are still just trying to be little Kim. That's a fact. So I, I got a question. Who was a figment of Biggie Small's imagination? Blown to life. Yeah. 
So as as a woman, right, um, coming up, like I remember you said, don't do it as an artist. But what do you think this is gonna do for the future female rap artists going down the line? Like how NWA now is like more and more gangster now. What do you think this level of rap is gonna do for going forward? <clears throat> I don't know, but I pray to God something drastic happens because. Let's just be honest, hip hop and females, and it's kind of embarrassing right now. Mm. And I think the whole sweetie thing, I think that sums it up best. Mm. You got 80 million followers and not even 1% was interested in buying your shit. Does that say something more about the music or the person, do you feel? No. It was the industry. It's just a game. Ah. It's just a game. You got, how many followers she got? Yeah, I mean, we can check right now. We can, we can check right now. Let's do the math. Yeah, Let's we, see if the we math can check is right math. now as we're live and live. Let's see if the math is math. 13 million. 13 million. She has 13 million followers. 10% of 13 million is what? 1.3 million. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 1% of 1.3 million is what? 130,000. 130. 130. She sold 2,000. <laughs> so you in the neck, wait a minute, wait a minute. So she got 1%. 1% 1 is 130,000. Yeah. yeah. So it's like. So she almost in the, like she negative. Yeah, she like a tenth of a percent. Yeah. That, that's, that's. So back in the Don't she got a blue check? Too? Yeah, she got a blue check. What so what was the what would the okay, back in the day, right? Yeah. I feel like y'all sold more records. Why do you think the decline of the music is like they're but they're superstars, but they're only selling 30, 40,000? Because nobody gives a fuck about the music. Ah. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Are you trending on TMZ? That's what I hear. That's that's what makes me want to buy an album. What what's the juice? The, so the, I could the, so the, I could relate to nobody it. Nobody gives a fuck. Listen to me, even when you look at this bullshit, like even with the whole, you know, with Jennifer Huff and, and the Nicki Minaj issues and mm. then Nicki Minaj and Cardi B and, and all of this shit in the midst of it all. Like, the fuck? The fans. Are they real fans though? Or are they bots? No, listen to me. Are they purchased? I'm, I'm sure there's a good number of AI in there. Yeah. But there's, they, get, they got actual fucking fans that follow them. Listen to me. My girl knows the whole live on YouTube. She started advocating for Jennifer Huff, Kenneth Petty's victim. Kenneth Petty being Nicki Minaj's husband. Mm. Now, I'm wrangled up in that you were advocacy. I advocate for Jennifer Huff. Part of the reason why I advocate for Jennifer Huff is because it disgusts me what has happened to her life. See, when she was 16 years old, she was unfortunate enough to be raped by knife point and cut by Kenneth Petty, who was also 16. She was threatened, she was bullied. In the end, he said, fuck the trial, and he copped. He copped the plea, attempted rape. But it landed him on the sex offender registry list. By the way, he is a level three, level three sex offender. For those of you who don't understand how it works, this is how it goes. Teacher with Jaguar. First tier, level one sex offender. You on that motherfucker for 10 years. Level two, they give you 20 years on the registry. Level three, you're on it for life. For life. Mm. For life. Mm. 
That's her husband. A whole ape, monster, sexual, sadist, deviant who, who likes to whittle on his women as he rapes them. That's her fucking husband. Right. Jennifer was his victim in the 90s. She moved on with her life, had children, everything was fine until this pussy marries Nikki. Now he married Nikki. He missed the menage, right? So he moves from New York to Los Angeles and, and decides he doesn't have to register anymore. Well, he ends up getting busted for it. He gets booked. The fans catch on, the blogs catch on, and then the next thing you know, they find out he's got a conviction. Then they start researching who's the victim. And now Jennifer Huff's name is drug into this shit all over again. The petties decide to engage her, offer to pay her, to recant her story so he can get off the registry. Imagine the fucking balls. <laughs> Listen to me, I know you got raped up and cut, baby, but this is what I need you to do for me. Forget you know that trauma. shit was mad long ago. Look, I'm about to get you this cash. Mm. I'll give you yay stacks, yay racks. All you gotta do is just go back to New York State and tell them that you lied and recant your story and everything, and I'm gonna hook you up on the back end. You gonna be great. Mm. The fucking audacity. This woman made it through this shit. Moved on with her life, and then the next thing she know, her name is all over the blogs. She didn't even know. Somebody approached her daughter. Then her family started getting threatened again by their quote-unquote alleged gang ties and friends. She was literally minding her fucking business and got sideswiped by fame. How unlucky for her Very. that her assailant married someone famous and now drug her all back into this shit. So yeah, advocating for her was an easy choice. Is she in the business? Um, no. Yeah. Is, is, is no, she... She's a normal person. Yeah. Can't, has a hard time keeping jobs because all of the fucking attention, they don't want that shit around there. What? They threatened her six-year-old daughter. They threatened to rape and kill her six-year-old daughter. Her fans, the fans. The fucking barbs. Mm. Them fucking bobblehead bitches. Mm. Mm. Male and female and whatever else and however, whatever your pronoun is alike. You a fucking barb, you fucking stupid out of your goddamn mind. Mm. They actually got on Nosey's page in the, con in the con um, comments and said um, if they ever found out that uh, uh, Nicki Minaj committed rape, they would work to make a uh, uh, rape legal so she wouldn't have to face no charges. That's crazy. This That's is the kind the of mindset. shit that these pussies say. The mindset. A couple of them tried to jump on my page. And I said, this is real simple. We can meet wherever you want. I just want you to say it to my face. Mm. That's all. You can say whatever you want to say to me. To my face. Mm. It's easy to be real tough like this. Mm. I mean, like, it's insane. They harass people. They track people down. But the same thing happened to me with the fucking uh, wine gang. The yeah. winos. Like, how offensive is that? That I'm being hunted by a group that calls themselves the winos. That shit is like... The winos. It's fucking awful. I'm being hunted by a bunch of fucking drunk bitches who drink box wine. The and listen to a crazy bitch that's been caught in 80 million lies and owes Cardi B $4 million. The whole situation. The, so... <laughs> To, to, to segue back to that, your ex is on there, but also your son is brought on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. For you, and again, I know you haven't went through and watched every minute of her, but this probably had clips. For you to see that your son is on that. It was heartbreaking. Yeah. But not it, because I was worried about how it was making me look. Not at all. See, I know what kind of mother I've been. You're the mother. I know what kind of mother I've been. 
So I wasn't personally offended for myself. I felt bad for him because I knew when I saw the way the little clips that I had seen, I instantly knew he's automatic, un he's uncomfortable. He's talking from that stressed place. Like I know it, I know it better than anybody. I watched this human being grow up. I taught him how to walk, I taught him how to talk. I, I, I fed him, I, yeah, I potty trained him. I taught him how to stand up and pee in front of the toilet. Not even his father did that. You know, so it's, and I was married. So all that being said, like instantly, but I felt the same way when he was at the shooting. You know, when my eldest son was murdered in 2018, he wasn't allowed to come home for the funeral because his father was afraid that I was going to ask for change of custody. So he wasn't allowed to come to his brother's funeral. That's correct. And instead, my family members back home, which by the way, a couple of them, they were on the, the Tasha K thing too. Yes, yeah. A couple yeah, of, they couple. all got together. Yeah, it's in the cousins and the and decided to have a, a, a mock funeral block party rather than coming to Texas. They was gonna celebrate their way. His body was in Texas, but they having a little service in Philly. Gotcha. They were upset that I didn't fly him home. And I'm glad I didn't fly him home, because you want to know what happened at that gathering on Hawthorne Street, on the 5700 block of Hawthorne Street? Go ahead. Man, in Frankfurt, Philadelphia, some of my son's friends decided to come to the gathering. And the reason why I got my son out was because their enemies showed up and shot up the party. Killed my son's best friend right in my son's face. My boy, my baby boy. If he hadn't been in Texas with me, he would have never seen that. He would have never been there for that. He had to go run under the table while his dad ran off to go get the car so they could speed off. And when I found out, because I got a phone call, and it was at the repast dinner that we were having, it was literally on the day of my son's funeral. I get the phone call. They shot up the block. They killed Giovanni, best friend. And I'm like, what? Who was there? Sam is gone. He all right. What do you mean, Sam? My son was there? He all right. He ain't, he ain't catch no heat. <laughs> he ain't catch no heat. Let me call my son because I know how he is. I know this got to be fucking him up. I call my son. The first thing, I'm like, are you okay? Are you, just tell me, are you okay? It's not dad's fault, mom. It's not his fault. It, 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 could've, it could've happened to anybody. It, it could've happened to anybody. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just want you to know, dad, it's not dad's fault that, that, that I saw the shooting. He, he didn't know it was gonna happen. It could've happened to anybody. I said, fuck all that. Are you okay? Huh? I said, take a deep breath. Have you even thought about yourself at all? Are you checking up on you? Fuck your dad. Are you okay? Give me the phone. Listen to me. I didn't plan this. We didn't know it was going to happen. Look, he'll call you back. Now, I want you to think about this. An autistic young man who buckles at pressure and crumbles in chaos. Not allowed to go to his brother's funeral, forced to go to some fake ass ceremony or slash block party, watches his brother who had just been murdered the week before, watches his brother's best friend be murdered right in front of him. And then he's spirited off and downloaded. If you talk to your mom, you make sure you let her know it's not my fault. The fuck? Yeah, so. No, what kind of fucking sick ass motherfucker 
call yourself a parent do you got to be to know that your child who suffers and struggles from dealing with pressure and anxiety and all of this shit. He's been suicidal twice. He's had to be in a, it, it, I mean, he's been on suicide watch in a fucking mental, mental hospital twice before he turned 18. And all you thinking about is how it makes you look? Suck every dick that you lie about, bitch. Suck every dick that you've lied about, bitch. Mm. You don't give no fuck about my child. You give a fuck about what you do to my child and how it affects me. It was recently on a night and day podcast in which you and your son now are. Yeah. Everything's, he's home. Yeah, he's home. Everything's copacetic. Everything was always copacetic. There was never a bad moment. There was never an argument. When he finally found out, because he didn't even know that that was a whole documentary thing. He didn't know. <laughs> he didn't find out until somebody approached him about it in the street. See, they kept him quarantined off, you know? Oh, yeah. Nobody yeah. told him what had been going on. So when he finally found out about it, he became very awkward about it and all of that. And he said, Mom, I had no idea. I said, shh, I know. I'm like, it's OK. Yeah, no, that's, that's so needed as a mother to be able to give, it's OK. It's OK. He could wear that forever. Like, damn, what did I do? And you know, please understand, this is the same child that I sat in jail for for eight months on a bullshit case that I had to beat in fucking Cook County Jail. Mm. Behind that pussy ass motherfucker. Mm. I had legal custody of my son here in Dallas, Texas, but I was charged with child abduction in Chicago and Chicago refused to work with the DA's office here. So I was forced on a governor's warrant for a mm. nonviolent crime, $150,000 bond. I was forced to be extradited from Lou Starrett to Cook County and fight that case. Mm. Eight By the way, I had a whole fucking jazz tour set up. Was forced to miss that. Had eight other shows. I had fucking 25 shows set up. All forced to be missed. Meanwhile, there's another trial happening in Dallas that I'm fighting while I'm sitting in jail for custody of my son of me, not losing custody of my son that I had just gotten. I didn't lose custody of him because I was a bad mother. I lost custody of him because I was still in fucking jail. I'm sitting on, in the fucking social worker's office fucking representing myself at my custody case here while I'm fighting a child abduction case there. Meanwhile, I have custody, but I abducted him in another state that nobody fucking lived in because my ex-husband wasn't even living there. When they arrested me, that pussy had already moved back to fuck the Philly. But see, he was busy fucking that goddamn detective, that ugly ass bitch who was so grateful to have a good looking man on her. Uh, yeah. Hooking him up with some polos from time to time that that bitch charged me anyway, and I was forced to fucking sit. And guess what happened when we finally got to trial? No lay prosecute. No. Oh. All charges dismissed. They couldn't even go through with trial. The fucking judge looked at the paperwork and fucking laughed at him. And on top of that, the fucking interview that I did that was filmed in interrogation when I first got there before they booked me into the county, I had my fucking Dallas County paperwork my custody paperwork and everything that came from my lawyer. I took that shit and I, I shoved that shit in my shirt. I had them papers on me when I went into interrogation. Take off my handcuffs. Are you willing to talk to us without an attorney? I said, yeah, under one condition. What? That I'm allowed to use my paperwork. I had to take it out when I first got there because you know I have to go in the cells and sit in the tombs and wait for them to bring me the fuck upstairs and all of that shit in the dead of winter. Mm. 
in Chicago in the dead of winter. I went from Texas. It was fucking 78 degrees when we fucking left uh, Love Field to minus two. I come upstairs, they get my paperwork. I said, do you see all this? Do you see the county seal? Fuck y'all. You ain't got no case. Fuck y'all. For all we know, those are fakes. You can easily call the DA's office in Dallas County and have them authenticated. They've been trying to reach you for months. They said you uh, y'all refused all their phone calls. All of this is on camera. Then the white motherfucker. Old ignorant dude. Real Chicago. Real fucking kibasa chewer, you know. Why are you talking to her like this? Why are you treating her? You're not supposed to treat her like that. I said, treat me like what? Like a person? I said, oh yeah, she's supposed to treat me like a nigga, right? I don't know who you think you're talking to. Da, 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 da. I was like, this is on camera, right? I said, like a nigga, right? I said, what's it gonna take to get you upset? Cause I'm fitting to make you upset. Well, I can't believe you will pull out the race card. I said, why not? You already know you fucking putting on a pony show for him. He's my friend. I said, yeah. Until you're the only black person in the room and then you a nigga too, bitch. Fuck y'all. Y'all ain't gonna drop it? Take me to the county, book me in. I'm ready to go to trial. Y'all got three days to indict me. You already two weeks late. Let's fucking do it. And with 180 documents and a public defender, I beat that case. With the public defender. Congrats on that, because that's, that's important. Yeah, but I lost custody of my son because I was still in jail. Yeah, exactly, the eight months. Ugh. Ugh. Mm. What can you do? I could have came home and fought. I could have came home and fought. And then I thought about my son. More court, more testifying, more already $137,000 and some odd, some odd wasted on lawyers and bond fees. <laughs> and that was his whole college. That was all his college money wasted on that fucking case. Yeah. Yeah. Wasted on that case. Well, when he was 16, he was only going to be 18 in two years. I let him ride it out. Because if I keep fighting, this nigga's gonna keep fighting. And if I and, and if he even tries another motherfucking stunt to get me booked, we all gonna fucking end this shit. I spent 12 years in court with that bitch. 12. Every time I booked a tour, every time I was working on a project, court paperwork, court paperwork. Court paperwork. It's like the fucking divorce that never end. How about that? You think I'm going to put pressure on my son for anything? Knowing that the only reason his mom is going through hell and losing money and losing work and going through all of this shit is because I believe in him. I told him, I don't even feel like doing, I don't feel like doing this shit. And if your dad pulls a stunt, I might have to go away. But I'll do it for you. What do you want? I want to fight, mom. I want to get away from him. Well, then fuck it. Book you into the cooking. Fuck it. That's who I am. Now, I have to ask, because... You got married young, or yeah. what they consider young. Uh, during that... It was young. It was young. And the reason I want to say it was young, because... And I want you to address it, because you're here, and you know yeah. you, you spoke it on yourself, but the Talib Kweli situation. Yeah. Was that a situation when you were willing to kind of throw That's everything... That's such a bad fucking memory now. Yeah, it, I, it, I, <laughs> Like, Shit, I feel man. bad. Like, I was watching Saturday Night Live, and I was like, you look like a whole fucking nerd. 
I can't believe I fucking had sex with you. Like, I really can't. Were you willing to throw it all away for Talib at the time? At the time. Oh, you talking about the affair? Yeah, at, at the time. Okay, let me break it down. Okay. Apparently, Talib was interested in me before I got married. When I got married, it was me and my ex-husband had only been in each other's lives for nine months. We eloped. And that was it. So the, first, the last time Talib had seen me, he came to Black Lily. I wasn't married yet. And the next time he came, I was married. He was very upset about it. Um, and, you know, I wish you hadn't got married. You don't know what I feel about you, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, okay, great. Um, I was weird about that shit. I was like, okay, yeah, all right, what up? Go fuck another bitch. You'll get over it. You know, and it's, you know... Um, but then made it through the summer and my marriage was already bad. Like it was already bad. Like three months in, it was bad. He had some kind of psychosomatic issue. So he had erectile dysfunction. He had to go to the strip club to get arousal. And I'm like, you, only, you ain't got a lot to go to the strip club. I'm at the strip club. Right. And these bitches like me more than they like you. I'm more fun. People keep forgetting I'm bisexual. So, you know, I think he hated the fact that bitches was more into me than they were into him. Um, I was just more fun. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the shit was already bad. I, I was already contemplating divorce. And then the OK Player tour happened, and then I found out that Talib was signing on. And then um, first day of tour, he was on the fellas bus and then he decided he was going to move to my bus. And then we started having green tea in the mornings. Green tea. Yeah. If you don't mean and talking about philosophy and jazz and shit. And then it was, Jag, I can't believe you married and yada, yada, yada. So on the second night of the tour, we was fucking. Mm. I said, fuck it. That nigga over there, we over here. And then he was calling my room and I wasn't answering. And this was like, I wasn't carrying cell phones in 1999 like that, you know, especially not around and shit. I didn't give a fuck. There was always somebody around, it was always waiting. Plus I liked not being reached so easily. Um, and then that's when Tina snitched me out and told my ex-husband that I was in Talib's room and then he flew out and all that shit. I think the best part about that whole story is that night and day turned it into a cartoon, that shit. I'm glad it happened just for that. Cause that shit is funny as fuck and accurate. So, um, you know, all of that shit happened and then it was like, I was planning on filing for divorce, and then he came, and he was so heartbroken. He was always so fucking heartbroken. God, I wish he had been as big of a dick then as he became later, like. <laughs> can you broke my heart. I can't believe you fucking had sex with him. Why not? He's a fucking rapper. <laughs> I've been fucking rapping. <laughs> you did this to me. You did that to me. Like, you ain't doing shit while I'm away. I was thinking about, I can't believe you want to get divorced. We're supposed to be together. We're supposed to have children. And then it was all about children after that. Children, 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 children. So I ended up having a baby in the middle of the release of my first album. You know, the pressure. He was my husband. I Decided to marry him, so I gotta make it work. I gotta make it look good. I gotta make it look good for my family because I was a teen mom and I needed to create a family for my illegitimate child. And I gotta do this and I gotta be this and I gotta be that and I gotta be this and I gotta be that. And you know, I mean, I think it lasted as long as it did because I had so many wonderful affairs. Mm, wow. You know, if it <laughs> my they, marriage, they, they often they often say affairs help marriages. I mean, I don't know if it helped mine, but it definitely prolonged it. Because see, every time I fucking had an affair, then I was the bad guy, and then I had to sit there and I had to be humble and go to therapy. Yeah, <laughs> You know what I mean? I was always, but that's funny though, because I was always kind of like the nigga in a relationship. Nah, facts. Um, you know, like I'll never forget the one time that 
me and my ex got into it when we were still at the family house in Voorhees and I had looked over all the phone numbers on the phone bill. I was checking it because I had some issues with Sprint at the time. Sometimes back then Sprint got really interesting with the billing. Yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm going through the numbers and I keep seeing this repeat number that's coming from his line. And so I called it and it was some bitch that he was fucking with. And um uh, and she said, you know, I'm sorry. I, I know he's married, but he said that you were in an asylum and you had lost your mind and he was lonely and da 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 da. I was like, okay. I said, well, thank you, because what I'm about to do right now is lose my whole fucking mind. <laughs> and she said, are you okay? I said, babe, you have no idea. I'm good. She said, why? I said, because I'm going to the Cayman fucking Islands this weekend. Right. Thank you. Guy that I used to date had a plane. <laughs> he had been asking me to go to the Caymans with him so we could go gambling and kick it and do all that shit. But I was trying to be good, you know, giving my marriage a chance, <laughs> you know. And uh, then when I found the bitch's phone number, I'm like, yeah! So I call Henri and I tell him I'm available. And he told me he was going to have the plane in Atlantic City at the tarmac. And I'm like, what time? And I'm like, I'll be there. So I start packing and get everything <laughs> together. I cook some food and make sure that there's supper there in the house. You know, I'm not going to leave real ignorant. You know, right. I'm going to cook. And I cook supper. And then my ex-husband came in. And he, well, where are you going? I'm going to the Caymans. I'm going to Grand Cayman for the weekend. With who? With Henri. <laughs> who the fuck is that? I said, I don't know. <laughs> who is he? I said, I could ask you the same about this number. The highlighted number. Who the fuck is this? Right. Oh! I bye said, bye. it's cool. I already talked to her. She told me everything. Bye-bye. Dinner's in the stove. <laughs> and I'm finna go. I'm finna go. You're not gonna leave. Yeah, I am. I got a plane waiting on me. I'm going to the fuck up out of here. Oh, so you think that don't you don't think we need to talk about this? I said no. You fucking a whack bitch, and I'm fucking a nigga with a plane. Damn. <laughs> oh shit. God damn. I said point blank, and I said anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't, bitch. Bye. I'll be back Tuesday. My mom will take the kids if you want to go out and fuck this bitch or something. We good. But the food is in there. Everything is, you know, be well. It sounds like a good ass movie. I ain't going to hold you. <laughs> and I rolled out. Shit. And then it kind of just got like that. Um, the marriage just kind of became that. It was a series of affairs. But if y'all, if you like women, why y'all didn't ever just think about like, Doing things together? Like we tried that once. Oh, okay. And I felt bad about it because the woman that we tried that with was really in love with me and she didn't want to sleep with him, but she did it because of me. And there was a there was a day, there was an experience that happened, and I saw how uncomfortable she was. And she just kept looking at me. She's sitting there fucking him, but she's sitting there staring at me saying, I love you. I love you. And I'm like, yeah, this is too much. Now, I went into the bathroom. I started freaking out. He likes to tell the story as I got jealous of seeing him with another woman. I'm sure he <laughs> likes to tell like that. And I mean, that's cool. But the problem is the only time she would fuck him is if I asked her to. You know, it's one thing to brag on your dick if a bitch is really all about you and all for you. But if your wife has to make a bitch fuck you. Are you really the player that you you think you are? Like you're definitely not. <laughs> you're definitely not. I mean, he used to drop my name to chicks. Well, you know, I managed Jaguar, right? And da -da 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 -da, yada yada yada, and that was his come on line. I said, you can't even get pussy without me. That's deep. That's tough. That's tough. That's tough. You know, so when it gets that, when it gets down to that, mm, yeah. You just kind of stop giving a fuck. And um, it went to levels of don't give a fuck. And then I started noticing what it was doing to my son. Yeah. 
And I said, this has to stop. Me and you, we can play these games all day long. I've been fucking broken and built myself all the way back up again, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna let this shit kill that angel of a soul. And then that's when it just, you know, we got to the divorce. And then fucking the decade of ugly, the decade plus of ugly after that. He's been trying to make me feel sorry for so long. And I'm glad that I finally got into a place when it comes to that individual where I've made peace with it to a certain extent. Um, it was just really interesting because before my son came home, when he was still up there, um, he was supposed to be coming for Christmas. We were trying to work it out and then it just got weird and then he was supposed to be going to Miami with my sister, but then he couldn't go anywhere because his dad couldn't afford to pay um, a ticket. And apparently he had like open heart surgery or some shit. And, you know, so his heart's all fucked up now. And, you know, and it's, it's interesting. You would think that while he's dealing with all the complications of his life breaking down, I'm the smoker, I'm the drinker. He's supposed to be the perfect one, but they had to bust your heart open and unclog your arteries and shit and do all kinds of shit to you. He's had every kind of health scare. I think you could think of pro from prostate to the this to the that. And it's like, have you figured out yet that maybe the universe is trying to tell you something? <clears throat> like every time he do something fucked up to me, something bad happens to him. And you still keep justifying it and you know, so whatever. So at the end of the day, I guess to sum it all up, I'm good. I'm good with it. Every fucking torture that he's put me through in my life has been worth it to me because it was all for my son. Amen. And the one thing that my child knows better than anybody that nobody else could ever possibly know or understand is that I'm the parent that's willing to die for him if need be. He knows that. He knows there's nothing that I won't do for him. There's not a lot of people that can say that about their parents, without a doubt. I went to jail for him. I fought cases for him. I've dealt with bullshit for him. And yeah, no, nah, I, I love him. Now, you Probably love him more than I've ever loved anyone in my life. Now you you said an astronomical number while we was talking. <laughs> what? One point five million. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, how much money he beat me out of? Yeah. Fleecing my fucking accounts, doing all kinds of shit, going to my ex business manager, which is why I fired him and having him cut checks while I'm on the road for nothing. All kinds of shit. Meanwhile. I come home and I got to pay foreclosure on my house because you ain't paid the fucking mortgage while I was gone either, bitch. There's a whole lot of fucking shit. I, he done beat through a whole lot of fucking cash. And he's still sitting here begging for another $16,000 in child support. I'll get around to it. I'm about to challenge it because the number's wrong. You know, technically, <laughs> I've been unemployed. There you go. Stand on You it. can't charge me whatever you thought you was going to charge me for, for child support. I have to be able to prove that I made said income. My son was murdered. I was grieving for a year. Right. And then after that, the pandemic came. And then I had a whole emotional breakdown over a friend dying. And I fucking cried bloody murder on the whole world. And then my life was threatened. I had to go on the road. And all of this shit has been documented online. So, yeah, didn't nobody make no fucking money. Mm. Technically. Now... I want to touch on a friend dying, but even before we get there, I got to ask you about yeah. 2001, Jay-Z Unplugged. Yeah. The Jaguar Riders there, yeah. heart of the city. Yeah. It's the 21-year it's the anniversary. It's the 21-year anniversary, month. and I don't think we've seen nothing like that since. And I know you posted it. We're going to talk about the network, but I know you posted it and put it out mm -hmm. there. Uh, I want you to touch on the either the genius or the insanity of Jay-Z. Um, this man, as far as what he's done since then... Mm -hmm is, you know, either preordained, destined, or he had a plan. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like he geared himself towards it. But mm -hmm. you were there to witness it firsthand from what he was back then. Mm -hmm. I just want you to, like, because, you know, not many people have a firsthand 
account of what this man is doing and what he's about to do. In 21 years, I have never had anything to say about Mr. Sean Carter other than the fact that we had a pleasant working relationship and he was an excellent businessman. 21 years. In 21 years. And after 21 years. What I will say to you is, is, is this. The first time I ever saw Jay-Z or even heard him spit a rhyme was at an MC battle, street battle in New York. But he didn't show up as Jay-Z. He didn't show up as the hottest rapper on the street. He showed up as the nigga that was with Big L. Rest For in those peace. of you. Rest in peace, Big L. Rest in peace, Big L. One of the that dopest. The One of the dopest. Yes. Big L was who put Jay-Z on. Without question. And then Big L died, and then the next thing you know, Jay-Z. And then, you know, he starts clientele with Tupac and clientele with Biggie and doing songs with Biggie and building a working, you know, camaraderie with Honeycombs and um, AKA Diddler, I mean Diddy. And um, why do you give him the honeycombs? Why, why do you give him honeycombs? Because he smacks so sweet. <laughs> that fucking sodomite. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, then, you know, and then reasonable doubt was happening, and then Dame's in the picture, and Dame's building Rockefeller, and everybody's talking about Jay Z, Jay Z. And don't get me wrong, there is nobody who loves reasonable doubt more than me. Mm. At the time Nobody. of. Nobody. No, still. Yes, to this day. Still. Listen to me. I don't give a fuck how I feel about you. For me to have bad feelings about someone and not acknowledge art and its greatness or at its finest is hating. Maybe I don't fuck with you, but them shoes is hot, yo. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's... You gotta be real. Mm. So I will never. Shit, I was just listening to Watch the Throne earlier this week, and I'm and that shit was enraging me. Cause I'm like, y'all motherfuckers was living for this fucking album and was Kanye, 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 Kanye. And then all of y'all made all of this money on this motherfucking dude, and now all of a sudden. Who, him? Yeah. <laughs> like, <Go ahead. laughs> <laughs> like he was good enough when you let him slump just Blaze's fucking whole career. Mm. He was how, the shit. That's how issue in the it, it, it was worth putting just Blaze on the line for because just Blaze was Rockefeller production until Kanye. Yeah. Who's just Blaze producing for now? That I don't know. Who is? Yeah, I said that I don't know. And he was it. He was, he was the movement. Where is Just Blaze? Yeah. I mean, he was making hoes beats. You got title. You're a billionaire. Mm. Where the fuck is Just Blaze? That's the question. Is he, why is he, he's not at least an executive at Rock Nation? He's not at least an executive at Title? At least. Like I said, Biggie, Biggie died, Tupac died, and then there was the, the, the fight between who was the top rapper now, Nas and, and Jay-Z, and then the next thing you know, Nas has a nervous breakdown, and he's taken out of the game, and then it's all Jay-Z. It's all Jay-Z. It's all Jay-Z. And he was working with R. Kelly, and they were making so many records together. You know, they made all of those records together. They both fucked Aaliyah. They shared so much in common. You know? And then... There was a falling out. And that's like it never happened. 
Whoever talks about best of the both worlds, best of both worlds. Nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about this shit. Nobody talks about that project. That 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 nigga swept that smooth under the rug. Why? (laughs) We know why. You know what? I got a better question. (laughs) Yeah. How valuable is a Biggie Smalls verse? Mm. Yeah. Can you put value? Puffy has been making money off of Biggie's name for longer than Biggie was alive. People keep forgetting he hadn't turned 25 yet. He was still 24 when he died. It's been over 25 years. Fucking Puffy has been making money on that boy's name longer than he lived. It supported all of Bad Boy. His catalog. Clearly, a Biggie Smalls verse is very valuable. Am I wrong? Does anybody disagree with me? No, that's facts. So then what the fuck happened to the commission? What happened to that album? Right. It was recorded. It was being mixed and mastered upon Biggie's death. It was supposed to have came out that summer after Biggie's album because Biggie's album was slated. He died a week and a half before his album came out. Then the commission was supposed to come out, and that was supposed to be his exit from Bad Boy. And then starting his own company. <clears throat> so tell me something. And this ain't me being an asshole. I think everybody that knows Sean Carter knows that he will slump anyone in any relationship for a dollar. Look at how he did Dane. Like, I don't give a fuck if you wanted to get away from your homie, if you wanted to get away from your partner, but to do it the way he did it, it's malicious. But maybe that was because he was fucking the girl that didn't want you. Oh. Let the church say amen? I don't know. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why you moved his ass around and now the Rockefeller's so tough and then just moved right over to Def Jam. By the way, wasn't this all around the time when Aaliyah died? Yeah. And Beyonce's solo career was struggling? Jam on your horn now, that fucking bullshit ass record. Mm. From the Austin Powers shit, it was some of the worst shit ever. They were having a hard time taking her solo. And then Aaliyah died. And then they brought Rich Harrison in, and you know how kind of think it's okay right now. She liked posing with him in pictures for, for page six. Aaliyah didn't. She fell in love with Dane. And Aaliyah's gone, and you know. You have to start asking yourself questions after being in this business for this long. If you're a halfway intelligent person, when do you start questioning how lucky some motherfuckers keep getting? Right. Is it really a conspiracy if the same person keeps benefiting off the same kind of tragedy over and over and over again? So to answer your question, um, I'm sure he's always going to be a billionaire, and I'm sure he's got great things to happen. I mean, look, he's got the job with the NFL. He's hooking all his friends up with the halftime shows. I mean, think about it. Think about the halftime shows. Jennifer Lopez, Shakira, All Rock Nation. Now uh, Rihanna, and then um, we had the whole L.A. thing, which, of course, he was involved in that, and then they, they pulled Mary J. Blige off to, you know, make, make sure she got that money for Kendu. And, you know, they had that, that whole moment, you know. And, but all he's doing is using his friends and the people that he fucks with, or at least the people that signs his non-disclosure agreements, he keeps getting them... The Super Bowl gig. So, I mean, like, he's doing all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and I do not begrudge him. It's just, if you got to do the kind of things that he's done to get where he's gotten, yeah, fuck it. I, I, don't, I don't want it that bad. So, I don't want nothing that bad. So, so I, Which is why I can't understand why people are so willing to just 
write Kanye off as insane. And that's what I want to touch on. Like, what do you, what is your what is your thoughts on some of the? Do you think it's he's trying to tell us something that we don't understand, or do you think he's really just going off the rails with no, some I of the think comments? He's telling everybody exactly what they don't want to hear. He's doing the same thing I did two years ago. It's just he's Kanye West, you know. So it's like relentless. I was like, yeah, popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, He's you giving know, it up though. He's he's he's, he's giving it up like. A, it's just Chris sad. Paul. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, he threw Chris Paul up under the bus. I'm like, okay. Why not? Why? That's what the fuck is so special about these motherfuckers? Right. That they get to call him crazy and he don't get to say shit back. Right. Everybody can have an opinion about him, but he can't have one. Mm. Oh why? Oh yeah, his loudspeaker is better than yours. Mm. See, that's the real fucking problem. It's the brands. It's the real fucking problem. Y'all talk shit about this motherfucker all the time. You don't hear him complaining. He just keeps moving. But when he starts saying, oh my God, you know he's ill. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's, he's very unwell. Fuck out of here. So what, because he's crazy, that means he can't tell the truth. He's been crazy. He was crazy when he went up on that stage and fucking stripped that shit off of fucking uh, <laughs> uh, Taylor Swift. But did anybody pay attention to how the show ended that night? Let me point out Kanye's genius. It was the first night he performed. Let's get a toast for the douchebags. Let's get a toast for the assholes. Let's get a toast for the scumbags. Every one of them that I know. He fucking acted like all of those things. He acted it out in real life and then he sang the song. And that shit went what? Like ain't nobody even pay attention to that. Damn. He actually disrespected the fuck out of this little girl and then turned around and already had the theme song written. <laughs> so is he crazy or calculated? You tell me. Yeah, calculated. That's the best part. <laughs> the sad part is his level of brilliance is so pure that most people, it, it's like a dog whistle. That shit hide in a motherfucker. And the motherfuckers that are tuned and able to hear it are like, woo! But everybody else like, why the fuck is this motherfucker with his... You know what I mean? That's what it looks like to people. That's the difference between being woke and being conscious. I do not think he's insane. I think he suffers from extreme grief. I think he, uh, as one of the artists that I work with said, might be struggling with a little buyer's remorse because he did buy into the game and maybe he feels a little differently about some of the choices that he made in his younger years maybe that's why he's able to talk about his mom being sacrificed and it's so funny because people are so quick to label that as you know see i told you he's sick i told you he's crazy but then i went back and did a little research about her plastic surgeon. Cause you know she died from the effects of plastic surgery. Did anybody bother to check this motherfucker out? His record was terrible. He had a bunch of motherfucking like, um, he had been sued, uh, malpractice insurance. He couldn't even get malpractice insurance for less than $10 million in some places. He, he didn't have the best record. And every interview that he did, that motherfucker looked like he, he, I didn't do anything wrong. Why the fuck you so defensive? If she died from natural complications, why are you defensive as a, as a physician? I, I didn't do anything. Makes you wonder when you go back and look. You know, and then he had said in one of the interviews that he did, 
Kanye knows why his mom died. I just wish he would tell the truth about it. That's what the doctor said. Oh, wow. And this was a year and a half after Donda died. So if the doctor said all of these years ago, Kanye knows what happened to his mother. I wish he would tell the truth about it. And now he's saying my mother was sacrificed. I don't know. Is he crazy? Is he? You know, it's people love things tied up in nice little neat little boxes and they want it to be something that they can fathom in their imagination. And the truth is, life is stranger than fiction. Wow. So my opinion on Kanye West, talk, <laughs> share, and do you, bro. Because I, too, know what it feels like. Just wish my loudspeaker was as big as yours. But I'm out here fighting. Doing the, doing the thing, you know, he's, he's had it. Does he have tics? Does he have nervous issues? Does he have shit that other people have? I got PTSD, I suffer from anxiety at times, you know, it, does that mean that I'm not capable of telling the truth? I don't know. But if the best you can do is take him from being a four billionaire to a 400 millionaire, if that's the best shot you got, then. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, that's the, best, that's the best you can do. You take away 90% of his money and he still got 400 million? <laughs> <laughs> still. I'm still. still. <laughs> and then you get his friends, people that have made money with him, money off of him, to go on TV and to shush, nigga, shush. Shush, nigga, shush. But it was all good when you was making money off of them. You know what I mean? I got friends that went crazy and lost their mind. I got friends who are veterans who go through real... Me and my husband have gone down to the VA to sit with people. And guess what? I might not fuck with him as much because it's a lot to take. But ain't nobody ever heard me denounce him and say that I ain't never fucking with him again or just write him off. Like, real friends? Y'all think he's sick? Y'all think he's got issues? Then why ain't you coming to his aid? Why ain't you fucking helping him? Oh, that's, that's right. He can talk because he didn't kill anybody. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. That's the reason mm -hmm. why he can talk. It's because he ain't got the skeletons that the most of the motherfuckers that he know God. I wish I could be his translator. I think if Kanye could tell me what he was saying right. and give it to me, I could take it and deliver it how it needs to go. You know, like even with the Alex Jones interview, he really, he just has such bad delivery, but <laughs> it hits so hard that I really can't hate on it. He's a Christian. He's said it a million mm. times. He's a Christian. He believes in Jesus. And as a Christian, you're supposed to love everybody, even your enemies. Even your enemies. So if you truly live by that, why can't you say that you love Nazis? If you're supposed to love everybody, even your enemy, why can't he? He can't have the love that God has for them because God loves them too. Amen. God loves everybody. And as a Christian, you're supposed to follow the footsteps. Mm -hmm. So did he really say anything wrong? Or is he just punching y'all motherfuckers in the eye just to fuck with you because he knows it's going to get you riled up and then you're going to have him back in the news feed again. Like it actually took takeoff dying to slow him down in the algorithm for a second. And he's still out there. And I just, I can't judge him. I actually dig what he's doing. You know, I, I'm a provocateur as well. 
Shake the table, tear the shingles off the roof, you know, whatever. However you want to do it, you know what I mean? Say roof of Escalade, like whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like turn into Thanos for a hot second, rip up half of the world, like whatever you got to do. When people have this kind of extreme social reaction, it is a reaction to something. Sexual abuse and, and, and the desecration of legitimate legacies and entertainment, that was the, that was the ugh for me. And it created this reaction. Something apparently happened to Kanye. Um, and this is his reaction. Another thing that you um you spoke on on our last interview, which is, has become more prevalent, is like how our hip hop artists, women artists, are being treated. The level of violence we're seeing now, like we have your Creshawn Rocks and your Blue Faces and your your Meg the Stallions. Um, when you getting see things shot, like not that, getting shot, getting shot, not getting shot. When you see things getting like shot, that. Not getting shot. When you see things like that, like what's up, Tori? <laughs> okay, well, what do you, what do you, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? Get shot. Get shot. Get shot. I get shot. Um, my thoughts are, when you have people that are desperate to achieve a goal for a certain life, um, they'll do anything for it. They'll do anything. That, that's all these women are, are doing right now in female hip hop. They're proving that they're willing to do anything. It's just not working out for Sweetie. <laughs> Poor Sweetie. But she be doing the most. Had a whole commercial with the, the sauce, the Sweetie sauce. and I guess nobody that, what was that, the Burger King? Yeah. <laughs> was it Burger it was King? McDon I think it was McDonald's. It was McDonald's, yeah. She it, and the, the sweetie. Yes. Like, how couldn't you sell more than two thousand? Like, you couldn't get at least five thousand of them people that ate the meals, the sweetie meals, the sweetie deal. They couldn't buy the record. Like, the deal is real. I'm just, I'm just saying. The deal is real. Sell the album with the hey. Yeah, like two ninety nine. Go get you. Let's get creative. That will be. Hey, that'd be hard though. <laughs> Hey, you just got a CD in the Happy Meal? Like, oh, shit. We take what they going to do? Give you a CD? Don't nobody fucking use that <laughs> shit no more. <laughs> the deal is real. We taking it back to the 80s. Fuck you, man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, here's a CD. What's this? The retro meal? Like, yeah, yeah, the retro meal. <laughs> hey, that might be hard. I mean, that's the idea, though. For <laughs> what you talking about? <laughs> no, but I mean, it's just... Look at fucking... Look, look at fucking Doja Cat. What the fuck is that? Now she throws off the algorithm a little bit because you know she that? came out of left field. Yeah, no, I, I thought she was gonna be great because she, yeah, yeah, she, 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 she came. No, she came different. I said the Generation Z will buy into different. Do you see how different she is now? I'll shave my eyebrows and I'll still show up on the red carpet. And Do I'm you like, see how different she is now? I, oh yeah, oh yeah. It's kind of wild. It's kind of wild now. And I, I don't think she's done. I don't think she's done. I, I think it's more to come. I think she can't be done. He <laughs> said she can't be done. I think she can never stop. So I think if she stops, she'll turn into a 90-year-old woman and be sure, yeah, look at your feet. <laughs> the wool <wall> cover. <laughs> oh, it's been a spin. So, so she looks like a, she reads, listen to me. She gives, she, she's giving me witch. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's what she's trying to give. No, if you go back and you look at um, what's the movie? The witches with yeah, Angelica Houston. Yeah. No, Angelica oh, no, Houston. Uh, the witches, witches. Yeah, the witches. Yeah. She looked like them bitches when they would come out of their wings. <laughs> Turn into mouses, goddamn. And in the nose and ah, they're gonna eat your children. <laughs> you know, and all of that shit. Like, no, hey, she's hey, giving yeah, that. I want people to stop Google the witches with Angelica yeah, Houston and then shout come out in. to Angelica Houston. You everything, man. <laughs> no. And you were you were awesome as Morticia. No one will ever awesome. play Morticia yeah, like you. Yeah. Shout out Wednesday. But uh, you know, it's like this bitch is giving me witch. So it brings me to my question. We talked about it yesterday, and we talked about the the Her that goddamn cat. Then that cat, that goddamn cat. <laughs> Listen to me. You know, you know that the cats were the guardians in the tombs. 
Oh, teach me something. Yeah, in the tombs, they would put cats in there. They were the guardians for the spirit world. Oh, okay. And they okay. would chase away evil spirits to keep them out of the sarcophaguses and stuff like that. Man. I'm always weary of motherfuckers with cats. Oh, sometimes. okay, yeah, oh, cat lady, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're into black magic. She gives me that vibe. She gives me that vibe, and I think if she stops, she's going. She'll be like eighty. So we we spoke the other day, and I said, "She uh, has old looking eyes sometimes." Uh, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so when she shaved the eyebrows, it made you focus more on the eyes. <laughs> no, when she shaved the eyebrows, I simply said, "Why?" <laughs> but you know, you're raising a good point because she was like, "I'm done with music. I quit. I'm tired of my fans being harassed." And, and then she, she started... came back. <laughs> she, she was. <laughs> <laughs> One rat tail. I have new. I'm telling you. Put me back up. It's giving me. It's giving me that. It's giving me special potions. Do you feel some of these celebrities are trying to chase the Michael Jackson mystique? I mean. I guess. You know, for me, when I think of artists like that, it's like it's like the girl or the guy that you always wanted to get with that would never give you the time of day. That's just oh, yeah. kind of how I feel about chasing Michael Jackson fame. Like, it's never going to happen for you. <sighs> so stop. What do you feel? How do you feel no, about that? No, nobody will ever touch that. What do you feel about the comparisons, though? Like, now we have the Chris Brown comparison. Of course, he says that Michael Jackson, he will never be that. But and I'm glad he's smart enough to know that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's fucking brilliant. Yeah. And he's the closest thing that I've seen. And unfortunately, you know, he handled up. You're right. They got him. They, they got him. He can't move right or left too far. Haven't you noticed that? Yeah. His whole fucking career has been like whack-a-mole. Every time he starts creeping up, pop! <laughs> For real. Something's just going. Am I wrong? Put it right, right back. Every time he's building, pop! Get your head. Like a, pop! <laughs> he definitely got a black ship. Like, yeah. he, if he comes anything above, like, right here, pop! Put it right there. For real. For real. Yeah. He should be insane. Thank God he's not. He has his moments, and he should. Because he's been in a fucking jail for the, ever since that shit with Rihanna. He's been in fucking prison. And they holding him. And guess what? There's stuff that people know about him that I'm sure he don't want nobody to know. You know, it, it, that's why it's so important to come clean and to be clean if you're going to fuck with this game in any way, shape, or form. Because they will use everything against you and tie you up. I wish they'd stop bopping him on the head because he's so fucking talented. So I'm curious. I just let him come out, man. Let him come out. Let him. Let him come out. Out there, Chris. They've let far worse people out. You know, there's some real sick motherfuckers that people love. Fucking R. Kelly ran around the United States without in fucking punity, fucking up a whole generation of bitches mm. and some small boys. <sighs> Y'all let him run. Right is on the wall. Let fucking Chris run. You know? If you were to see, they have a new biopic with Whitney Houston coming out. I don't. If if they play this movie and you see no kind of drugs in this movie, do you feel like it's an injustice to what this looks? I feel like anything was? with her name on it is strictly for the purposes of financial gain for those who have access to her estate, including Clive Davis. Including Clive Davis. Clive Davis. This ain't a. Film to celebrate Whitney Houston. This is a film to, uh, you know, pay the pay the pay the piper. He was the one trying to bring her back, though, at the time of prior to her death, right? Fuck it, him. Uh, okay. He needed her back. Oh yeah. He needed her back, but he needed her back and under his control. Mm. You want to know what fucking Clive Davis did for Whitney Houston? Oh. While he was busy trying to bring her back. See, people forget, before she came to the United States, he sent her on an international tour. Mm. And she went out on tour, and she was still getting high at the time. Um, you know, let's see. What happens if I put in 
Whitney Houston. Kazakhstan. Mm. That's what she was that's what she went. She was down in Kazakhstan? Oh man. This was not long before she passed away. I think I know what you're Oh, about here's the full concert. She only did four songs. Yeah, I think I know you but I think I remember the voice. Huh? Yeah, I remember you I, with the voice. I know you're about to go with this. I think I remember this one. Not just the voice. Just everything. The whole show. <laughs> the, 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 Look at, look at how she starts the show. She's performing for the president. Oh, yeah. This is his birthday performance. Oh. Oh, is this where I am? Is it? her out in the world. She got paid $180,000 for four songs that night. Oh. This is how we had her out there in the street. Wow, oh, man. Oh, ouch. Straight to yeah, the first. Yeah, 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 it's a... Yeah, I see that. It's definitely a... Uh, It'll make you cry if you really love music and if you really love Whitney Houston. And then after a couple of joints, you will find it hilarious. Mm. Because, not because you're happy that she's falling apart. It's just she's doing the crackhead antics so dope. You know what I mean? It was... She was in it. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Nigga, what? Nigga, what is my key, bitch? Uh, like, she's uh, in front of the president of Kazakhstan. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But it was good enough to get that check, though. And then he put her in rehab to clean her up right before it came time for America, because she had to at least appear sober yeah. in America for the whirlwind story. And then, they, then they, they brought in R. Kelly to do that song for her, the pedophile, <laughs> that she had to use auto-tune to sing because her lungs were so jacked up from all the smoking. And you know, a lot of people didn't know she was a heavy smoker. She was a chain smoker. She smoked three packs in Newport today yeah. and still could sing like that. But when you add in the cocaine or the crack and then the this and the that and then the... When they did her autopsy, they said there was nothing wrong with her throat. She, her lungs were so damaged that she couldn't fuel the notes it was her lungs. It wasn't. Her voice was fine. Oh. That's that's how that's how Clive did it. And then the next thing you know, she's fucking Ray J. And yeah, that, then yeah, it's that Grammy happened. time. That happened. And her and Clive had a fight two days before. And from what I was told, Bobby Christina was present for some of that fight. And then the next thing you know, um, she's dead. Ray J was the last person to see her alive. He let the drug dealer in, but she was sober, right? But he let the drug dealer in that gave her the shot. Leola has said, Leola Brown, Bobby Brown's sister, has said on several occasions that her, she was beaten. Mm. They saw her body. She didn't just die in a tub, like she was beat up. Oh, wow. And Brandy was the one that found her. But you know they they pledge allegiance to yeah. Clive too. Jeez. Well, you know, Ray J was kinda down on his luck because the whole bullshit had happened and then, you know, Whitney was dead and he was using her as he's said himself for clout and then all of a sudden he got love and hip hop. LA after Whitney died. And then they inappropriately put her stupid ass goddaughter on there. Uh yeah. I, I just thought it was all kind of cheesy. Um, yeah, so now I probably won't be watching the movie just because I know whose money the proceeds are going to and fuck him. 
<clears throat> fuck you, Royalty, and fuck you for inventing Diddy. Ugh. Fuck you for that. Fuck you for letting that out of control, whack ass fucking whoremonger and sodomite just run rampant all over this goddamn fucking business. Fuck you for that. Like Andre, Andre was different. Andre had class. Andre had, had some integrity. But no, you, you, you go to get the little Chucky doll. That fucker. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm a little yes. upset about it. Um, because Al B. Shore just came out of his coma, and mm. I've been talking to Al, and we've been texting back and forth, and I'm just glad that he's alive to text. Oh, wow. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but when you think about Kim, I was thinking to myself the other day, Uptown Records started with five people. Andre Harrell, I'll be sure, Heavy D, and Puffy. And Kim was the longest working employee because she was there from the very beginning. She was Andre's personal assistant. Mm -hmm. Kim is dead. Heavy D is dead. Yeah. Andre Harrell is dead. The only two left are Puffy and Al, and Al almost died. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Heavy D was found dead, face down in the heart attack. Andre Harrell, heart attack. Kim died from pneumonia, but there's the first coroner's report that said that she died. It, it was ruled a homicide and they found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. And then right after that, Al had a meeting and I was gonna meet up with him because we were in Vegas and then the next thing you know, you wanna know what they all had in common though? The survivors and the, and, and the late of Uptown Records, they were all writing tell-all books. Mm -hmm. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book before she died. And Al B. Shore was working on the documentary of his life. And then he goes into a coma. Has Puffy ever been in a coma? Has he, has anything happened to him? He must be the luckiest motherfucker because it seems like everybody that worked at Uptown Records from the very beginning is gone. Just him. I guess Al disappointed you. You know, it's, I speak for a reason. When you see this bullshit ass motherfucking game fucking with people that you love, that you like, you know, that you. It's too many coincidences. Too many. You. Fuck you, honeycomb. Oh. <laughs> Stamp it. We're going to get you and your little dog, too. Mm. And congratulations, young Miami. <laughs> Run as fast as Cassie did. <laughs> Has anybody asked they self about that shit? I mean, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are asking about <laughs> what's, what's going on with it. They're saying it's it is, a Yeah, a lot of people are looking at it like that's the way the new relationship should work. What, uh, to get paid? Yeah, she was getting 500K a month. She quit because he, he dropped her down. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where they're at with it now. No, but understand this. Think about this. And there are women in this room. Why would you quit? What the fuck is going on that 250000 ain't enough? Ladies? Like, fuck the fact that, that, that he... I'm just saying, fuck the fact that he cut it from 500 to 200. Who the fuck gives a shit? 200K? Who 250K? Who turning down 250K a month? Mm. 
What the fuck is going on in that relationship that 250K ain't enough? Could see some things, could see some things. That ain't worth 250K, that's gotta be some dark shit. Mm. Like people are not understanding that that girl quit 250K. Mm. Four million every quarter. Well, I'm sorry, a million every quarter. <laughs> shit. Now she was getting two million a quarter, but then she got, you know, fuck you got going on. That's so deep <laughs> that it ain't worth a million a quarter. Mm. They told a story um, about Cassie one time, mm -hmm. and she was saying um, someone had asked her why she cut her hair, mm -hmm. and she was like, uh, well, uh, Diddy said he, he just liked it that way. And they said when she answered the question, it was like she was in a trance. <laughs> like she was just like, I just don't know. Diddy just said he would like my hair this way. Mm -hmm. and, he, <laughs> and like, they was like so in awe, like how she didn't even have – a thought about it. It was just what he wanted. That's how he operates. He has people followed. He has people watched. He does all kinds of fucking. He's a fucking piece of shit. Too much money. I feel, I feel bad for the kids. Mm. Like, don't think that there are moments when I'm speaking honestly about that motherfucker that I pray that his children don't hear it. Because that's still their dad. I know what it's like to have a baby with a fucked up ass motherfucker. As much as I can't stand my ex-husband, I would never want my son to feel bad about either one of us being his parent. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. I would never want that. Exactly. But their father is the fucking devil. Mm. He the fucking devil. Now, I have to say, uh, you have now your own platform, Jay. Yes, I do. Daladelphia. Daladelphia TV Network. TV Dalton. Network. Um, we'll be able to subscribe, mm -hmm. see it on Roku. Mm -hmm. uh, let it, let's clap that up. Daladelphia. <laughs> Daladelphia. <laughs> like, are you mixing the Philly with the Dallas? What does Daladelphia mean? What does that mean? I knew when I came down here, I wanted to start a production company, but my whole goal for coming down here was to bring something to this city. I think this city is highly overlooked highly. when it comes to music. Um, and it's not all the industry's fault. The people that work in this marketplace haven't done enough for this marketplace. They haven't. And I said, you know what? Sometimes things get stale, you know? I have a whole post on my Instagram when I was still lift driving when I first moved down here. Best thing I ever did because I got to learn the whole fucking Metroplex. Seriously. Yes. And I got to scout out. I always worked the concerts. I always worked. Like, I learned this city. Like, I can't believe, I don't believe in living in a city and you don't know every inch of it. Like, when I took my husband home, we walked a lot. Mm because I walked my city. I knew every inch of my city. That's how you keep your pulse to what the people need. So when you go into that booth, you're making the music for them. Mm. Hardest part about Dallas is Dallas really doesn't have an identity. It doesn't. Great music here, but as a community, there's no real identity. You have these big figures that come from here, that made a name from here. But if Dallas moved like Houston moves, it'd be a whole nother fucking level. 32 Grammy Award winners in this area. Mm. And most people don't even know it. And, and, and the people here are just, they're so comfortable with accepting what they're given, you know? It, I take my portion of greens and cold bread and all along, and I mean, you know? Mm. <laughs> it's I real remember. chitlin' circuit down here. Meanwhile, there's all these fucking corporations, and none of these people are corporately sponsored. Who, who's corporately sponsored down here? 
Shouldn't Erica Badu have a corporate sponsorship down here? Shouldn't Kirk Franklin have some kind of sponsorship deal other than playing at Megafest for TD Jakes? Like, I'm, there's not enough synergy. There's all of this industry and not enough synergy. And yeah. Please hold that thought. Why do you think TD Jakes was at Puff Daddy's birthday party? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just, I, <laughs> you know, do you remember when Bernie Mac played the minister on Friday? Yes. That's how I feel about TD Jakes. <laughs> like, that's how I see, oh, Miss Parker, come to pray. I, but I didn't, for him to be at a Diddy party, I don't know. Like, I, I feel the same way about that as I feel about when Tyler Perry came to his church and laid hands on him and he caught the Holy Spirit from Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry is the bishop of what? <laughs> like, I've never, like, and I cut a check for 100 and I'm going to lay my hands on your bishop. And he said, ah, ah. And then the bitch is it's on the fucking internet. He's ah, he's doing all of this, right? And then there's a woman on on the on the dais screaming, push the baby out. Birth that baby. Push the I'm like, what? are we a church? Or is this about to turn into like a whole nother scene, like a lost scene from eyes wide shut? Like <laughs> this shit is looking a little weird. I mean. If Bishop Jakes was at a Diddy party, there could only be two reasons. Money or sex. That's all that happens at Diddy parties. Money and sex. I, I, just, I hope it was for money. Charitable contribution. I hope it was for money because arguing about who's going to put the strap on on is... <laughs> that can be a very uncomfortable situation. You know, we're going to pray on it. Praise the Lord. You know? Amen. Uh, but no, nah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dallas, Dallas leading an uh, influx of Jaguar, right? The Dallas Duffy Network. Um, what's all Dallas the, wait, is my future. Philadelphia is my history. Mm. That's why it's Dallas. Bridge the gap. Uh, are you... Are you looking to be go beyond censorship? Because it seems like the powers that be would love to close you down, oh, shut you up. Me all the I don't time. want to call it blackballing, but no, I've been blackballed twice. We can call it. Oh what shit! It is. Well, let's call it what it is. I got damn black. It's funny. Every time they blackball me, people start talking about me even more. It's the same thing's happening with Kanye. It's awesome. <laughs> the only thing these pussies force me to do is to create a space where they're not welcome. Now, last time. You endorsed a few artists. Yeah, I did. Um, so now can we get the updated list of Jaguar's top five? I mean... Or you ain't got to be five. I mean, whoever you think is dope that, that we slept on. Because I actually... Javon what, Angel. Javon Angel, okay. I put my... Yeah. I got, I got that feeling. I got that feeling about that kid. And he's my partner in Philadelphia. And I'm looking forward to being his partner and to being his auntie. Of course, I'm going to say Rakeem Al-Jabbar because that's just that. It's always going to be that. K-Riz in Canada. Man. And it's just... Who? Oh, yeah. Well, well yeah, Jaguar French. Oh, wait, you got a, like a coalition? <laughs> we got the Jaguar coalition? His name is Jaguar French. <laughs> okay. I don't like to That's bring the, it up because yeah. I don't want it to sound like there's some kind of favoritism. Right. When somebody came to me... <laughs> oh, shit, yeah, there's clearly no, favoritism. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm just saying with something, though, because somebody came to me and... It's okay. Jaguar French. I don't know who the fuck is that. Yeah, yeah. My name is Jaguar. Right. I don't know who that is. Right. But then we met. And I'm about to start writing with him. And there are a couple female artists that 
hardcore development, I think it could be something special, especially Kirion Johnson, something else, really something else. That's my baby girl. I love her to death. I mean, the truth is, is what I'm hoping to do with Daladelphia is put cameras on what it's like to watch real art in real time. And, you know, starting with the Daladelphia Jam Sessions, which will be happening once a month, every month. And then some of them are going to be international. That's far. So there's going to be, you know, just that, ooh, all of that craziness. And it's just, I want to be a safe space. I want to be a space for these artists to come and take a chance on themselves without oversight, without censorship. And it's all subscriber based. So we know that the people that are there are there because they want to be. Right. Not because it was free to download. Mm. And that's what's up. And, and like for those, you know, who are unaware, like you said, bringing the real music back. I love live shows, um, you know, the good music. What all is, on my where, channel. Where, all okay. my concerts. Where? Done virtually on my channel. Gotcha, gotcha. And this is going to be on a website, Daladelphia.com? Oh, it's all, it's all going to be there. The first uh, virtual concert that we did that we filmed on the first will be up and available next week. It's almost out of edit. But if you want to come pop out, if, if real life want to come pop out and get, you know, a little bit of uh, little footage, where, where can well, we come Well, I pop mean, out? if you guys want to bring some cameras down to Houston on New Year's Eve, you're more than welcome to because that's my next gig. Hey, hey turn up. New Year's in Houston. I'm going to be in Sugar Land. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd love for y'all to come down. We need to have fun. We haven't had, like, we, we have a relationship. We have this thing that we got here, but it's been very confined. We need to take this thing, yeah, you know, now that I'm not afraid of, you know, getting shot all the time, you know, I think it's a great time to try that out. And my man right here has an oh, idea. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I keep my stick on me, so we're going to be good to go. Okay, okay. You keep my stick on me. Everywhere in Texas. We ain't playing none of that. All corners. All corners of Texas, I got that stick. So. Uh, I'm trying to be a safer place. Nah, you the safest. You know, <laughs> you know what I've heard, and I live by this. What? Uh, stay dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you could be safe, but it's better to stay dangerous. Cause when, cause that means when you're dangerous, they stay out your way. <laughs> Don't you think it would be a great idea to be a, a little bit of both? Hey man, say. I would love that. I've grown a healthy respect for fear. Amen. In my older age. I was very fearless when I was younger. But what I realized is, is fear isn't a coward's um, move. It's just someone who's actually thinking about what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. That's what fear does for me. It makes me stop. It makes me think about mm -hmm. what I'm going to do next. When I was younger, I had serious anger issues. I didn't think. Right. Shit just happened. Amen. Shit happened and I had reactions and that was my whole life. And now I feel the need to not be so quick to react. Sometimes not be so quick to respond. Yeah. But just speak when it's necessary. Say what needs to be said. Do what needs to be done. And be conscientious because the truth is with the kind of anger issues and PTSD issues that me and my husband deal with just from the lives that we live, him, him from combat, me from surviving North Philly, you know, just, which is about the same because we used to joke all the time in North Philly. Soldiers would go to Iraq and come back home and then be dead in three days. Wow. Like motherfucker could survive the fucking, <laughs> the desert, yeah, but could yeah. survive North Philly, you know? And we look at the news, it's, a lot worse than it was when I was growing up, and that's interesting. But um, I, I just learned to, I don't have to, ah! <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. for, for everything, or, or even for the things that I think, like I, I'm a warrior. Mm, you definitely are. You know what I mean? That's who I am. I'm, you know, and, and when you take a warrior and you set them down, you know, it, what was that shit 
that Stone showed us. Stone Mecca. Shout out to Stone Mecca, by the way. Oh, yeah, when Wiley Coyote, it was on Family Guy, right? Mm -hmm. There was this episode when Wiley Coyote finally got the Roadrunner. Mm -hmm. Did you guys see that? Mm -hmm. You saw he, what happened to him after, he right? He killed himself. No, he didn't kill himself. He went through all kinds of depression and stuff yeah. like that. And then at the end, he turned his life over to Jesus. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nah, nah. Come yeah. on, What am I going to do? I don't know what to do. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's like, I get it. You know what I mean? The warrior in me, I, I got to pick my battles. Mm -hmm. And I have to make sure that I'm expending necessary energy because what I'm realizing is is that everything that I've done has opened up the door for a whole new path to the future that I didn't see before. I got to be ready for this because shit is changing in the world. It's changing fast. I got to make sure that I'm capable of keeping up with it. Well, I feel like you you already live in the future because all the shit you said in the last interview, it came to pass like... <laughs> So, so, predict, so, now, so now you got to predict the future. Now you got to predict the next next year, two years ahead. Come on. Because they do have a Miss Cleo doc coming out, by the way. <laughs> so they, really? Yes, they do. It's coming out. They uh, I did think next one week. with the um, Spanish, the Puerto Rican guy, the Mucho Mucho. Yes. They did one on him. Guess what? His business manager fucked him. You know what I mean? <laughs> People want to know what happened to Mucho Mucho and more. His business manager fucked him over. His name might be Sean G too, except for he's fucking Puerto Rican. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's wild. I mean, I don't, I would like to say that I'm a person that pays attention to current. And the truth is, you can dictate how to navigate your boat if you know how to read the waves, Amen. if you know how to read the current. So I think that's what I am. I'm, I'm someone who reads the current. And I'm able to say, that shit's about to get choppy up there. Mm. You know, if you don't know how to read the current, if you don't know how to read the waves, then you might not see that storm coming like I do. But I will say this. I think everybody's going to be very, 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 very surprised at how the Kanye saga really unfolds. That I will say. Mm -hmm. And remember what I said earlier about that other person that y'all are going to be talking to? Be easy. Yeah. Be gentle. Yeah. Hey, man, uh... Kanye is about to change. I'm sorry, let me take that back. Yay is about to change the world. And I feel it. I feel it. I can't really say which way it's going, but when he has his big, ah, I told you motherfuckers, when that moment comes, it's not gonna be anything that anybody expected. I've been studying him for a few years, and I'm glad that I did because it really gave me a different outlook on all of this. You know, I mean, the truth is, is I have a dog in this fight. I have a dog in the same fight he has. Artist equality, fairness amongst the sexes, abuse, being against abuse in the industry, making it a cruelty-free environment. If animals can have cruelty-free, why the fuck can't artists? Amen. Man, I'm that, just saying. As always, you have brought us to a point of elevation where we are. I am enamored. Uh, <laughs> we all do. You know. Uh, I, I gotta be careful because you know people might say I'm smoking crack. <laughs> <laughs> they can. Yeah. They can say that because anybody who knows me knows that I've never done it. More importantly, can you imagine what the fuck I would be like if I smoked crack? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and your camera would be missing. And your camera would be missing by the end of the interview. <laughs> Man, I lived in a crack house selling crack. There's no way I'd ever smoke that shit. 
gotta see it. It's a good deterrent. It's a good deterrent. Eight block. Listen to me. Eight eight bolt locks on the door and a sawed off. With the with the crackheads. Bookie, is it Christmas? <laughs> Bookie! Ah! It's Christmas. That means, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the product. And then you hear them sitting there scratching on the door and pacing back and forth, waiting for us to open up the store. Yeah, it was a real great idea to live in the drug house. Oh. I think we watched fucking New Jack City too many times. Oh. <laughs> Honestly. Yo, I'm just saying, you gonna serve me? Nigga, what? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just, you know. That's real. <laughs> ah, that's that's real. Like, <laughs> no, them niggas would go from, yeah, because I'm all, ah! <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my Jesus. Oh, motherfucker talking like he ain't got no teeth in his mouth. Mouth full of teeth. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yo, when it gets to the point where you can start understanding crack talk, you know you've been working too long. Like, you know you've been working too long when you can understand the motherfuckers. Like, it's, that's a whole nother world. And I can't even, I couldn't even imagine selling drugs in Philly right now. Like, I couldn't even imagine it because that shit is zombie land up there. Like these people, they won't be held respon they won't be held responsible for doing the shit that they'll do, you know, as a reaction. Like it's crazy. it's just crazy. My hometown is crazy, man. Like every time I call back, somebody that I know, somebody that I love is dead. They just shot my friend in the back of the head a few months ago, Charlie Kahn. And then I got two friends from the rap game in Philly who was going back and forth at it. Now people are trying to finger people for the murder. And the dude that killed him is somebody we all know. 51 years old, coming out of a Chris and Neef show, getting shot in the back of the head. And nobody knows why. Which means somebody knows something. Yeah, it. So we're planning um, a memorial concert for him. Me and him had the same birthday, May 17th. Oh, wow. I've known Charlie a long time. But you know, that's the the ebb and flow. Have you gotten numb to it at all? Rest in peace, Charlie Khan. My friend. Yeah, RP, definitely. Um do you have any shout outs? Yeah. Shout out to real life street style. Woo woo! For Let's being go. rogue, for being brave, even when it looked a little shaky and a little scary. <laughs> but whether you guys know it or not, I have to give the biggest shout out to you because y'all, y'all were the current that turned over my energy that started everything that I'm about to do from this point forward. Amen. Like I'm ever, I'm forever gonna be attached. Not forever. To y'all in that way because it was this interview that's making everything else that I do from this point pop, like even down to Philadelphia TV Network. This era for me, like I got two eras in life now. I got the Roots and the Jay-Z shit and the Cold Call commercial shit and then I got everything that happened to me after Real Life Street Stars. Like that's a bookmark in my life and there's a whole fucking lot of it. And, and you guys, whatever it was, we had that moment. And let's just be honest, we put the battery in the fucking internet's back. Nah. Together. Effects. Together. You know, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next. Hey, hey we're not. We're going to have you regular. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> You know, you know, um, the power that you wield, I, I, I appreciate it because, you know, as a black woman, y'all are so, uh, Trevor Noah said it today. He said, I just want to thank black women hmm. because for what they have imputed in my life. You said there was always a black woman that gave me strength. For you to come on here, this, and you made us stronger in a way we couldn't have imagined. You, you put us in places 
in people in faces of people like who thought we were weenie and you was like, nah, this is the caliber of individual that comes and sits in front of these lights. And so you have forever changed us. I was very we proud our... of the Mark Cuban interview, by the way. Oh, Google. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Shout out, Rook. Fuck with that shit. Yeah. Hey, and, and you know, us being here, like I said, we had our mamas calling us, our aunties, kind of like we had them watching it. So it actually expanded our audience as far as the demographics that watch our platform and man. And vice Maybe. versa. Maybe. What? We I, did that for each other. Now you said you're proud of Mark Cuban. Um, are you proud of the Charleston Whites? Interviews that we've done. Only reason I asked it because, because, hey, because when what you did on our platform, it seems like Charles White, a year later, a year or two later, came right back around and just figured out this Jaguar formula for some reason. Just be not it's apologetic. It's working for him. Yeah, it's working. He'd be fucking dangerous if he actually knew some shit. <laughs> now, I said if, if he had your in industry knowledge Yeah Like if he knew some shit He'd be fucking dangerous as fuck Shit You know what would be interesting Me and him having a conversation Ooh okay hey, Right Hey you just that spoke it into goddamn existence That's Hey that's that Hey Cause people keep coming to me they, they, What do you think about Charleston White What do you think about Charleston White I was like I don't know him <laughs> we, we gonna get y'all very acquainted And then I find out that y'all were the catalyst behind that. And then I'm like, oh, I'm so proud. I know, right, right. <laughs> like, Just, I'm like, that, <laughs> did a, another one, another one. <laughs> another one. Now, I have to ask before we get out, because I don't sure. want to forget it. Your earrings just reminded me of black power, mm -hmm. black excellence. And uh, I just need your take on it, because Emancipation comes out in one hour. Uh, it came out December 9th, which is today's the 9th, That's right? That's such a fucking below-the-belt so, fucking question. No, but I just got... It's no. the only below-the-belt question that you asked yeah, because it, you already know <laughs> what's going to happen. Don't front. We've, so, we've been down there. Fuck Will Smith. No, no, wait, 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 wait. He can kiss my ass. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait, wait. He should have never slapped Chris. Wait, wait, I'm not wait, wait, watching wait. the movie. Damn it, damn it. It's not happening. You don't understand. Do you understand why he slapped Chris? Did you see in that moment from probably what he was dealing with what was he dealing with? Shit, I don't know. What the fuck was he dealing with? Something made him slap his no, brother. No, something man. didn't make him snap anything. He laughed at that badass joke that Chris <laughs> said, like every fucking body else. And then Jada looked at him, and it was like the Manchurian candidate. <laughs> the Manchurian, not the Manchurian, not the Manchurian. God damn it! Uh, no! <laughs> That's what the fuck happened. I thought there's a legion of women who said, I'm glad for Will fighting for his woman. Yeah, because they still want to believe that that sham of a fucking marriage is real. Oh. Well, there you go. <laughs> he ain't never going to be Tupac, and she proved it when she fucked August Alcina. Ooh. Ooh, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They're both bisexual. They do weird things in their house, and young men have left their house fucking screaming to get away from them and their mentorship. Meek Mills. <laughs> Bashir Gray. <laughs> Left that house fucking screaming. August the only one that stayed and I guess he was really sick. He needed the help. Hey man, hey man. And that was they kid's friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. the fuck can believe that that shit is real by any means with all of that? It makes it tough to believe. With all of that. Yeah. When they was busy fucking partying with the Martins, then they switched over from the Martins to uh, uh, Mark Anthony and Jennifer Lopez, and then the fucking kiss happened on Hawthorne, her show got canceled, Mark and Jennifer broke up, all of this shit was going on, like all of these motherfuckers be doing all of this wild shit. <sighs> They ain't doing as much, I guess, now because they're getting older. I guess it just moved over to the Wade house. <laughs> energy transfers. Energy and transfers. And I'm not saying that because I'm not saying that because of their trans daughter. I'm saying that because of the artist that I just spoke to not that long ago that got invited to a party at their house. Everything was cool up front till they went to the back and there was a bunch of old fucking niggas and fucking young boys back there all ass naked in the Wade house. So I find it funny that Gabrielle's sitting there talking shit about Boosie. Maybe you suspicious of him because of the shit that's happening in your house, bitch. Fuck out of here. These niggas be talking greasy on all kinds of shit. 
But I don't like when these so-called black Hollywood couples want to come in and then they want to sit there and play gatekeeper. Meanwhile, they're abusing and misusing all kinds of young people. Mm. And guess what? Don't nobody want to admit that they are victim. So they pretend to be friends. Ah, uh, yeah. Will Smith ain't slapped that nigga over love. He slapped that nigga because that bitch told him to. Mm. What are eyes? <laughs> or maybe, because she's looking a little hocus pocus these days too. Is it alopecia? Or was it like, you know, entrance into the club? I don't know. Mm. But shit don't look right. You fucking see Tiger Woods and the next thing you know, he damn near die in a fucking car accident. I don't fucking know. Mm. I know she gangster as fuck. <laughs> I know she from Baltimore. And I know there's no shame in that region. I know that for a fact. Mm. So, you know... Uh, the movie Emancipation, um, how the fuck you gonna play in a movie called Emancipation and you can't emancipate yourself? Ooh, bars. Cause you trapped in a hole. My nigga, you trapped in a hole. This bitch clowning you day after day after day after day. And, and, and once again, I hate saying these things because their children are dope. But Jaden's kind of MIA. And considering that he emancipated, from their household at 16 and refuse to come back even to do family interviews. That's you know? Yeah. Willow's just kind of, she's dope. I just, too much shit happened in that fucking house. Too much shit happened in that fucking house. And meanwhile, I go to jail for defending my child and these niggas don't even get a CPS fucking visit for the kind of shit they, they kids see. You know? There you go. So yeah, I'll watch the movie when, you know, I'll watch Emancipation when he emancipates himself from the, uh, the hell that he lives in that he tries to call marriage with that woman who still wish Tupac was alive. <laughs> but enjoy the film, buy lots of popcorn. <laughs> I ain't supporting shitty fucking though. He's a bad representation for black men. He is literally the epitome of a ballless man. I'm sick and tired of people making our black men look weak. I'm sick and tired of that shit because I don't know no nigga that would put up with the shit that that bitch done put him through. Now you could justify staying because you ain't wanna cut up the money because she would've got the child support and the alimony, but the kids is grown. So if you stay now, it's either because you're being blackmailed to stay or you too lazy to go. He housebroken. That don't fit right for a Philly nigga. But he did grow up in Overbrook, though. <laughs> he didn't technically grow up in West Philly. That, that, was, that was Jazzy Jeff's life he was writing about. He lived over there, not far from where Kobe Bryant grew up. That's the other side of City Avenue. He, he came up Overbrook. You know, so they, were, they had big houses and he wasn't at the playground get beat up. That was Jazzy Jeff. He lived in the more suburb side off of City Avenue. He only, he went to Overbrook, you know, he went to the hood and then came home. I took my husband to where he used to go get his cheesesteaks at Larry's, which was right there by the train station around the corner from the nice houses. He's been playing roles for a long time but I'm sick and tired of seeing these so-called couples destroying young people, destroying young people. And look at August Alcina, like it's, he's so fucked off. I don't think that boy is his boyfriend. I think it's his bodyguard because his first show back in Miami, he gets beat up by Tory Lanez and his motherfucking um, a bodyguard. And the nigga just got out the hospital. Like he, like these, this, these is little niggas. These is little niggas. Like, it, it's almost like Will Smith called up Tory Lanez, oh, fuck that nigga up for me. You know what I'm saying? Your first show back and you, get, you gotta go back to the hospital. <laughs> like, all because you got taken advantage of by that bitch. 
Because they said it all started with Tory Lanez joking with him about the whole entanglement. That shit wasn't no entanglement, bitch. You fucking kid. You fucked a kid and cheated on your husband. Like, let's stop dressing this shit up and making it seem like it's anything. If, if Jada did any of the fucking shit to Will, would, you, would your wife, would y'all women, would you stand for that? Listen to me. Listen to me. He needs my help. <laughs> like, like, are you fucking kidding me? I wanted to help him. He was so sick and he needed my help. And you just figured you was going to ride his dick until he got better. Huh? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> If I was a 16-year-old kid and I had the opportunity to emancipate myself, I wouldn't stick around to watch my mom fuck my friends. I wish the fuck my mom would have. I'm sorry. No, I, did, uh... Y'all know I get, I get passionate. <laughs> Y'all so, clapping. Is there any other movie you want to talk about? Y'all clapping. <laughs> right. 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 Man, we got a side show for next time. Jesus. Jaguar, we love you so much. Thank you for coming to sit down and talk with us. It was a real treat. I feel I'm high off this. I don't know. We finna kill him with this one. This is my first time. <laughs> we all going we, we gonna to go off the grid after this for a little bit. <laughs> Hey. Listen to me. I'm back outside now. Yeah. Fuck it. Fuck it's it. gonna be what it's. I'm back outside. Hey, man. Hey, this is the best part. You are a real life street star. Shout out real life street stars, nigga. Hey. All right, here we go. We're in Real Life Studios, man. That Jaguar out day one. And first and foremost, uh, how's your spirits? Oh, I'm fucking awesome. What, what did they feed you in there? We had um, eggs and rice. Eggs and rice. And we had, um, uh, you know, um, meatloaf surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The surprise was it was almost meatloaf. We <laughs> so, had curry chicken breast. Oh, wow. That's a week and a half old, my nigga. Oh, wow. And then there's this one that was up in here. And that one. And these just started to leave after 10 days. Oh, wow. And then um, I got these scratches. Oh, wow. And then, and then there's this. You see the scar? Yes. From where the scab Jeez. is starting to heal. Jeez. And they wouldn't let me um document it. And I got a few more, but they wouldn't let me document any of my bruises. So question, have you did you see any of the footage? That, I haven't that, seen anything yet. Okay, okay. Did anyone recognize you upon getting out yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody they recognized me in the hospital. Damn. They all everybody called me Jaguar. Damn. But do they know, what the, like, are they actively knowing no, what's they, going they, on? No, no, they were online. They were showing me videos. Oh, shit. Like, I oh, was this finding is... out stuff that was happening from what my nurse... So wait. From what people Pe inside the facilities that I was in <laughs> accidentally <laughs> showed me because they was watching. And I said, that sounds like me. Mm. And then he was, Jaguar, Jaguar, keep telling the truth. Keep telling the truth and all of that. So do you plan on catching up on all the content? For the oh, past absolutely. nine days. Yeah, I know it's name of time right now, but one of the new um episodes for keeping it a being is gonna be life on the inside of a mental institution. Oh, we need that. And I'm gonna have two of the girls that was in there with me to come and express and share the stories that we all felt in common. And and, and Tokyo Tony wasn't interviewing no nurse. It was one of the patients, and I'm inviting her to come yeah, so she, she can tell her side. Her name is Shantanavia. She's from the Brooklyn, but she lives here in Oak Cliff. Was it, is it co-ed there? Is it co-ed? Well, no. So we have no girls' men. units and guys' units. Is, I was on a stable unit okay. for women. That's unit two. The stable unit for men is number one. And now the unstable unit is number four for the women, and the unstable unit for the men is number three. That's it. And so the number four, that's where Shitla went. Ah, damn. Shitler, she left uh, number Shitler, two. Shitler, as in 
Yeah, yeah. The, the shit Nazi. Yeah, the shit Nazi. And I was Nazi. forced to live with yeah. the But we'll talk about we'll it. We'll talk about it. That's good. That's good. Because Jaguar's I want home. other people to corroborate Shitler, the existence of, of <laughs> Kyle Shitler. All right, all right. We, hey, we're filming podcast number one, as you can see. Hey, you can see who's here. We got hey, it's a studio segment. And uh, we're King about to get Payne to is showing up. King and Payne Night and showing. Day is showing up. Shout and God knows day. who else is showing up. My, my, my. My, my, We got to send those links. Honey, call yeah. so they not winning this shit. I said, will somebody please go get the white boy? Because the half nigga ain't cutting it. You go get the white boy. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Cooper Rush. Wait a minute. You were, able to, you were able to watch the game? Oh, yeah. Nigga, I was in the hospital. You I know mean, yeah, I know. I'm sure everybody's watching the game, but yeah, we was watching the game. We had um, Coca Cola, okay, and now ladies and um, popcorn with hot sauce. You know, it's funny because your Coca Cola commercial has trended more now than ever. It's Ain't just, that crazy? Yeah, it's like oh, and, that, and that's what the fucking Burrell agency <laughs> owes me another check, bitches. <laughs> I'm re right. Coca Cola still out. <laughs> Coca Cola still around. The product still around. So if your sales go up all of a sudden. <laughs> 21 years ago, I, I fucking filmed that shit and it's trending again. And it's again. trending again, just like that. <laughs> oh, what about the city girls? You know, they, ooh, well, they know that city girls tell you how to get the money. Yeah, they do. They're like, listen, uh, you know, y'all be giving away for free, y'all. Yeah, they can keep it. <laughs> right, right, y'all. They giving all this advice about how to get money, but they can't tell you how to keep it because they haven't learned. I'm telling you. I remember I used, to, I used to know a girl who used to dance for like seven years and she never owned her own car. Yeah. Stayed in the, I'm like, how much money have you made? Probably always renting cars. Yeah, I'm like, what is, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I never miss my supplements. So bad in my life. Oh, by the way, the lipstick that I'm wearing tonight is by my girl Imani Rose in Houston. It's called Sex Face. Yeah. It's headphone time. What's a big L? Ooh, 50 years. 50 years to that. 50 years of hip-hop. 50 years of hip-hop. Let me, let me get cool. All right, now I just need volume. I need volume. Oh. I want to get where y'all at. I'll let you know. Still nothing. Still nothing. We getting it. We getting it. We getting it. We getting it. We, getting it. <laughs> we live on Dallas Delphi, right? Here. Oh, wow. Honey. Hey. Gerald, are we live on Dallas Delphi? What's going on, Dallas Delphi? It's your girl, Jaguar Wright. Now I hear it. Hey! Hey, 50 years of hip hop, baby. We're going to get the records right this year. Wait a second. Wait a second. Toad, you got a whole new fan base, Ma. They love you at the hospital. Okay, hold on a second. Can anybody? They can't hear me.
So Jaguar, uh, your, your, your initial, your, your episode home, how was that as far as just getting right back to business? Oh, bro, it felt good to be back to work. Out at 3.30, by nine, back you, clock, you clock back in. That's felt the beauty. great. So yeah, definitely tomorrow, take some time to yourself. Self meditate. You got work to self do. I know we got work. I'll take an hour. Or take two. an hour. I'll take an hour or two, but considering that I got to be in Chicago Wednesday afternoon to meet with the chairman of the board, Fred Hampton Jr. from the Black Panther Party, I only got a little bit of time. There you go. And then I got to go pick up Spider Loke. There you go. Let's get it. Let's get it. Real life street stars, let's clap it up real quick. Let's clap it up. We got we got hip hop royalty once again, and we got it's a combination now, man. It's crazy because um we just and I would say y'all just took us in the world through a roller coaster to where people are so invested about what's the outcome, what's going on, what's happening, and uh here y'all are together. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that a lot of people are rooting for. And some were rooting against, and <laughs> you got to deal with both. And we're here to dealing with that from day one. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Yep. laughs> First Facts. time I met his mama, she gave me a weird look. Second time I met his mama, she told me it was okay for me to admit that I made a mistake. That's real. No, that's real. <laughs> <laughs> Coming after the weird look. That's real. Yeah. It's, okay, it's okay for you to admit that you made a mistake. You y'all can get it annulled. <laughs> and I looked at, and I looked into the phone and I said to her, Don't don't you ever tell me that I don't love my husband. Mm, because damn. I do. I said, I don't want your marriage, Charlotte. I don't want Sunday's marriage. I don't want Charles' marriage. I just want my marriage with my husband. There you go. I'm mm. too old to be trying to pretend like I want to be your daughter-in-law because you're younger than my sister. Mm. So you can never be more than like a big sister to me. So let's not pretend let, we're women. I love your son. Was it because you were older? Um, I mean, I think was... it was because I was older. I think it was because I was a Yankee. I think it was because um, <laughs> I speak my mind. I think it was because I'm the shit and she basic. No disrespect, but it's true. Yeah. I just, I Jack. feel... I felt I felt the jealousy coming off of her, and she and I, and I see. I told him from day one, your mama not gonna like me. No, Jack. I, I, I told him that. Did I not tell you that? You must. You, I said your mama not gonna like me because the first thing she gonna do, she gonna look at me, she gonna look at you, and she gonna be like that bitch is fucking the shit out of my son. <laughs> it's, it's just it's just the way. Hey, and that's what happens. Like, hey, listen, it is. I, 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 I want some influence still. <laughs> Don't take me all the way away from me. Yeah, man. Oh, no, and Jag, you again, we're from Texas, you know, we got the whole Southern hospitality yeah. thing, and you bring this Philly, this this demeanor to where even like Charleston White was a little taken back, mm -hmm. and you had to tell him straight up, I'm straightforward. I don't got no, I'm telling you what it is, like it or not, this is what I it is. Got, listen to me, I grew up fucking with a New York minute and a Philadelphia second. <laughs> yeah, that's a fucking Philly second. <laughs> I, I you know, people talk about New York. People say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Yeah. If you can survive Philly, you can fucking survive anything. Man. And that's what's real. That's fact. Man. That's what's real. Well, I know I love it because again, it's the truth and what mm -hmm. people love. And we we lose, we're losing that where people try to pull up, put up facades. I don't know what happened to all my real niggas in Philly. Like, I'm so disappointed right now. Man, man, that's a whole nother, no, that, no, that's a whole no. nother story. No, <laughs> where, so where, where the real niggas in Philly go? <laughs> right. So, Jack, I have to ask you, were you able to watch uh, uh, G's? I've been Goombas? watching. Yeah, you've been, you've been watching his interviews. <laughs> He was able to sit and tell you, uh, today we, we released part three and- um, mm -hmm. I started watching it. Yes. We were at Cafe Pacific and we had the guys at the bar, the tuxedo guys, you got their card, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, by the Get way, the all of you are getting tuxes. We, we met these great it's guys, crazy. they fit tuxes, fucking awesome. And we said we need to take a real life picture with tuxes on. Yes, no, no, no. We, <laughs> Look, we literally just, no, we're talking we about that. I got the spot, I got the spot. Okay, yeah. okay. we'll give Highland them a shout out and everything. Yeah, we'll yeah, make yeah. it make sense. They're off oh, Highland yeah. Park Village, they can't wait to meet the whole team. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, that's that, that kind of falls right into play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, J Goomba came through and told us some things that even I didn't know, and I'm so enamored by it, and I want your take on it. Yeah. Wait, y'all got, 
introduced and then married after just less than a month. Twenty one days. Twenty one days. Mm-hmm. He told his side. We, you know, go watch Google Part Three. He told I his saw, side. I, I was watching. What? He wasn't lying. He, he was accurate about everything. Yeah. What is your thought process when you meet a man and twenty one days later you're married? Like what? What was it? What was going on in your life? Because he he mentioned, of course, with your son. I was Giovanni. ready to die. Yeah, that's what he. That's what he said. So it didn't feel right living when my son was dead and my other son was gone and the holidays was coming and I just figured, you know, fuck it, I'll just skip it. Wow. And um, so when he challenged me, because I didn't want to get married. Right, he said that. He wanted to get married. He said it. And I said, well, can't we just kick it for like six months and see how it goes? Mm -hmm. I'm not going nowhere. And he was like, well, if you're not going nowhere, then why can't you marry me? And I'm like. It was very play, by the way. Very. I'm like, well, then fuck it. Then let's get married. So we got up one Sunday morning. I was like, we fucking doing it today or what? And he was like, yeah. (laughs) And so we found a justice of the peace in Garland. And she had a very old, old cat, and we're both allergic. <laughs> Talk about so both we our nostrils. Crying, <laughs> crying during the ceremony. <laughs> you know, y'all were happy. It was what? Because of us, it was the allergy. The allergy. Cat was killing us. Couldn't breathe. I love you, baby. I love you too. And I'm like, can we hurry up and get the fuck out of here? Yes. This cat yes. is killing me. And she was taking so oh, long Lord. to do the tutorial yes, 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 yes. about what it was going to take. I'm like, okay, bitch, please, your cat is killing us. Like, ah. we had to run outside. <laughs> she thought we was emotional. We was trying to get fresh air because the cat probably hadn't been cleaned in 10 years. Yeah, like, we're done. We're done. Then we got through it. So I'm glad y'all got yeah, through it. Yeah. And then we went down. And we um I sang at piano. No, we ate it brain dead well, first. Well, we, we ate it brain dead first mm-hmm. with uh, with Terry yep. and his wife Leslie, mm-hmm. the old food critic mm-hmm. from Dallas, mm-hmm. and Terry. Yeah. And um they they took us out for our first meal yep. at mm-hmm. Brain Dead, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we got dinner very fast. And that sure fried chicken came yo. out. I ain't never had fried chicken fast. come out that fast ever in my life, bro. If you want to get great food, find be you a food friends critic. with a food critic. I'm telling you. You'll see the picture if you look at January 6th. I posted it and it was my girlfriend, Leslie, who had just stopped being the food critic for Dallas and the new food critic who was her friend coming in. So we had our our wedding dinner with two food critics and um, a a jazz uh, journalist. Mm -hmm. He actually got the last, um, Terry actually got the last last interview out of Miles Davis before he died. Oh, wow. Yep. So Even that's who we spent our um, wedding night mm-hmm. with. Listen and then the guys from Tom Ford, Ford oh, yeah. came to the show. Damn. Yep, did. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, at piano. Mm-hmm. And I sang to him for our wedding mm-hmm. night. Did you, did you know, did you divulge any, because you have a, a very, let's say, colored past. Mm-hmm. Did you divulge any of that early on? How much did you give him early on? I gave him what I thought he could handle when he could <laughs> handle it. So slowly you kept... Dropping yeah. nuggets. Yeah, nuggets. But they weren't nuggets, they were boulders. <laughs> <laughs> boulders. I, I feel like Wally Coyote. Oh, shit. I mean, yeah, were, were, yeah, yeah, G, were you more amazed of, uh, like, or scared, or like, like what was like that she's giving you, like, here's my history? Nigga, I was telling you the truth, nigga, I was scared. The funny <laughs> thing because- is, I didn't give him my history. I showed him my history. Right. Yeah, y'all said y'all went, y'all mm-hmm. stepped in the streets. I don't mm-hmm. tell him nothing that I can't produce physically. In person. That's real. Because there's no point. That's real. Like, I could sit there and tell him that I know Italians. Mm. But it's a different thing for me to take you to their house and for them to make linguine and clams (laughs) with mattresses up at the windows because shit's looking a little funny. No, that's a different. Versus I know Italians. Yeah. That is different. So... (laughs) Let's let's just unpack it like this because I love you, Angelo Minerci. Shout out, Ange. Shout out, Ange. Um, I love you. How we as we as we as Goomba his story. How would you describe y'all's four years? Um, it's the been goods, the bads. It's been interesting. Yeah. You know, we decided to get married without knowing each other, and we agreed that we would spend the first five years of our marriage getting to know each other um, 
And then after that, if it didn't work, we would go our separate ways. But I promised him because of what my life is like, that he will forever be taken care of. Like I'm redoing my, my will right now. And yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, we got That's married amazing. without a prenup. Would so you? um, my husband is my soul. Everything. He inherits whatever I have. And there's a special codicil for he, him and my son. Because if anything should happen to me, the company goes to my husband and my son. But my husband has to, he's going to be the receiver for it to, just to make sure that my son doesn't get manipulated right. by my first husband because he can't get another fucking dime off of me ever again. There you go. Um, that makes sense. But, yeah. So I have to ask you then, um, and I want you to verify this because I saw a lot of people were coming at you, Goomba, in the comments of episode two about the dog situation. Yeah, I it watched, was awful. It yeah, was fucking awful. Yeah, and you know, again, we talked about you know having you know being on medication and kind of going through what you went through. We we saw, we heard your past, mm -hmm. and for those that thought it was something, <laughs> again, you explained it eloquently as far right. as what you've been through and what you have to deal with coming out of that. And y'all, right. you know, with the VFW and Can everything. Can we fucking you, be honest about last night? Yeah, let's be honest about last night. Let's be honest about last night. You go first. Hmm. You go first. <laughs> I did not sleep at home last night. No, you didn't. I slept at my cousin Tawana house last night. <clears throat> yeah, you did. To which you accused me of going over to my cousin Tawana house to have a threesome with her and her boyfriend who I never fucking met. As if I would fuck my own cousin. Mm. I'm not a clump. So, G, where does that come from? As far as just, you know. Sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation. No, and okay, I, I would love to go through the, just what y'all been through. Because again, Jack. No, no, no. No, no, no. Let's, let's start with that. Hold up. The airport situation, because we haven't... Hold up. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Hold up. No, I... welcome, to, welcome to my motherfucking world. Right, because I want you to explain the airport situation for those who have not seen it. I know you explain it on your own channel, but... It's ridiculous. You just broke my fucking car. Stop, Gerald. Stop, Gerald. Stop, Gerald. Stop. 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 Look at... Hurry up. Hurry up. Ooh. You fucked up. See this bullshit? Ooh. Now you fucking hit me. I grabbed for the phone. No, you just hit me I in my fucking lip. Jackie. You just hit me in my fucking lip. Jackie. I'm so tired of your shit. I'm tired of your fucking shit. I can't get no fucking sleep. Period. No, no. I want you. I want you out of my fucking car. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie to you. Let me tell you how normal that is. <laughs> let me tell you how normal that is. Cause, cause, let me tell you how normal that is. Of, uh, Cause I, I mean, I don't want to tell y'all. <laughs> yeah, right. But, 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 He's like, I ain't in front of the camera. Yeah, I, was saying, I, mean, I, mean, I tell you how normal that is. But that was in the drive-through at Fuel City in Cedar Hill. Oh, that shit happened in front of people. So, Guess what happened earlier that day? We got thrown out of a fucking casino hotel. Why? Cause of this motherfucker. Ask me how many places I've been thrown out of because my husband's meds was fucking misfiring, or he just didn't take them. No, so let, let's 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 back it up just a little bit. You were you went to There's not enough in this cup. Yeah, right. We, we're gonna get a re, we're gonna get a refill. We're gonna we're about, we're about please, to get a refill real quick. Please, uh, about to get a, a refill. Please. So from what people saw, and, and I don't I don't want to touch on uh, we we can touch on it, but let's skip that as far as the getting released from. Uh, the, the, the institution. From the hospital. From the hospital. Yeah, um, the, the hospital's wonderful. Dallas Behavioral Health Hospital in DeSoto Tech. Fabulous. There you Ask go. for the Jaguar right treatment. It's amazing. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you get out and you're strict, you're, you're right to business. Uh, yeah. You get, you come do an episode of Dalladelphia TV Network .com. Yeah. You do an episode of, of your podcast, Keeping It a Bean. Yeah. And the very next morning, you I fly out to Chicago. Like, I'm flying out to Chicago to go I handle the business. I didn't tell nobody I was going. Right. Because I needed to go and meet with the Panthers. Right. Because I have officially accepted my responsibility. No, but you did tell somebody that you were going because you said that right as soon as we pulled up to the airport, which I was upset about. So somebody did. You went live and said, oh, I'm on my way to Chicago. Yeah, and they didn't stop me because ain't nobody know I was coming. Yeah, kind of too. Uh, uh, past it was the point of no return. last minute. Past the point of no return. And you don't think folks got... 
uh, 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 yeah, it's the coming home. It's the, notification, right? It's, it's the, the still. It's the coming home still. that gets the right. She, Jaguars in Chicago, right? They, they, know, they know that. that. They husband, know that. My husband and she got to leave some kind of way. I went by myself, and that's y'all don't do that normally. No, normally, normally, normally y'all are together. We're always together, moving. But you went by yourself. He stayed this time. Yes. He stayed in Dallas, and um, I you, needed to see for myself if I could still move around. We already knew and, you came uh, Shout out show. Fat Kid. Um, shout out to Fat Kid. Uh, Fat you know, you got you got to Chicago. You got to get some business. Um, you got to get some business going. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, you, you had you handled the business. I mean, you got you got right That's to it. That's what I do. Yeah, you got right to it. Um, and then you're set to come back. I mean, yeah. I'm talking about you're about to come back and get to more business in Dallas. I mean, immediately yeah. right when you get back, kind of go right back it, and then get ready for Vegas. Right, but it doesn't. I'm missing Lou now. Show today because of you. You fucked. <laughs> You fucking piece of shit, Sean Carter, and you fucking honeycomb, your fucking little dog. Fuck you all. So at what point did you feel the returning home was going left? Like the flight home was one o'clock. The morning, the, morning, when the I first got flight. There the first two flight. Hours early. You said that. And my flight was canceled, even though my flight took off, but it was canceled for me. And you met a fan. Yeah. While you were there early. Like, I'm gonna come early. Did a whole life. And people kept coming up asking for selfies, and I'm like, oh fuck, I'm I'm fucked in the streets. <laughs> I can't move around no more. You know, I've I've been able to be a celebrity and have my anonymity. Yes. And I've been very spoiled by that because of the way I set my life up. Yes. Um, so when you let people know who you are, if you want to let them know. Yeah, yeah. I've had That's changing. I've, you no, know, it's it, 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 fuck changing, it's demolished. Like everywhere <laughs> the fuck I go, we fucking in normal fucking Illinois. Normal Illinois. Nobody normal even knows that it fucking Illinois. exists. And we're getting spotted in normal. Yeah. And we're anything but. I pull up I pull up on you at Love Field. And sure enough, guy, I know you are. <laughs> we can't go anywhere. <laughs> so you feel like it's going wrong. The You're supposed to be on a flight at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And it's delayed. I'm supposed to be home at 1. Okay. I spoke, my flight was supposed to take off at 10.30. Mm -hmm. And I got there to the airport at 8. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was early, and then they changed the gate, and then they changed the this. And Miss Wright, we have to take you here for your safety because the fans are fucking with you. And did this. and then the next thing you know, my flight is canceled, and I gotta fly to Denver, and it's gonna take me a day to get back to Dallas. So I'm like, I might as well just buy another um fucking one way ticket, get wow. a direct flight. So my nephew gets his travel agent. I give her my information. She gets us the flight. I was gonna be here at seven. Mm -hmm. 7.09 to be exact was the flight. I get to the airport. I had carry-ons. So I didn't need to get there early. I was already checked in by the travel agent, my nephew's travel agent. Everything was fine. I was okay. And then I get through security. And you know the scanner thing where you got to put your hands up and they yeah. do the thing? The dude looked at me and was like, mm -mm, you ain't got to do that. Walk around here. Mm. And I looked at him and I was like, thank you for that. Thank you for not letting them scan me. Mm. Now, I thought that part was interesting. So I walks around and I'm standing there waiting for my bags to come because I'm trying to get on my flight and get fucking home because we got to come here to the studio. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to bring y'all your big ass tea cup. Yeah, thank I'm you for that. You that's, you all, for that's all you can say. Baby, I got souvenirs for everybody. No, she like, said it. She said, come got, on. I'm bringing gifts. She said it's it. It's been the first time I bought souvenirs in almost a decade. Oh, oh my God. Bless it. That makes it even more. I <laughs> said, no, no, because I did so much traveling. And every time I would travel, people, bring me here. Bring me this. Bring me that. And I was like, you know what? Fuck y'all. No, and I'm going to get you to sign it. I know we have a sharp. I'm going to get you to sign that cup. One oh, absolutely. So, anyway, go ahead. So this was the first time I bought souvenirs for my family. Thank and y'all are a part of that. And I got so excited because I'm like, oh, my God, I have a reason to buy souvenirs again. <laughs> and going to the souvenir shop and I got myself some gloves and I'm so glad mm -hmm. that I did because who knew I was going to need them in a couple hours <laughs> right. sitting in that fucking freezing cold. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I was excited and I'm waiting for my bags to come. And then the next thing I know, when it came to my bag, they stopped, pulled it out. And then they put it back through. And I'm like, OK. Not normal at all. And then they stopped, and then they pulled it out, and then they put it back through. Third time, they bring it through. I say, is there some kind of issue with my bag? Because if so, we can just examine it. 
because I'm telling you, I packed it perfect and I need to get my flight. And they say, yeah, we got to run it again. We're training her, that old white bitch. Oh, wow. Yeah. They said, we're training her. And I said, well, don't you think this is an inopportune time? This is like the busiest time. It's like it's like rush hour traffic at the airport. I don't think this is the time for trainees. Can you please scan the bag and let's go and, you know, if you keep. No, we just got to run it again. I've never. So then they run it three more times. They had ran my bag actually seven times before I turned the cameras on. And the reason why I turned the camera on was because the bitch said to me when I said this is starting to get ridiculous. Y'all have scanned my bag damn near 10 fucking times. You have to physically check it. Please grab my things and let's check my bag so I can get my flight. They refuse to check my. No, we just got to send it back through. <laughs> Playing games. And seeing, I looked at it her seems and intentional. I, said, mm-hmm. I, looked, no, I looked at her and I said to the bitch, the one that was waving in the beginning of yes. the video after Paul Paul. Yeah. <laughs> the bitch looked at me and I said, it's almost as if you're trying to make me miss my flight because boarding is going to be closing in 10 minutes. I would like to catch my flight. I need to get home. I need to get to my medication. She said, well, crazy bitch, you should have thought about that before you decided to fly out of fucking Chicago because you're not going anywhere, ho. That's what that white bitch said to me. I lied to you, not off camera. And I said, that's it. Up come the fucking camera. And then everything, the seven and a half minutes that you saw after that, up until they said that they was going to take me to see the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see the doctor. I, yeah, we saw that. And I'll let the audience go watch that as they will. But Fucking Paul Paul and his fucking step and fetching ass. I'm trying to make sure these kids behind me. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. kids. You don't get no fuck about the kids, Papa. But you are famous, and I told you you was gonna be famous, Papa. You on thumbnails everywhere. So leading up to the, what you just showed us, um, Goomba actually leaves from Dallas to go ahead and make a trek to yeah. go get you. Um, yeah. He's like, let me just damn the plane, whatever, whatever that is. We were trying to meet in Little Rock, right? But we couldn't find a driver in time, right? So it's a full. So ride. instead, we just needed to get out yeah. of Chicago because I realized at that point in time that they had thrown a net over the city. Right. Because when I was walking out after the cameras went off the second time, and I said, it looks like I'm not leaving Chicago today. And one of the officers, the officer Morrow, his response was, thank goodness. <sighs> Man. I, and I turned around and I looked at him and I said, keeping me here is only guaranteeing that there's going to be more dead bodies in Chicago by nightfall. Mm-hmm. You just guarantee somebody's most likely going to die tonight. And he said, as long as you're here. Oh, yeah. So they walked me all the way to baggage claim. They walked behind me like I was enemy number one. Oh, yeah. No, there was. Uh, I'm sitting police. there walking through the. I'm sitting there walking through the airport. Ah, I'm a scary black lady. I come to kill you. Ah, look at all of this. I walked up with a little kid. I'm gonna kill you. I'm a black person. <laughs> wait, wait. So you're in the airport. Don't you feel like I'm doing a lot in the airport? Like, cause you get no fuck. Damn, you know. goddamn fucking um bus station with fucking flying apparatuses and shit. But you know, fuck, fuck. Federal America. gets involved. Fuck America. Fuck the feds. <laughs> I got a fed fucking file. Said what? I got a fed file. I've had a fed file since I was a teenager, and y'all motherfuckers know it. That's why y'all let somebody crack my shit open two and a half years ago. Ooh, whole another story. And I was a fucking victim, yo. Oh wow. Fuck you going through a victim's federal file for. Oh wow. After fucking what was done to me, after what happened to me in the trunk of that fucking car. Mm. The only motherfuckers that can get federal fucking documents to be opened and unsealed from fucking minors from goddamn over 20 years ago with people with political, heavy political ties. But, you know, Mr. Sean Carter is friends with Barack Obama. And Barack Obama is from Chicago. Don't start connecting dots like that. Barack Obama's from Shit. Chicago. How hard would it be for Barack Obama if his friend Sean Carter called and asked him to put somebody like me on a little fly list at every airport you know in what? Chicago. I, you know, you want to know what's fucked up? Where's my bag at? Oh. I'm going to tell you what's fucked up. 
All right, go go ahead. Where's go my go shit? I'm gonna tell you who's fucked up. Give us action. I'm gonna show you fucked up. I'm gonna show you how fucked up y'all motherfuckers are. I'm gonna show you how fucked up. I fucking voted for you bitches. Oh wow. I voted for you bitches. This is my motherfucking wallet. I call it my black girl magic wallet. You fucking assholes. Bring it back, bring it back real quick. You fucking assholes. This is how much I fucking, even fucking Clarence Avon didn't think they was going to fucking vote for you. But you gave his daughter a job in the administration and then you sat back and you let fucking Sean Carter and Sean Combs kill Jacqueline Avon. You got that on your hands, Barack Obama. That fucking monkey. You let that fucking wild monkey loose in fucking L.A., Barack Obama. Fuck your ties to fucking Sean Carter. He a piece of shit and he going fucking down, yo. You should have vetted him better than you did. You shouldn't listen to everything that Warren Buffett says. Hmm. Warren Buffett ain't God either. Hmm. But he do own fucking Jay-Z because I guarantee you most of that billion belongs to Warren Buffett because you've been buying up motherfucking... Goddamn fucking property all along the eastern seaboard. All the way down to D.C. You bought up damn near a third of Philadelphia. I know you ain't done that, Sean. That was fucking Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is the real estate. Mm. Not you. You just his hoe. Mm. Motherfuckers. Mm. You think I don't fucking know what you're doing? I know what you're doing. Come and get me. I'll be in the desert, bitch. Fuck the Obamas. Bought and paid for. Yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy. You got me in the hospital, didn't you? I'm on the medication, ain't I? You gave me a story. 72-hour hold and a doctor and a judge, and I'll be right back out. That means I get to fuck all y'all up for free. Do you feel like they're trying to silence you? Of course they're trying to silence me. That's why they sent shooters to 87th Street. Motherfucking Harold's Chicken to fucking try to shoot me down in the middle of the day. Children play in that fucking neighborhood. And nothing is coincidence. Uh, when you when you live in this kind of lifestyle and you say the things that you say, nothing Fuck y'all. can be considered coincidence. Fuck the Obamas. Fuck the Obamas. I fucking believed in y'all. I believed in y'all. You should have vetted Sean Carter better than you did. Stop believing everything Warren Buffett said. That's his pet nig. Mm. Come on, now you go, can't get go, that. Go back, go back. That's his pet nig. How do you? Sean ha- Carter ain't nothing but a pet nig. Go back, you have military. Put your watermelon in your <laughs> fucking 40 ounces, you fucking hoe. Go, go. You'll never be Lamont Coleman. No matter how hard you try. Oh, oh, oh. Fuck you! Ooh. You big lip fucking monkey. Okay. All that fucking dick and you still don't know how to fuck. That's why you keep your wife drugged. Yeah, I've been drinking. I've been drinking. Fuck your bitches. Ooh. Fuck the cars. Real rap. Come see me in the desert, ho. I got motherfucking steel for you. I got it for you. Fuck you. You think you gonna fuck with me? You thought you was fucking with me in Chicago? You weren't fucking with nobody in Chicago, yo? GD? GD! Mm. Mm. They own fucking Rick Ross ass too. Fuck you, Rose. You fucking folded over, bitch. You still paying the gangster disciples. I know because one of them's related to me. You still paying. You still paying, ho. God did. Fuck you too, Khaled. I'm going to tell you what God's about to do. He about to clean all y'all bitches up. And he sent me. I'm the messenger. My name is Jonah. He told me to go to Nineveh. All you fucking bitches is going for. Fuck y'all. You said you had a question for me, Joker? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been wanting to know this question for a long time. Yeah. I feel like you had an answer to this. Is the Illuminati real? Is that a real thing? I mean... You can give it the name you want to give it. I call it fucking pet niggas. I call it the pet nigger club. They all want to be gods, you know? They want to run the world. You've explained some things that go on behind the scenes that normal people probably shouldn't be privy to or should 
even see. You know the shit that hurt me the most recently? I was talking to to my girlfriend, Tokyo Tony. Shout out Tokyo Tony. And we was talking about Robin Thicke, and I felt so bad. Yeah, what happened to Robin Thicke? I didn't mean to put Robin out on Front Street. I like Robin. Yeah. I've known Robin a long time. You know, when I was younger and thinner. You know, Robin I pray for him a, and Paula Patton. You know, I want that fuck Paula Patton. Oh shit! I'm sorry. You know what? Oh, I, shit. I, I wanted it to work. Happened. It was going down the right path. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Wait, you know what I'm saying? wait a minute. Let me let me oh, retract. Wait. Let me retract. I think I need to get off the couch. Because like, Paula cause... Patton is a victim. Oh. She's a victim, and I, I'm sorry, Paula. Yeah, go ahead and green screen me out of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait. No, uh, let's let's do that. Boom. <laughs> From your military training, your background, this is your wife. Um, and when she goes on, you know, I don't want to call her a rat, but when she tells her truth. Mm-hmm. Um, what, call me a rat. I'm a rat. Come and get me. Come and get me, bitches. It, what, what? Rats go hard. <laughs> Rats can eat a whole fucking dog, yo. Mm. What do you do mentally to say, all right, I'm going to be in reaction mode because, again, she's, she's staring up the nest. And no one wants the nest to be stirred. I'm stirring up the nest. I'm kicking over it. I'm kicking that Oof. shit. I'm fucking Oof. like like now. Nah, I was no. Nah, I was talking to my friend today. I was talking to my friend Lux today, and Lux was like, "Jag, I just need you to be careful." Before I'm like, "Nigga, we passed before. We here. We are here. We here. We are here. I'm not preparing. It's fucking war, <laughs> nigga. This is Sparta, bitch. Oof. I'm kicking the fucking messenger in the pit." We fucking here. You know, fuck. I like it. All right, so let's do it like this then. <laughs> let's do it like this. Uh, the reason why y'all are even on this couch together is that, you know, Goomba himself has a story that people love to hear. Yeah. And um, yeah. let's touch on it. Uh, I really just want it. We don't got to go through everything. We've seen everything mm. and y'all spoke on your own platforms and we want them to send them to Dallas Deaf TV Network to make sure that they get the real story. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, what sure. a, that's what a real yeah, story yeah. is at. Um, but they do want to know, um, again, you already said it, but the status of Solar, the status of that situation. What about Solar? So, he y'all made talking to you. Y'all made oh. music. No, yeah. I'm sorry. No, Jesus. Y'all made well, music. Been talking yeah, and, and, and this, lately, you this, know. This, this for both of y'all because y'all made music and y'all actually have an episode that is that on Dallas Definitely Network. Fire as fuck. Which, yeah. Welcome to the circus is fire as fuck. Welcome to the circus. But I think I think there's another producer that's sitting in his room that could probably make that track even better, though. I think OD can make track that track even better. Possibly so. The like track, shit. Then why can't I'm about for it. Why can't Shout OD, out OD. Because it's the shit I heard earlier that, that he did for Big Homie Show. Yo, that shit is awesome. Why can't OD do you know the saying? remix? Do the remix. He can do the original and the remix. So it doesn't really Listen fucking matter. To me, but the original's already done. That boy is in Arizona drinking on them powder ass milk so, ass titties. Wait. OD sitting right Y'all here. I'm talking about that girl titties. You talking <laughs> about the girl's <laughs> paperwork. Wait, wait, so wait. what does it matter? Wait, so, so Jack, this is all I got to ask you. A lot of people felt that Solar was coming in and he was disrupting what you were about to become. Maybe he and was. Did you did you feel in any point in time that there was probably some intentions? I in didn't him? care. Oh, okay. Okay. God put a calling on my heart. Everything happens for a reason, without question. When we came back into touch through Genesis by Tim's widow. From yes. By Tim, God bless, God bless the dead. Definitely. Uh, thank you for that, Keith Murray. Definitely. Keith Murray. Who's doing amazing. You need to holler at me, yo. <laughs> right. We ain't seen each other in a long time. But ain't no whip wop galore over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ain't no whip wop. <laughs> Number one, I would have never tried to have sex with Keith Murray. Keith Murray's habits were a little bit too risky. I'm talking about the way he I don't, I don't think he, he, I, yeah, I don't think he applied pressure. I think he just said, yeah, I think he was more so, I'm trying to get my own. Yeah. I, got I, I got things I could say about Keith Murray that I'm not going to say, Keith. Yeah, let Keith tell us. Right, right, right. Why, Keith? I'm sure he'll tell I'm us. I'm fucking glad, Keith. I'm glad you're fucking speaking. Right. Yes. Yeah. The most beautifulest thing in this world was Keith Murray at a fucking MC battle, yo. We need I that footage. You, Keith. We need that footage out. And guess what, yeah. Keith? Just like Malik, you the street, yo. They need to believe you because you ain't lying. Mm. 
fucked up thing about it is you still editing yourself because half of that shit that you was trying to talk over, you know you was a witness to and you was a party to. Mm. But you know her, her I dad. I you keep, but you need to start talking about your bodies. <sighs> Oh, damn. I think you better. You start talking about your bodies, Keith, because that's where you're going to find your salvation, Keith. And, Keith, we have you a. You know what the niggas done. We have a blue cow for it. We you have a blue cow for it. the motherfucker that can really tell people why Eric Sermon jumped out of that fucking window. Shit. Because you was there, Keith. Mm. And I know because the niggas that threw him out told me you was there. Mm. Eric Sermon did not jump out of that window. Mm. Talk to who? Keith, there's a blue couch for you. I knew you was there, Keith. <laughs> there's a blue couch for you. Because I knew the niggas. I knew the niggas that threw Eric out the fucking window. And because of your very complicated relationship with Keith, almost as complicated as the relationship that DJ so I had with Keith. Mm. So when Keith, Keith, you and Eric were very close. I ain't gonna say no more than that. Mm. You said enough. Said enough. Go and sit back. But you know who threw him. They're gonna get it out. <laughs> you hear me? Well, tell it, Keith. Tell it all. We gotta so, get the road. Tell it all, Keith. That's your salvation. So, <laughs> I have to ask you then, and again. God bless the dead. God bless the dead. Um, speaking of God, and speaking of religion, yeah. and what. Oh, yeah. Solar yeah, let's, and velvet. Yeah, because I'm just curious. Because God came to me and asked me to minister to these people. Okay. Which is good. They're married. Which is good. I found them a preacher yeah, in I, a church. I, I met Solar and Velvet, and they seem like they were on a righteous path from the five minutes I met them. Listen to me. <laughs> what fucking what that fucking nature nigga did. Yeah, that's right. He was telling me that, 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 that shit fucked up. Now I ain't gonna lie, but Solar said he told me he said, "Yeah, nature was fucked up," but he said I was behind it though. He was the carbonation. Listen to me, ringleader. I yeah. don't want to have. That's, and he told me the same thing about that. With too. none of that carbonation, I only deal with the carbon island. There you go. And the carbon island is the refugees. That left. And I'm that that left the carbonation, and I want to help them. They want to get straight. I want to see. Velvet and Solar get married. Yeah, Velvet seemed For like real. a Velvet seemed like a beautiful soul. I mean, it just you know me. the child. These I mean, are, these are yeah, smart yeah, yeah. kids. Yeah. yeah. What's fucked up is they were just misled. He fucking knew what he was doing because he used their intellect to enslave them. He used pimping one. Yeah, we, we yeah we seen it on camera. I right. literally watched. So and I watched and that white man fold Nature Boy over. Him. Yeah, it, it, hey. I've seen the yeah. sex tape. I've yeah. seen no, the porno. Listen, listen. Because he worked. You he went worked. in for a physical, fam. Yes, yeah. you worked. Listen, my... I know you take it care of. I know you're <laughs> necessary right in jail because you know how to toss that ass up, nature <laughs> boy. He tossed that shit up yeah. like a pro. Nah, I was uh, taking lessons. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen. So, <laughs> right? He's out He's out again. 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 He's out He's out again. 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 He's out which is, you know, Louisiana. I got um, an interesting relationship with Louisiana. That joke will finish. Yeah. D do you feel he was using a manipulation tactic? He might have been. Okay. I um, don't know. Yeah, I don't now, care. I, I, I would say, I would say, um, I don't know what his intentions were, but I would say. My job was to be open to him so that he could trust me, so that I could bring him the word of God and he could convert. You ought to be glad you used the word of God in there, because I'm just about to cut. Yeah, you know, about to see that? I was just about to hit the gavel. You, you caught it. Open what? No, no, definitely. Yeah, ain't shit supposed to be over nobody but me. God Even damn. with your enemies, you have to be That's vulnerable. True. That is true. No, again. That's true. So that you can show them. And you can learn them. It's almost like a child. Yeah. You're not supposed to forsake a child that is yours. You're supposed to try to learn it, mm -hmm. figure it out, and allow My a job is mm -hmm. to bring the word of God mm -hmm. and to bring the name of Jesus Christ to the lips of all of the Carbon Island people. And in that, a great work is going to be done. Mm -hmm. I pray for all of you every day. 
I consider you all my nieces and my nephews. I love you all. And if there's anything I can do to help any of you, I will do it in the name of Jesus. I promise you. And lastly, um, and I, I, I want Velvet and Solar to get married for that baby. I want them to have a real marriage. Yeah, no. I want to. I, I want to hold that baby. That's the one baby I haven't gotten a chance to hold yet. Last baby you held, you got us all sick. So I'm tired of you holding babies. Listen yeah, to it, me. It, it is COVID season. Shit. Yeah, leave, leave, <laughs> and, they, and these little ones are carrying leave, the real shit. Look, they are like, lethal weapons. No, but yeah, but you, you have you me. have spoke on them a lot. You, yeah. Every time you go live, you speak yeah. on them oh like. Oh my yeah. god, no, the, the yeah. little peanut, the little Eminem <laughs> face. Is so man, cute. it was almost worth the hell. <laughs> Almost. The next time I came over, I had on a mask. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm gonna cover up the next time. We had hazmat so, suits on, and I got the little lovings from the, and then I got to feel the mama's ass. It's so supple. Oh my god, ass, ass is just. Amazing. So real quick, do you believe Goomba in the in the situation at the barbershop that he, I believe he wanted he, no harm to come to you? I believe that he believes what he believes. Do you feel he wanted harm to come to I you? I believe that I believed what I believed. Okay. Yeah, okay. I believe that what y'all saw at that barbershop was, as Heath Ledger said it, as the Joker in the movie. What happens when an unmovable object meets an unstoppable force? That's what y'all saw. Yeah. So which one am I? It doesn't matter. Okay, you're right. Yeah, they both they both are gonna <laughs> I just wanna say I'm you're, gonna... you're the unstoppable object. <laughs> I was saying, right. The LT. Right. <laughs> LT. Um so... it was triggering to me because I'm watching this young man who I know needs my help. Ah uh, yeah, he does. Or some help. And some every young help. man that comes into my life that I minister to reminds me of my son. And that's where I was going to go. Yeah. It's a boy that... You know, the things that I wish someone would have done for my son, I try to do them for other people's Yeah. Kids. Righteousness. I feel, I feel bad after yeah. I whooped his ass, but I mean, he, he got... He, and I just... Yeah, no, and Goomba said, I felt yeah, bad I feel in the bad. moment of right. attacking. Right. Like, and he... To watch that happen, it just made me think of how my son got shot. Yeah, yeah. And they left him there to die. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. They called the ambulance and sent them to the wrong, wrong place. To the wrong place to cover their own ass. Oh wow! I didn't know that. that's one thing I did not know. Yep. And my son laid there on camera and died on CCTV. Oh wow! Bleeding out. They showed you the, you seen this footage? I saw it. Oh, wow. But I had already seen it, you know. In the dreams. It was just seeing it twice. Yep. Because I had seen it six years before when I decided I was going to get my family out of Philadelphia. Wow. And, um... So, Jack, I have to ask you, um, yeah. if you don't mind just speaking on it, because, again, your fans want to know... Um, and you spoke to me. Even. When I do my dirt, my son is with me. Yes. That's why I put the ashes on me. Yes. Because I heard my son saying, Mommy, tell him, Mommy, make him stop. Make him stop. Yeah. Make him stop. And the only thing I could think of was just to just use him. Yeah. And, and when I started blowing those cremation ashes over them and they heard me speaking in broken French, you know, niggas got a little respectful after they had body slammed me on the concrete because I was trying to stop my husband from potentially murdering someone in front of witnesses. I don't know who... See, if you was watching uh, episode, episode two... I don't know two. who that little nigga is that put his hands on me. Mm. But my husband said he whooped your ass. I didn't see it. So in my opinion, it didn't happen. Mm. So you still want. But I will see you. <laughs> you still want. And I promise you, what my husband did to you will be, it will be polite compared to what I am going to do to you. Don't nobody touch me for free. Mm. touching me costs and you gonna pay it 
I will see you, young man. And unfortunately, it's not going to turn nice for you. Whatever my husband did to you, that was polite. I'm going to start with your nuts and then work my way up from there. Mm. I promise you. So, Jack, I got to ask. If I um, ever fucking see you and you had a mask on, bitch. You had a fucking mask on, but I see, I still got your maid because I saw the imprint of your nose and your lips. I do that. I have a photographic memory. I don't forget shit. I will see you again. And not even this motherfucker can stop me from doing what I'm going to do to you with my hunting knife. Oh, shit. I'm going to start with your nuts. Yeah. You better hope I leave you with something to take home to your mama. Mm. Oh, my dead son, I promise you. So, Jag, um, is, if there's one thing you could take back from that... I would take nothing back. I, I figured you'd say that. In order for me to take it back means that I don't believe in the will of God. I believe that everything that happens happens within the will of God. If I didn't go into that hospital... Hold on a second. But you met some interesting people there, too, wait as well. Hold, hold on a second. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got to do this. I and as you're looking it up, as you're looking it up, you didn't go directly to the hospital. They had you in kind of. They had me in a regular hospital. Yeah, they had first. you. Yeah. On a fucking hold. Hold on. Hold on. I'm hoping that she'll answer. Oh. Let's see. Please answer. <laughs> Please answer. <laughs> Girl, answer the phone. Yeah, please. She this, might be at the this hospital. This is your moment. <laughs> she might be at the hospital. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> she, she, might, she, might, she might be un unaccessible. <laughs> okay. Damn time. it, damn it. The she one... called me, no, she called me all the time. I wanted to give her, yeah, because you shouted her out a few times. My and, girl, A-Rad. Yeah, I, you shouted her out a few times. My husband tried to get her fired. Because mm. I didn't trust nobody. Yeah, like, no, nah, honestly. Like, what the fuck, bro? Things were volatile at that time. I was talking to... I don't know who the fuck coming up there. I don't know who's who in that room with you. And they allowing you... To, I don't know who the fuck you calling. <laughs> you ain't calling me. Wait a minute. Like, damn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, things were volatile at the time where it's like, who knows what's going on? Things were volatile. So hold on a second. Wait a minute. Let me see if I can make one more phone call. Okay. okay. Sometimes it's a second call that do it. Okay. Sometimes it's a second call that do it. <laughs> Ma'am. Hey, Miss Sonia. Hey, how are you? I'm okay. I spoke to your son-in-law yesterday. Yeah, he sent me a text message that told me. Did he tell you what I said to him? I haven't talked to him. He just I told him to tell you. Thank you. Oh, he told me you said thank you and that you love me. I do love you. Yeah, you took such good care of me in the hospital. You don't even know it. I told him this interview with you for free is because I love your mama. You took such good care of me. Let her know the world loves Miss Sonia. I tried. No, I you didn't try. You brought me some gold peak sweet tea. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea how much you bless my soul. You and my other girlfriend, will you please give her my phone number and tell her to call me? She wasn't she wasn't there last night. She wasn't there last night. Tell her <laughs> tell her to call me. Give her my number, tell her to call me because that's yep, Miss Brenda, because that's my Hebrew Israelite sister. <laughs> I just thank God for that he sent y'all, you know? Yes, ma'am. And this interview. With your son-in-law is going to make him a lot of money. And I told him he has to spoil you ridiculously. There you go. Let me get the chance anyway. That was the, that was the agreement. The agreement was whatever money he made, he had to spoil you in some way. <laughs> <laughs> make sure I get my roses while I'm up there. Well, good, because I need an address so I can send you some flowers. I want to send you flowers you can eat. I want to send you an edible arrangement. Mm. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. Why don't you text me an address? <laughs> I will. Tell me something. I'll send it, I'll send it while I'm in Vegas. 
Yes, we did make it home. By the way, Miss Sonia, my husband's sitting right here. This is Miss Sonia from the hospital. Hold on a second. Oh, yeah, I'll it, be dead. Did worry. she call back? Is it? A-Rab. <laughs> A-Rab. There we go. A-Rab. A-Rab. A-Rab, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I got Miss Sonia on the phone. Say hi. Hello. Hey, girl. How are you? Yeah. So my husband is here. Go ahead, honey. Is is Miss Sonia A. Rap from from Charleston? Hola. Thank you, ladies, for taking care of my wife. Oh, you have no problem. Hey, A. Rap. You know, you know, you know. I got something special for you, anyways. A. Rap. He he's really pushing this whole you being our our second wife thing. Are you feeling it? Ooh, is it? What what you have special? <laughs> no, I'm just saying. What you have special for? Hey, Reb, if you're not feeling the whole polygamy hey, with my husband, what? That, what? just let me know because I don't want to be throwing me under the bus. I'd love to have you around. <laughs> if I could just get to hang out with you, I wouldn't mind. I was talking about dinner, but not <laughs> not with her. Okay. Anyway, anyway, Miss Sonia, I love you. <laughs> I was just talking about Eddie B's, Nick and Sam's. We, I'm at the studio and everybody's oh getting loud God. now. I love you. We hey, love Rab, I'm going to call you back in a couple minutes, okay? Hey, Rab, Miss Sonia, we love okay. you. Wait a minute. Hey, hey Rab, I, met, I think I got somebody I want to introduce you to. Get off the phone. And he's, and he's, and he's <laughs> no, but, but he's younger. He's younger. You can tell her later. Solar? <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you don't mind younger, I got somebody I'm going to introduce you to. All right. I love you, girls. I got to get back to work. What? What? Just this. If you get any messages on Instagram, somebody hacked my account after, and they're asking people for money. No, I would never Somebody know. had your that's fucking king. It's King World. Mm -hmm. It's King World. He, he did the same shit with he mine. He done hacked your account. He did the same shit with mine. I don't know, but there mm -hmm. somebody asking people for money. No, shut it down. That's shit. King World. Right. Shut it's it down. King World. Do me a favor. I need you to screenshot everything mm -hmm. because I'm trying to have the FBI go after this guy. Mm -hmm. He comes after anybody that knows me. It, I don't know how he got mine either. Listen to me. He did the same thing Shit. to my husband's account. He had. I start giving phone account. calls, talking about uh, folks like, "Gee, is this you asking for thousand like dollars?" Kind of Bitcoin. If you need it, all you had to do was ask me. I was like, "Nigga, if I need it, I'll talk to you." Yeah. If I took it's a it. if it's a Bitcoin scam, it's King World. No, it's a cash app. Like, yeah. That's the same thing. Yeah, no, no, no. It's King World. Yep. No, it's it's King World. Bitcoin it's King World. Oh yeah. Mm hmm. Because the Bitcoin no, no, no. operates on cash. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna talk yeah, to you no, offline, no, no. and I'm gonna tell you how to protect yourself. I'm gonna tell you. How to, okay. I apologize. You know, being friends with me, the circus comes to town, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I met this. I, I I think I got a lovely young man for this. Y'all gotta wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miss Sonia, please tell her to listen to me. I hope they're not on. Are they on workouts? Huh? Are they working right now? Okay. Seven years. Okay. All right. Wrap it up, B. Well, lady. She burning. She burning. Ladies. I love you. Hey, Rap. I love you, but I got to go. Miss Sonia, we love you. I'm going to call everybody back soon. The world thanks you. Oh. The world thanks you. Yeah, she's going to watch this and be like, ooh. So right. let's do it like this. Let's just. How, so how, what how, were my nurses from Charlton <clears throat> when they was keeping me drugged every day? They were the ones that kept me from killing everybody. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm thankful for everybody that is in place. And again, I'm thankful for the man right next to you. Yeah. How are y'all now? Um, y'all about to go do some major business on uh, the uh, West Coast. Um, uh, I, of course, am proud of everything that y'all been through. Mm -hmm. Because again, a lot of people wish that y'all fail. Mm -hmm. But y'all are persevering. And Jack, you said it best that, um, man, just imagine if we come through this and work it out. And what will we tell other couples that are going through this scenario? Like you said, you had a five-year plan to learn this man. I got married without a prenup. Yeah, and you y'all might have put each other through the gauntlet. For real, for real. But how are y'all now? How are y'all spirits? How's how's everything? How was things going? I forward? hated him last night. I love him this morning. Wow. I love that. <laughs> That's how hey That's how life works. That's how life works, man. And everything is my fault. Works. So you know I'll take it. 
And you know, hey, hey, you know, we're gonna lose ninety percent of all arguments. Ninety, we're gonna lose ninety nine. Ninety nine percent. Thank you. you. Have to lie. They might give us one, one, one percent, but ninety nine percent. Guess what? Even if he won them all, I'd still win. <laughs> <laughs> Damn skipping. The, hey. Damn skipping. That's that's the outlook I'm on life. Winning, no matter what. Facts. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Facts. So. Uh, for those at home that are watching this and just want to give, you know, just they want y'all to kind of tell them how y'all do. I don't fuck doing. around. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't fuck kids. My husband has a big dick. It's fucking awesome. It's probably the only reason we're still together. He's a fucking piece of shit demon when he ain't on his meds. You and sometimes he treats me fucking bad. You're a worse dude. But I love him. Ooh, this is some toxic shit. I love. But I love them. <laughs> toxic love. Toxic love. And so t-shirt. T-shirt. <laughs> t-shirt. The one thing that he didn't say about the night that we came together, the night that we collided into one another. I looked in his eyes and I saw his smile. You know those eyes that y'all like talking about got mascara? That's him naturally. Oh, yeah, they say his skin and they they say Beautiful. I they say I look alike. Beautiful. And I saw, I saw beyond the game. I saw beyond the skin. She seen behind bullshit, sir. <laughs> oh my goodness. I yeah. saw him. Oh. And he was beautiful. So Jack, he said he saw you in your eyes, and he said you were screaming for help. Probably. And that's what he saw. That's what he saw. I can't argue with it. Yeah, that's what he saw. I'm not going to argue with it. And if that's why he beat up, at this point in time, he can beat up whoever the fuck he want to beat up. Like, I don't care no more. You get three free ass whoopings a year. Woo! Take them. Fuck the hall passes. I'm with ass whoopings. Right. As long as it ain't me. Of course there not. There, there you go. go. He never, can fuck up whoever he wants to fuck up. And I'm Look, I'll let, you, I, I'll let you beat me up, nigga. I ain't gonna touch you. Shit, you just slap me so many goddamn time, punch me in the about? face and everything. The street, street I never Episode two. I never Episode two. Don't, make, in don't make me call uh, them folks I right now. You. <laughs> I pushed you. <laughs> yeah, mushing up. She said, hey, from a Philly from, woman. From, from, hey, no, no. She said, no. From a Philly woman, mushing is always different. Yes, it is. <laughs> Mush, I just mushed you. I mushed you. I mushed you in the face. I mushed that's you. A, that's some East Coast shit. And I said I couldn't <clears throat> kill you, bitch. That's, that's some East Coast I shit. Because East I Coast should. East Coast, hey, I just mushed you. You should take that. You should take that. So, hey, I, we love. have been a punch. We love y'all. And I would hate that motherfucker. The world, the world loves y'all. Uh, Goomba and Jag is the new hashtag. When I see that little bitch from that barbershop, Bobby. <laughs> Still stuck on this bullshit. Get back. I take, yeah, for whatever real. Whatever I take off of him, I'm going to leave on your doorstep. <laughs> Bobby. Mm. Hey. I came and I apologized to you, you bitch ass fucking hoe. And you let that little fucking punk put his fucking hands on me and you ain't stop him. Fuck you and your fucking drug dealing ass cover up shop. <laughs> that shit ain't true. And, and, we, and we gonna leave it right it's true cause you go and buy weed there and I know they got yayo in the back yeah, that is a fucking lie <laughs> I know allegedly. they got yayo in the back allegedly I know they ain't got no fucking allegedly allegedly <laughs> I know what they I know what you got in there Bobby fuck your little boy who you probably told to body slam me cause you mad that I fucking cussed you out in your own fucking shop and told you to call the cops Cause y'all niggas, I don't like fake thugs. Mm. And we ain't fake. I like you fake the fucking me, you fucking country motherfuckers. This the fucking kind of fucking reindeer games y'all play. I done fucking had all of you shot in the fucking head for the shit y'all do around that motherfucking shop. Y'all some bitches. I'm gonna tell you that right now, up in Sweet 517, right there by the big lots, all of y'all some fucking bitches. Ain't none of y'all. Ain't none of y'all can fucking hang with me, bitch. And they never so, will. Fuck you, Bobby. I love you, Billy, but you run with some bitches. <laughs> so we're gonna try to end on a positive note. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Jesus. I'm trying to tell you. You fucking like, shot. I, 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 I told you I, sh- I shouldn't have been on the couch, nigga. Shot. 
Why are you invite me on the couch? No, we need the optic. We need the optic. Watch your business die day by day. Oh my God. My son. This optical While the illusion. ashes of my son's dead body claim your <sighs> fucking business one by one when everybody's afraid to get their fucking hair cut in there and all you got left is a drug. Ain't nobody afraid to get their hair cut in there. Matter of fact, you get more business now because your ass is packing the food. You better be afraid of me. That nigga making money. I got fucking, I got fucking He money. got the Jaguar stimulus check 2.0. <laughs> the Jaguar stimulus b- Because package. of the footage she took. Yeah, I actually want to drive. No, 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 no. Jack, no. no I, Jack, advocating for that? No, Jack, no, I wanted to drive by there, though. No. I'm like, wh- I was like, what? The story that Goomba Yo, painted. shout out to Soto. I want okay. the key to the city. <laughs> I want the Chamber of Commerce because I done made this shit a fucking um, shit. I done made this shit the shit. The Soto owe me a check. And by the way, I'm not done with y'all, DeSoto, especially you fucking Ramirez. You fucking dirty bitch, because you know they sell drugs in there, Ramirez. You've been dirty. I remember the first time you came and arrested me at my house when I was living over there at Parkerville and Polk. You think I forgot? I remember the shit you said to me when you put me in fucking handcuffs the first time, bitch. Mm. I'm going to see you, Ramirez. I'm going to see you off duty. You didn't tell me that story. What are you okay, talking about? Yeah, I'm going yeah. to see you off duty, Ramirez. And guess what? <laughs> I think I know exactly who your wife is. And I got this stripper. He has a dick this fucking big. This fucking oh, long. Oh, this about to this go left. Oh, oh, this about to, oh, this about to go left. I'm going to fucking feel <laughs> you fucking your wife, nigga. <laughs> because I know she needs some real dick, yo. Oh, shit. You fucking dickless bitch. <laughs> Fuck you, Ramirez, with your dirty fucking ass. I don't get no fuck, and I hope you pull me over. Because this time you're going to take me to Lou Starrett. Because I'm going to kick you in your fucking nuts. What little you fucking got. Ooh. I feel sorry for your wife, that small penis she's had to endure, and your fucking bad attitude. Fuck you, you dirty bitch. Jaguar Wright, we love you, and this is... That's all I got to say. Daladelphia Network. I'm on some Forrest Gump shit, and that's all Daladelphia I got to say TV that. Network. Fuck you, Ramirez, you fucking bitch. I'm going to get your wife some good dick. Stay- I'm gonna get her some. I'm gonna get her some dick that she likes. <laughs> Say stay Cause tuned. Cause we know she don't like yours. <laughs> stay tuned. DallasWTVNetwork.com. Let's go. Real life. <laughs>
My granddaddy was a song and dance man. Um, he was very popular on the Chitlin circuit, but he was married to a woman that he really didn't want to be with. And he was having a bunch of kids. I know my grandfather loved his family, but the truth is, is he loved his career more. Um, my Aunt Penny got sick with pneumonia. See, he used to open up for the Nicholas brothers, Fat and, uh, Oh, um, oh, what are the, oh, I'm trying to remember the Nicholas brothers' first names. The one that was married to Dorothy Dandridge and Fayette. And uh, my granddaddy used to open up for them on the Chitlin Circuit, and he was so good that they guaranteed him a spot at the Cotton Club. And um, Aunt Penny got sick with pneumonia, and it was all hands on deck back then. A lot of people died from pneumonia um, back in the 40s, down south. You know, he's a sharecropper, but that's what he did to support the family, kind of. Um, but yeah, Aunt Penny got sick, and he was late to Memphis. He was supposed to have been meeting the Nicholas brothers in Memphis. And um, he got there, and they had already left, and he missed his, uh, he missed his spot at the Cotton Club. And um, he never let nobody forget it. That incident happened in 1940 something. I was born in 1977 and I heard about it all the way up until he died in uh, 1986. My granddaddy was 86 when he passed away. So it was 1986. He died that fall, my Uncle Jello. He died um, earlier that year, it broke his heart. My Uncle Jello was his favorite. My dad was the hardest working and the most dedicated, but my Uncle Jello was his favorite. He was junior, you know. Um, he always wanted to make it. <laughs> was there, from your grandfather to his kids and nine other children, your dad, was there any other musical outside of your grandfather? Everyone in my family is talented. If my father hadn't had such a great disdain for the music industry because of what it did to his family, because of the way my grandfather, I mean, you got to understand, my grandfather, he would get upset and be like, fuck all of you, I can't stand you. I was supposed to have went to the Cotton Club and married Lena Horn and left all y'all niggas in the South. Um, when I say him and my grandmother didn't like each other, they just, they didn't like each other. Uh, I remember uh, one day I was over, this is when we was living on the family, you know, the family house was on Spencer Street. Aunt Susie house, my Aunt Susie Bright, who was an executive at Campbell Soup all the way up until she retired, um, had the corner house, you know. And granddaddy sat out on the porch and grandma up until she passed away, you know, I was a little girl. I couldn't have been, I must have been like three years old and I was playing in the living room. And I never asked myself why my grandmother was tied to the chair um, in the living room. I, I still don't know why I didn't think anything strange of it. It was just grandma was in the chair and she was tied up and I just accepted it. Um, and then my cousin Shermaine, who's my Aunt Verley, daughter, God rest her soul, God bless the dead. Um, my cousin Shermaine, she, she had been living in Philadelphia. She had left Atlantic City and moved to West Philly with her husband, Rodney Gary. And so Shermaine came over and she saw grandma tied up in the chair. And she said, grandma, why are you in the chair? And she said, yo, aunts are terrible people. They tied me in this chair. I've been stuck here in this chair. And grandma just put on this. She was in such distress. And I still didn't have no question about it. I just was playing in the living room on the floor by myself. And so my cousin Shemaine looked at my grandmother and said, grandmother, do you want me to let you go? And she said, oh, please, grandbaby, just let me go. So my cousin Shemaine untied my grandmom and when she did, that's when we realized why she was tied in the chair. Uh, Cause she puts my cousin to the side and then she pulled the knife out 
from underneath the seat cushion and she ran up the stairs to go kill my granddaddy and she was trying to kick in the door and he was laughing at her, he had the dead bone. I'm, bitch, I ain't letting you in. <laughs> I'm a kid, you nigga. You know, like my granddad would do weird shit. Like we'd be having grace and during grace, he'd be like, Lord, can you please take this ugly bitch home? <laughs> you know, like at the dinner table. So I, I mean, love has always been complicated in my family. Um, but they stayed married until they, till death do them part. My family don't really believe in divorce. So what was probably something that you may have seen your grandfather do to you, <coughs> to your grandmother, just on your father's side? Oh, just, you know, cuss out all the time and they would cuss each other out. You know, my grandma go to the bathroom and then granddaddy they gotta go to the bathroom cause you know, they was up in age and you know, Granddaddy come, bitch, there's something cried up your ass and die, Jesus, die with it, die with it, you know. Or you hear them hacking and call, bitch, shut the fuck up, you know, that they just, they had an antagonistic relationship. Um, every now and then they try to kill each other and, you know. And as far as your father, um, what history? My grandma was a tall woman, see. My grandma, she was like the shortest of her siblings. She was six foot two and a half. My granddaddy was five foot nine. So I think he had kind of like a Napoleon complex and just wasn't gonna let my grandma think cause she was taller than him and bigger than him. I think, you know, that was kind of it. Grandma wasn't no joke, but he would never go too far. Cause my grandmother's brothers were really big. And like my Uncle Tiny, my Uncle Tiny, he was eight feet tall. So, you know, what the hell was my granddaddy gonna do, five foot nine, fucking around with Georgia Ann and Tiny eight feet tall and come and pluck him, you know? So, I mean, it was a, it was a mutual love, well, hate, hate. They loved the family, they just couldn't stand each other. And, uh, yeah. Where were they from, your grandfather? Pitch, Georgia. But you can't find it. It's not on the map anymore. Uh, the state of Georgia has disavowed all knowledge of the town. It was a lynch town, see. Um, white man came through. Got offended that a black man could read better than him. And then he came back with his friends drunk. And they killed everybody. And my family escaped. Uh, made it to North Florida, and uh, nobody talk about it. And we know it happened, and then uh, Georgia swept it under the rug, and it's still hidden under underpasses and stuff. They have it barricaded off. It you unless you knew where it was, you drive right by it and. They ain't pay no reparations for anybody from Pitch, Georgia, either. They just swept it under the rug. So after that, my family went down to White Spring, Florida, and the last, the baby of the nine siblings, because there's only two left now, everybody else gone. And my aunt team, and then there's my aunt Iola in Chicago. Um, but my aunt team is still in the family town. I took my husband down there to go see her. I said, this is the closest you're going to get to me and my father because she looked just like my dad. And that was my dad's favorite, his baby sister. Oh, my God. My dad would, he would rip down the Empire State Building for, for team. Um, but ain't, baby, ain't she great? She loved him. Oh, my God. The picture that they took at the IHOP when we went during the pandemic. She, ah, look at my baby. We talked to her, what was about a month ago? Cause we gotta go down to Florida, go see her. And uh, she's, where my, where my man? She love her some Gerald. But uh, yeah, so the family settled in Florida and then you know, everybody started migrating north around the 50s. So your father, um, what was his education level, what was his uh, occupation? He was forced to drop out of school in the third grade because he had to share crop. My granddaddy was so focused on his music career that he really didn't have time to work the land. 
And the truth is, is my granddaddy was a hustler. He'd rather go steal tires off the white people car and sell them um, than share crop. My daddy worked, so my dad had the mule and had the hoe, and he tended to about 15 acres by himself at nine years old. And um, my father was able to finish school uh, when he went into the military. Um, my father signed up, went into the Marine Corps. He lied when he was 16. My grandma, you know, things weren't going as great as they were going with the land. There weren't enough hands working and my dad could only do but so much. So daddy went to the military so my grandma could get the check and um, make up for what wasn't happening with sharecropping. And, and uh, my father's life changed. What branch did he serve in? How much time did he serve? Marine Corps. Hoorah! Simplify. How yeah. much time did he serve? Um, about three years. He was a scout sniper sergeant. He was also a cook in the mess hall. And when the colonel came through and tasted the food, he said, uh, this food is too good for, show for soldiers who cooked it. And they said, right. He said, who made the gravy? And he said, he said, right did it. He said, report to my quarters at, um, what's three o'clock, 1500 hour. And he went there and then they changed his assignment and that's how my dad got out of the field and he spent the rest of his time in the service as the private chef for the colonel. Um, but I mean, the worst had already happened by then. My father was a black troop. People look at Tuskegee and they think that's the only company that happened to. It happened to all the black companies. My father's company, they did psychological warfare testing and training. They had them in a in an insane asylum for 90 days, locked up, hypnosis, psychedelic drugs, had them doing all kinds of shit in there. My father didn't stop having the night terrors and blacking out until he was about 65. So when daddy had rough days, uh, it was just rough day. We would come home, the house would be torn to smithereens and we wouldn't know if we had been robbed, the dad had a bad day, so we would have to sift through everything and see um, if anything was missing. And if nothing was missing, then we knew we didn't have to call the police. And we just had to clean up and have everything done before dad got home. Uh, yeah. How did your father uh, meet your mother? What was that? Mean? It was a blind date. My mother was a single mother of a complicated child that had been molested by a family member. My sister was six, Lachelle. She was six. She ain't like my dad. And then my grandfather died nine months after, well, nine months before I was born. So my granddaddy had pretty much raised my sister as the man of the house, and she gave my dad a hard time. She gave the whole fucking family a hard time. You know? When you say hard time, uh, the bitch is crazy. Uh, are there things you remember as a dad? I remember everything. Can you elaborate on one of those times that you felt like this is just hard to deal with? One? Just one. Just, Nigga. Don't make me pick. No, nah, it's all fucked up. She started putting pillows over my face when I was a baby. And she started setting me up to get beat. And she would lie on me, have the neighborhood bullies come after me to fight me, to scare me. I'll never forget the first time she got me set up to get beat up. I was five years old in Lawnside, New Jersey. On, we lived at 230 Haney Avenue. It was this fat bitch with a bad Jerry Crow named Rezzy. Therese. And everybody was so scared of her. Rez was about, Therese, Rezzy was about nine, I was five. And Rezzy was big and greasy. 
Had Jericho shit was a mess. And uh, I think my sister had told her that I said I could beat her up. And so Rezzy came to my driveway. I was on my big wheel. And she stopped my big wheel while I was riding down the street. You think you can beat me up? And I said, what you talking about? Leave me alone. I don't want to fight you. Well, you going to fight me because your sister said. And I looked, and this bitch is standing at the door, and she closed the door and locked the door. My sister, this bitch nine years fucking older than me. And my parents wasn't home. So I stood up, and I said, I don't want to fight you. And then she pushed me. And she pushed me back, and all the kids, ooh, you know, all the kids on the block. And I just remember what my dad said. It don't matter if you win. It don't matter if you lose. But you got to fight regardless. So I balled up my fists, my little teeny skinny little arms, closed my eyes, and I just started fucking swinging. And next thing I know, I heard the kids, oh! And I opened my eyes, and Rezzy got a bloody nose. And she sit there and started crying. And the neighborhood bully with the Jericho juice dripping ran up the street. And we became friends after that for a short while. We was decent. So as a reminder, you only have one other sibling? No. How many siblings do you have? I mean, does it really fucking matter? I'm the only child between my two parents. The rest of them niggas is half, and I really don't have much to do with them. How many have you? Well, there are biological children that my parents had before I was born, and then there were family members that were adopted and raised in the household. Everybody that I liked is dead. Everybody that I don't like is alive. For now. Niggas is getting old. My brother Norman, he's been successful all of our lives. He don't like me because he don't like my mama. My sister Otelia don't like me because I ended up being our father's favorite. And Shelly just don't like me because I exist. And as long as I exist, I remind her how inferior she is as a human being, as a whole. Yeah. What makes you the favorite? I remember you stated that you were supposed to Because I worked the hardest, because I listened, because I was obedient, and I treasured every word that came out of my parents' mouths. I honored my mother and father. I followed the Ten Commandments beating in my head. I used to have to recite them. The whole chapter, Exodus 20, the whole chapter, every Shabbos when the sun was coming in, I had to know it by heart. And if I did, if I messed up a word, I'd get my ass whipped. I listened. Were there whoopings in your family? Oh, my God, yeah. This is, you know, this is the 70s, 80s. I preferred my dad because daddy was fast and quick justice. Mom liked to drag it out. You know, my mother unsupervised it. It wasn't good parenting. She would make us strip down naked and lay on our face, face down on the floor. And then she'd get a spray bottle and she'd spray us with water. And then she'd get the extension cord and beat the fuck out of us and laugh when we cried. I'll never forget, I had a Norman Bates moment. You remember the Bates Motel where he came in and he killed the bitch in the shower? Ah! My mama dumped me like that. I didn't wash the dishes, see. She ain't beat me like a normal person. She waited for me to get in the shower for my, scent, you know, for my skin to get soft. And she came in the bathroom and I seen her lurking and she pulled back the curtain. Why, why, why? 
to start beating the fuck out of me in that shower. I guess that's part of the reason why I never had a problem with scars. I've always had them. A body without scars, I don't understand. Yeah, my mom was, uh, she used to do mean shit. Like my sister, if she wouldn't wash the dishes and left the, the and the stinks start to get stinky, stinky and the rag and then the dirty food and all of that, my mom made my sister eat that shit out the drain. And then made her wash down four tablespoons of castor oil behind it. Like my mom, her cruelty with some extra shit. She got off on it. So like my sister, my mom used to love canned peaches. Oh, that was her treat. And my sister would steal my mom peaches. And then she would fill it up with water to try to get the marker so my mom would realize that she had got the peaches with mommy. She got too much water in it then one day. So my mom got an idea. And she poured out all the peach juice, and then she replaced it with castor oil, a whole bottle of castor oil. And this, my mom, y'all just gonna have to forgive me, this fucking bitch, my motherfucking mama, sitting there waiting for Shelly to go into the kitchen and sneak to get the peaches. I told Shelly, if I you, I'd leave them peaches alone today. Mind your business. I'm going to just put some water in it. She ain't going to know. All right. I told you. See, I've been telling niggas shit my whole life, and they don't fucking believe me. So Shelly get in there. She go get the scooping, and then she tastes the cast oil. My mom said, oh, no, bitch. Have a bowl. Eat them all. Oh, my God. And then Shelly started shitting all over herself. It was terrible. My sister was always trifling. She stole my Jimmy, Bean, my, my Jimmy Dean when they first came out with the microwave biscuit. I worked hard. I did my chores. I worked for the janitorial company starting at the age of five. I was up at 4.30 in the morning working with my father at the buildings. we go have breakfast, and then I had to go home, get dressed, turn around, get my bags, make sure my homework was all the way done, go to fucking school. That was my childhood. Go to school, do the school thing, leave, go back to the janitorial service, clean more buildings. We did medical offices. We was a medical cleaning company. Global was the name of the company. So see, I've always lived the LLC life. And then after that, and I had to come home do my homework, have dinner, and then make it to bed and all of that. Only time I really had alone was with the radio at night. And I'd listen to uh, Power 99, and then the quiet store would come on and I could go to sleep. And then 4.30 in the morning, do it all over again. Mm -hmm. So who were some of your parents' musical influences that people that they might have Oh, my mom loved everything from Motown and everything from Philly International. She a real Philly girl. My mom from down 23rd in Cambridge, she went to grads. She graduated from Kensington, but she went to grads. Um, it, she left when the boy had the gun in school and he was in the locker next to her, so then she transferred to Kensington, which used to be all white and now it's just all heroin addicts and shit. Yeah. Your father, um, did he have any musical like loves? Oh, my father played the guitar, he played the piano, and he sang better than anybody you ever heard in your life. When you hear me sing in my low register, that's actually how my father sound. So did he not look up to anybody like having to do? Oh, my father loved my father's two favorites, Nat King Cole and Ray Charles. Huh? George on my mind, my dad's favorite song. So how would you describe your overall adolescence? Nobody sang like my dad. When he was singing Larry Graham, One in a Million. You know, when somebody died or when there was a wedding, or it was my dad that always sang at the family function. And I'll never forget my aunt Verley say, Wayne, gone now. I guess you're going to have to sing it, Jackie. You're the only one that can do it. 
did your parents want you to sing? Like, were that something? Hell no, my father didn't want me nowhere near the industry. He hated the industry. He hated what it did to my grandfather and what it in turn did to the family. My father did everything that he could do. He wouldn't even let me go to art school. He wanted me to be a corporate litigator. <laughs> At what point did he know you had the talent to sing? At what point did he know? I didn't. I never did. I still don't. I just am what I am. I started writing when I was 11. I started singing in jazz quartets when I was 12 for extra money in the summertime when I wasn't babysitting. Music saved me. It was my escape. My life was fucking terrible. So that's what I was going to ask as far as I'm, I do want you to try to categorize what, do you, what would you say your quote unquote family life was like? Chaotic. My father was a brilliant man that married a woman in six months because she lied to him and told him she was pregnant and inconveniently had a miscarriage right after their honeymoon. <clears throat> it was chaotic. My sister was a child born out of wedlock and abandoned by her father who thought my mother was so crazy he didn't even want anything to do with his own, his own seed. She ran into him online a few years back. My mom and my aunt got involved, and my mom started sending him letters talking about how she was glad he was back in my sister's life and how they had so much catching up to do. The nigga fucking deleted his Facebook the next day. That's how bad he ain't want to fuck with my mom. He said, fuck that. That nigga deleted all his social media, wouldn't talk to my sister no more. I came on to my mom, you selfish as fuck. That's her father. You ain't supposed to be worried about that. Well, he, we have a child and grandchildren. That nigga don't want nothing to do with you. What was your mother's education level? What was her career? Like, what did she do? Um, my mother has two bachelor's degrees, one in regular education and one in special education, which goes to prove that anybody can get a college degree. What was her career? Uh, my mother was a school teacher. She teaches in Camden, New Jersey, one of the worst school systems in the state of New Jersey. She teached in the roughest schools because they paid the most money and they really didn't care who they hired because my mother's a delusional schizophrenic. I don't know who the fuck would trust her with a classroom full of kids. <laughs> Other than Camden fucking New Jersey. But thank you for the pension. Like everybody say, I've been living off of it for years. <laughs> My mom, her career ended at Broadway. She couldn't handle the classrooms anymore, so they kept dropping her down, and they gave her the kindergarten that last year. She lost them, the whole fucking class. <laughs> they went out for recess, and she lost the motherfucking class, the whole fucking class. <laughs> Them little motherfuckers went down the street to the corner store. <laughs> She's supposed to be watching them on the recess. She lost the fucking kids. I'm sitting there talking to her principal. Listen to me, your mother's gonna have to. We're gonna, I said, please, my father's dying. Just let her retire. We invested a lot into getting her this far. Please let her retire. Do not make us fight for her pension. And so that's when my mother retired and then my father died eight months later. And I've been taking care of my mom ever since. What was his ailment? Oh, I mean, my dad had 22 strokes. He had Parkinson's. Bleeding on the brain at the end. He beat the prostate cancer, but the diabetes and the Parkinson's, see. The hardest thing in the world to do is watch my father lose his mind. Because he was one of the most brilliant motherfuckers I ever met. Only person smarter than my dad is my son. As far as... Um, God bless the dead. Did you have to move a lot as you were young, or did you stay pretty much uh, stationary in one house? We prior? moved until we got comfortable. My dad was an upwardly mobile Negro. They left Philadelphia, they moved to Jersey, to the suburbs. K 
keep us out the city. But we was in the city every day because the cleaning business was in the city. So I was in Philadelphia every day no matter what. I literally grew up on both sides of the bridge. Period. I was in the Northeast in the morning, in Logan before school, then in Jersey in private school, then back <laughs> to Philly. You know, so we was over the bridge at least twice a day, almost every day. So I grew up in both places. I just gravitated towards the hood. I liked double dutch. I liked sunflower seeds. I liked oatmeal pies. I liked, I liked dollar hoagies. I liked boom boxes and the sound of the city. Jersey, it got quiet, too quiet. And everybody was more fucked up in the suburbs than most of the people in the city anyway. Suburb people so much more fucked up than city people. See, city people got to deal with danger every day so they know how to avoid it. Suburb people, there is no danger, so they always fucking looking for it because they bored as fuck. They're a lot more dangerous than city kids. I had more fucked up shit happen to me fucking with suburb motherfuckers than I ever did happen with city niggas. So what kind of crimes did you see that kind of happening around the neighborhood? And you're like, and you're I mean, at, just ask me. So let's just say from age... Three to seven. Did you witness? When I was three years old, I saw my first murder. I seen a man get a hole blown through him, right from my face. Did you process it at that time? I mean, I've witnessed over 150 murders in my life, so I guess I processed it. How did it affect you, would you say, it's the first one? Learn the difference between life and death. I killed, a, I killed a bee and I cried for days because I felt like a murderer. And I thought God was gonna punish me and send me to hell. When you experience murder and death and as a child, it makes you innately in tune with the gravity of life and death. It was moving, it's no longer moving. And something made that happen. Yeah. As far as fun, what would you say were some fun things that you had a chance to do growing up? It wasn't a lot of fun. It wasn't a lot of fun. It was a lot of work and a lot of studying and a lot of time alone. You gotta realize the closest person to age proximity to me in my household was nine years. I grew up with grown people. I had a sister that was a grown woman when I was born. I was always alone. Did you witness any grown things? Of course I did. Did they try to protect you from that or no? Not really. My childhood was catch up or get left behind. Do you remember your first crush? Yeah. Little boy lived um, in Frankfurt around the corner from Fifth House. He had a crush on me, he kissed me when I was seven years old, he was eight. And he was my boyfriend for a week. And then I broke up with him because I was waiting on Bobby Brown. I was gonna marry Bobby Brown. Whitney got him, ain't that a bitch. I'm so glad she did, cause I couldn't have handled that nigga. That's complicated. Walt. Walt. 
Walter Williams III in Williamstown, New Jersey, around the corner from my Aunt Paulette house. I was 13. He was 23. He worked at the car dealership where my dad bought his Chrysler van, and um, he slid me his phone number, and we talked. Walt was sweet. He was in my life on and off about, till I was about 17. After that last time he went to jail for murder. <coughs> I tried to stick by him on that case as best as I could, but he was going away for life. He, um, he did contracts. I didn't believe him when he first told me. And then one night he came to my parents' house. I snuck him in through the back, let him use the shower downstairs. He was covered in blood. It was a job going wrong. And he got arrested for it a year later. First degree murder for contract. He would ride his bike for 15 miles just so he could sleep next to me for an hour and a half. He made me feel so safe. His mama hated me. She thought I was going to get him arrested because I was so young. My eighth grade graduation, I was a valedictorian of my class. I had finished my eighth grade year in three months. They didn't elect me class president because I wasn't the most popular. So the only way I was going to be able to give a speech at my eighth grade graduation was if I was valedictorian. So I said, okay, I guess I'm just going to be valedictorian then. And they all laughed at me. And I just started taking my um, textbooks home every weekend and I read them from cover to cover. And uh, I completed all, all the year's schoolwork before Christmas break. So at that point in time, I was only going to um, school for attendance and I would do um, peer tutoring. And uh, I gave the speech as valedictorian. <laughs> that day was special. Walt was very proud of me. I was about to turn 14, he was about to turn 24. There was nothing like it. My dad refused to let me ride with my classmates in a limousine to the graduation. They was all gonna go out to eat first and then ride in my whole class because it was only eight of us that were graduating. It was private school. so. Yeah, now see, that brings up other memories. Fucking Bush Gardens in my eighth grade trip. That was terrible. My dad beat my ass in front of my whole class because he thought I had ran off with a boy that gave me his phone number. He couldn't find me. I was downstairs in the lobby talking to my mom. I called her collect. And when I came upstairs, he thought I had left with that boy from Bush Car. And so he uh, pulled me into the room, he fucked me up. And he slammed the door so hard that it popped open so all my classmates saw. That was my eighth grade trip. I worked hard. I raised, the, I raised $2,000 for my class to have that trip. I was a trip coordinator and valedictorian in my eighth grade class. That was a fucking uncomfortable ride home. Everybody fucking staring at me trying to figure out how I just took that ass whooping like that and I got a shiner and I'm just walking around normal. 
so anyway, my eighth grade graduation, um, my father never apologized about that. I waited a whole fucking month for the phone bill to come in so he could see the collect call from Virginia to New Jersey and say, I'm sorry, I fucked up. And he was like, well, you probably did something else wrong, so fuck it. See, I've been telling the truth all of my life and people haven't been believing me, even my own family. So my graduation, Walt really, um, Walt wanted to kill my dad so many times and I said, no. My mom won't know what to do without him. Let him be. Your parents knew of this relationship? Nah. I've always been good at keeping secrets. They had no idea. He was sleeping at our house four nights a week. I would sneak him in through the back. I would take the screen off after everybody went to sleep. He would come, park his bike on the side of the car. He never drove a car. He always rode a bike. Park his bike on the side of the house, sneak around, jump over the fence, come through the back window, and then just come into the room. And then uh, he would have to be gone by 4 o'clock because Dad was up by no later than quarter to 5, so. <laughs> yeah, I lived downstairs at the time, and they were upstairs, so. I never told anybody about that. I'm curious, how would you describe what your teachers would say Kind of you Difficult and brilliant. I've always been smarter than my teachers. I've always let them know it. Got suspended a lot because of it. My father always said, don't ever let nobody that's dumber than you think they smarter than you. So anyway, my eighth grade graduation, on the day of my graduation, my mom, she never asked me where I got my money from. I always had money. Walt always gave me money. Walt would give me like two stacks a month to get my hair done, go shop, and do whatever I want. So. On my eighth grade graduation, because I was valedictorian, all these trucks just showed up at my house. Since I wasn't allowed to celebrate with the rest of my class and I had to ride with my parents and ride back home with my parents and I couldn't go out to dinner and I couldn't ride in the limo even though I raised the money to get the limo, um, Walt just, he just sent trucks. First came a truck with flowers. Six dozen red, white, and purple roses. Six fucking dozen. Then came the truck and it was all of this candy and teddy bears and balloons. And then another car came and I had to sign for the package and it was a brand new Rolex. A lady's Rolex, my first Rolex. I was floored. I came back from getting my hair done and I had my layered stacks and my asymmetrical cut and, and my boyfriend showered me. My father lost his mind. Beat the shit out of me right before I had to go to my graduation and took everything and gave it to his girlfriend. I got a typewriter as my graduation gift. because I was going to need it for boarding school. <coughs> Did he send you to boarding school? Yeah, 
I had a full scholarship. Graduated valedictorian in my class, I had 10 scholarships. Best boarding schools on the East Coast. My dad picked the school. White Seven Day Adventist and Christian and I didn't fit in. So I started running away with one of my roommates on the weekends because it was up in North Jersey by the Delaware Water Gap. So we was only 45 minutes outside of Manhattan and a half an hour away from North, from Brick City, from Plainfield. And that's when I started getting into Islam. First, it was 5% Nation of Islam. And then I met Big L in Brick City. And we was creeping. But I started seeing Shia Muhammad, who's Dr. York, Dr. Malachi's York son. I'm trying to remember if he was in the 70s or the 90s. Either, either he was the 75th son or the 90 something son. But he was very important to his father. And I was promised to him. But that was after. I got pregnant before I got pregnant with my son. I never told my family about it until I was grown. I ran away from home. I gave birth to my daughter at the mosque and she was dead 13 weeks later and after she died, I went home. And then that's, I hooked up with Elle after that. And then I, I got promised to Shia and What age was this as far as? Uh, 15, 14, 15 is. There was a lot that happened in that year. Cause I went to boarding school, I didn't fit in. I had a job, but I was a scholarship kid. I was smarter than everybody. The fucking Dean hated me at my dorm and she was a piece of fucking shit. She was married to a younger guy. Her father was on the board of the school and all they did was fuck all day and smoke weed and act like we couldn't smell it. And I just, I'm like, you an entitled little white bitch. This nepotism shit is going too fucking far. You, you're not fit to be the dorm mother for teenage girls. You act like one yourself. She didn't like me so much, so she started doctoring up my file and putting shit in my file that wasn't true about me. I had a friend of mine that worked in her office as her assistant, and she bumped into my file and saw the doctor and up my file saying I was doing all this shit. She like staged all of these fucking events of shit that I didn't even fucking do. I could have probably handled it differently. The next day we had a dorm meeting. I wasn't speaking. She insisted that I speak. I told her, you don't want me to speak because you don't want to hear what I got to say about you. And she said, well, I'll just, write, I'll just write this in your file. I was like, like the rest of the fiction you wrote in my file? How do you know what's in your file? I said, bitch, because I broke into your fucking office and I read it last night. And she said, oh, well, I'm writing you up for that. I was like, you know what, let me give you something to really write up. So I got up and I went into the bathroom and the powder room in the lobby by the phone booths. This is at Garden State Academy. Seven day Adventist school, you fucks. I went into that fucking bathroom and I ripped the motherfucking, um, <clears throat> the towel rack off the wall. And I came back out there in front of everybody and I beat the fuck out of her with that shit. I beat that fucking bitch until she bled out her fucking mouth, nose. She's bleeding out of fucking ear. Waka, waka, waka. They finally got me off her, and then all of us, I'm the devil! <laughs> She's a demon, she can't be in a Christian. Fuck y'all, I do Muslim anyway, bitch. So then I couldn't get into no other school because they thought that they was gonna press criminal charges against me. And so I lost my ninth grade year. They stole all my shit. They fucked up my clothes. They cut up my clothes. I mean, it was cool. I went home, and then I left home. I went back to New York. I went to Brooklyn. I 
I was staying at the community at Bushwick and Flatbush. I ran away from home when I got tired. But, uh, yeah, my ninth grade year was washed, and then we had to figure out what school would take me because of my violent tendencies. And then I got raped by um, my sister fiance. In that situation, um, and it's touchy, but it's always, not say two sides of the story, but it's always a perception. I left home because me and my dad was arguing. He asked me, was I still talking to that murderer that buys me all the gifts? I'm so glad he never found that fucking Rolex. I ended up pawning that shit and keeping the money because I couldn't wear it. What if, what if, what I only got 7500 for it. He paid twenty five. What did he do? Who? Walt? Yeah. He was a contract killer was... for the Gambino family. situation in which you were violated by technically, technically a family member. He made 20 stacks a job, and every time he did a job, he gave me five, five grand. Yeah. Did you ever have to? During the course of our relationship, Walt Reader must have gave me about 150000 How fucked up is it when you're nine years older than your sister, you 14, and she fucking 23, and that bitch come and asking you to borrow money? I used to peel money off to my sister. At 13. That's how long I've been getting money. That my 20 some year old sister would come. You, you got like $300? Hold on, let me see. And you let your daughter do that surviving Tasha K shit. Fuck you, bitch. Because I paid for her, too. I paid for all your fucking kids and your son, your fucking disrespect. Oh, I raised all your fucking kids, bitch, while you sat there and you fucking smoked crack and fucked everything. Yeah. Let's do it like that, huh? So anyway, me and my dad got into an argument. You still fucking with that killer? You still fucking with that? He could kill you. I wish he'd kill you. We duped it out. I got him up underneath his ribs. He got me in the jaw. I left. My father didn't beat me after a certain age. We just fist fought. I remember the first time my dad got scared of me. That was interesting. Because I wasn't going to stop fighting him back. I didn't give a fuck how hard he hit me. I was going to hit him back with every fucking thing I had. Fuck that. You going to respect me. So, yeah, I went to my sister's house, and she was stripping at some piece of shit bar in Frankfurt. Stripping and getting high. Her fiancé, Jamie Wallace, was supposed to have been going to Atlanta with his cousins and his uncle and his brother for the weekend. So the apartment was supposed to have been empty except for when my sister was home. I needed some time alone. I, I could have called my friends. I could have hung out with my friends. I could have called my dude, Tweet. Tweet would have came pick me up. We could have burned one. Like, I wanted to be alone. So I went to my sister's place because she was at work. And her boyfriend was supposed to have been in Atlanta for the weekend. I got there. I took the bus to 554. Got off at La Martinique Bowling Alley. The apartments was right across the street, Stratmere. She left the key under the mat. I went to the apartment. 
All I did was listen to music and smoke a joint and a couple of Lucy's that I bought. Ate a poor man meal, three chicken wings, rice and gravy. And I laid down on the couch. She called, check on me, see if I made it in the house okay. I told her I was sleeping on the couch. She was like, no, you can lay down on the bed. Ain't nobody going to be there. You ain't got to sleep. I was like, no, that's you and Jamie's bed. I don't need to sleep in your bed. I'll just lay here on the couch. I'll be fine. She said, ain't nobody. You ain't got no company. I was like, no, I just want to be alone. And she said, just lay down on the bed. I'll wake you up when I get home and we'll have breakfast and we can talk about what happened with you and dad. So I laid on her bed. I didn't get under the covers. I didn't even take my clothes off. I only took my shoes off. I left my socks on, everything. I went to sleep. And when I woke up, Jamie Wallace was on top of me. I was trying to get my bearings. You got to understand, I'm 14, 15 years old, about to turn 15. At that time, I was 104 pounds. I was only five foot three and a half. I was little. I, I was barely wearing a size B bra. I think I was like a B32. I was little. He climbed on top of me, pulled my pants down and rigged them around my ankles so I couldn't run. I knew you was going to feel like this. I knew you would feel better than your sister. You going to be the shit when you grow up. He's fucking saying this shit while he's raping me. I fought him off. I kicked him in the nuts. I got one of my feet loose. I ran out the crib. Half naked. Dragging my pants on one leg. Before I got to the door to get to the street, I pulled my pants up. And I ran to White Horse Pike, Route 30. Wasn't no bus in sight. So I just ran. I was on the track team. I was real fast when I was young. I must have ran three and a half miles until I finally caught up with a bus. I got on the bus and took the bus, got off, taunting in White Horse Pike in Berlin. It's a dark road, about two miles to the crib. And all I did was repeat the Lord's Prayer over and over, and I walked all the way home. I got in the house, went in my parents' room. And my mom was on the phone gossiping. I told her I had to talk to her. I didn't quite know how to tell her what had happened to me. Me and my mother never talked about we had never had the mother-daughter sex talk. <laughs> and she was such a fucking prude. I, how the fuck do you explain what just happened? And I said, Mom, he done terrible things to me. He a fucking monster. Shelly can't marry him. I got to call my sister. She can't fucking marry him. And my mom said, well, she's pregnant. I said, yeah, he's a fucking rapist. She can't marry him. He's a monster. Well, I don't know if I would tell her if I was you. Well, why not? Well, women don't like hearing bad things about their men. That was the first time I realized how fucked up in the head my mother was. I said, well, I need to go to the hospital. I need to call the police. Oh, no, you can't do that. If you do that, your father will just, no, he'll kill Jamie. And, and, and Shelly has to get married. She's pregnant out of wedlock again. She has to get married. I said, he's a fucking monster. I'm like, okay, I can't get ready. I can't get through to you. Call my sister. My sister got home from the club. I made my mom take me in the middle of the night back to the apartment. Shelly got into the car. I told her everything that happened exactly as it happened. Her I could have that conversation with very easily because that was the person that I talked to about life shit. What a mistake. Because that bitch ain't got no good advice for no fucking body. So after I tell her everything and say, you cannot marry him, you cannot marry him, that motherfucker's evil. And she looked at me and said, well, I'm just going to have to talk to him and see what he got to say about it. So fuck you need. I'm telling you what the fuck he done to me. Yeah, well, we just going to have to see what he got to say. 
And that's why I was like, all right, I'm going home. Good luck with that. Her and my mom got together. They worked the story. I was jealous that she was getting married because I didn't have no boyfriend. I'm fucking one of the greatest rappers ever fucking lived in the world. And they fucking ain't know it. But I'm jealous of a crackhead rapist. I'm fucking Lamont Coleman on the side. Promised to Dr. York's son in the front. And I'm jealous of a crackhead fucking rapist that rapes little girls? That's what they told my father. Told my father if I came to him talking about this shit that I made it all up because I was jealous and not to believe me. That's what my mother and my sister did to me at the was rape. I, um, I contracted the clap and crabs and gonorrhea. I wasn't allowed to go to the hospital. I wasn't allowed to talk to the police. My god brother, Keon, took me to Planned Parenthood down to CDC, South Philly, on Broad Street, so I could be treated for VD and pregnancy, get my HIV test. I went through all that by my fucking self and my family and helped me with shit. And three months later, I had to sing at that motherfucking wedding. I had to sing the Lord's Prayer and watch my father walk my sister down the aisle to the pussy that had just raped me. And this bitch fucking Jamie piece of shit fucking South Philly task a project piece of shit motherfucker sitting there smiling with a shit eating fucking grin. He wasn't smiling because he was happy to get married. He was smiling because he knew in that moment that he'd gotten away with murder and he was never going to go to jail for what he'd done to me. Fuck you, Jamie. I hope you catch something they can't cure. Or maybe somebody rape you the way you raped me. Maybe I ought to pay somebody to do it. Maybe I finally fucking feel better. I've been gang raped by fucking worse than you, bitch. And you're the only rape that haunts me. I guess because you're still breathing because the rest of them pussies ain't. Don't nobody get to touch me for free. And you ain't dead yet. You owe me! You owe me fucking flesh, bitch! And fuck my fucking sister. I told her until she fucking publicly acknowledged what they done to me, she can't call herself my sister ever again. Fuck you and your motherfucking kids that you had with that rapist, bitch. I don't get no fuck if our mom was raped and all our aunts was raped and if incest was fucking normal. It wasn't never normal to me! I can't argue. Uh, this is all before your 18, so I don't want to end with anything before. I hadn't even got pregnant with Giovanni yet. Not even. When, 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 how old were you when that happened? When I was 15, after the rape, after the wedding, I left home again. And I didn't come back until I was five months pregnant. See, my sister and her husband, after they got married, moved back home with my parents. Cause he's about to go to prison for that credit card scam that they did. And uh, they, my sister, she turned state's evidence and he took, a, he took a deal. So they pretty much stayed at my parents' house up until right before he went away. They got a little railroad apartment down Hamilton. And then he went to jail. But I didn't come home until I was pregnant and showing because I figured that would be the only way he wouldn't touch me. So, so I, I got pregnant to protect myself. Giovanni's father. 
Dani. Was that a relationship? No, he was my choreographer for my girl group, Phillies Blunt, Black Ladies United in Truth. <laughs> That was my first group. We was going to be TLC, but it was six of us, and we could all dance, we could all rap, and I was the lead vocalist. He goes, Don A is what he calls us up, but his name is Donald Boykins. Donnie, they, they filming me talking about my life story. Um, and we're getting to the section where I got pregnant with Giovanni. So if there's anything you don't want me to talk about, you need to um, hit me back and let me know. I know we haven't talked since 2018. I know, I know, I'm fucking terrible. But I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to paint you in a bad light. So just uh, let me know what you don't want me to say. All right, bye. If you're satisfied with the message, press 1. To listen to send your message with normal delivery, press 1. To send your message with urgent delivery, press 2. Thank you. Your message has been sent. So before we get to that part, <clears throat> there's been a lot of, you know, with the music where, you know, you're creating. But there was also a lot of destruction that was happening around you, um, or I'm assuming, um, let's say, you know, as you're getting to your teenage years. Um, did you have any close, either friends, family members that you lost? My cousins and my aunts. When I ran away, I would usually go live with them unless I went to New York. And when I was in New York, I was either down 117th and 2nd with my dude who I used to hustle um, Coke and chocolate tie with. His mom told everybody I was her daughter, so nobody questioned why I was in the neighborhood. Or I stay out Brooklyn, out Flatbush. Um, but if I was in the city, I would either be with my cousin Mark or I'd be at my Aunt Frieda's down southwest Philly, or I'd be at my Aunt Belinda's up uh, Logan, um, 4800 block of Marshall Street, 5th and Loudon, UNLV. Or I was down the projects with my Aunt Dot down uh, Richard Allen. Did you have any close people that passed away or didn't make it? Early on in your life? Oh God, yeah, that, that's a long list. By the time I was 19, I had been to over 150 funerals of just my friends. And I sang at two thirds of those funerals. The worst was when they murdered Sutan. Nigga from the neighborhood, he was a hustler. We, you know, neighborhood dude, Al Logan. Sutan was so cool. Shit. <laughs> See, Sutan liked to get money and I liked to get money. So I always had like mad respect for him. He got caught up in some shit. They cut him down. Hunting in Park, broad daylight in front of everybody. They shot him like 50 times. And then there was my ex dude, Anthony, 
who lived up Cayuga, 15th and Cayuga on the other side of Broad Street. He hustled on my side, Logan's side, UNLV side, and um, there was that day. Me and Aunt had just really started seeing each other. He was a hustler. He called me short. Everybody, you know, that's back when everybody was saying, yo, shorty, yo, shorty. He always had to be special. He got rid of the E, just short, yo, short. <laughs> I was short. He came over every day after school. After I got home from school, because I was going to William Penn, he would meet me at Broad and Alany or meet me at Broad and Loud and stop and take me to get something to eat. And then we'd go to my aunt's house or we'd go to his mom's house where he lived and kick it, smoke, whatever. Me and his mom was cool. Um, I don't know if Anthony's still alive. I hope he is. I hope he got better. Anthony was at my crib all day. I played hooky. Danny was doing a deal with them niggas over on, um, oh, what street was that? Like 11th and Loudon, basically. No, what's a hawking? What's a hawking? They was fucking with some Puerto Rican niggas from the, from the Badlands. They was doing some business with them. Danny was always real cocky. He was on some, I'm gonna take your girl shit all the time. Fucked around with the wrong Puerto Rican niggas. Fucked around with the wrong chick. Little did they know them niggas had been following them all day. Annie at my house, we laid up eating beef and broccoli, watching um, old episodes of Martin and shit. And I'll never forget when Danny came pick him up. And it was Danny driving, and then the other two young bulls was, that they hustled with was in the back seat. And kissed me, jumped into the car. I had to go to Jersey because I was under court-ordered mandatory um, psychiatric treatment because I had a break, and I beat this girl up real bad. I, I, I beat her in her face with a brick. I snapped. I, so I had to go to Jersey every Thursday to meet with my psychiatrist, and um, he was like, call me as soon as you get to Jersey. I might come down here tonight. And I'm like, cool. And so I got on the train. I took the train. I got off of Camden. My mom picked me up, took me to my therapist's office. I went back to my family house in Berlin to sleep. And then I was going to take the train to go to school first thing in the morning. Back to Philly. I called Anthony. I called his mom's house, his sister picked up the phone, and she was like, short, short, is that you? I'm like, yeah, where Annie at? I'm, you know, I finished my homework or whatever, I wanted to see if he was still coming to Jersey tonight because my boy got a party and yada, yada, yada. And she was like, it ain't going nowhere. I said, what you mean he ain't going nowhere? She was like, he in the hospital. I'm like, what do you mean he in the hospital? Where he at? She was like, he down Temple. He down Temple in the ICU. I'm like, what the fuck you mean he in the ICU? So that's when his sister tell me that six blocks away after leaving my aunt's house at 4803 Marshall Street, the Puerto Rican niggas followed Danny and them down to the block. They pulled up alongside of them, ran up. Desert Eagle pump guns. The two niggas in the back seat, they blew the, both of their heads off. The one dude, they had the windows up because it was still winter time. 
So they put they put the, the pump guns on the windows. They shot through the window. It spun the one bullet. The one charge took it, it took Danny whole knee. So his leg ended up having to be amputated. Um, but he was able to drive to Temple with the left leg. They tried to blow Anthony's head off, but he had put his hand up. So when they shot, it instantly blew the middle finger and the pointer finger off. And it twisted the blast enough so instead of going into his head and his head exploding, it just took off like this piece of his head and his brain was exposed. And uh, it happened six blocks away after he kissed me goodbye, told me he might come to church. So um, I got the bus schedule. I knew the head of the ICU unit because it was my boo tweet. It was his mom, his mom. Roger Shade, my Miss Betty, Betty Shade, she was the head of the Noro Intensive Care Unit. So I was able to get in, even though I was technically not family, to go see him. My cousin Donald, God rest his soul, he died during the pandemic, 2020. Um... Donald came with me, and when we, we walked into the room, the aunt was, you know, he had to shit down his throat, man. And, and um, his, they had stapled what they could staple together to cover the brain, because the skull was gone there. And, um, and uh, he, he was, his hand was bandaged up because the two fingers was missing. And he, but his thumb was real black, so it had already started dying. And I, I went into the hospital and I, I grabbed his hand and I, 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 and I said, Annie, it's me, it's short. And then he, he kind of snapped awake and he started grabbing. <laughs> And the machines was going off, and Miss Betty had to rush us out. And my cousin was just crying. He was like, "Yo, Annie fucked up. Yo, Annie." Fu and them niggas came to our crib, and <sighs> Annie survived. He was in the hospital. The other two was dead on arrival because both of their heads got blown out. They had to amputate Danny leg, um, and they had to put a plate. Well, I mean, in Danny leg, and Annie had to get the plate. But they didn't put it in right away because the blood clots kept forming on his brain, so they had to just staple it because they had to go um So yeah, I, I was in the hospital with him every day. Um, Temple Hospital is at Broad in Allegheny, which is a major stop on the Orange Line. And I went to school at William Penn, which is at Broad in Girard, which was a major stop. So I could catch the express train get on at Gerard, and then the next stop was, you know, Allegheny. And so I was there every day. I'd go to school, leave school, go to McDonald's, get him a quarter pound of meal, two apple pies, and um, a chocolate shake. And I was sneaking into the hospital because he hated hospital food. And the McDonald's was right there at the corner of Broad and Gerard. It was perfect, so... Um, and I would come and I would do my homework and sit with him. And then I found out other bitches were sitting with him. And then I came in one day and then Miss Betty was like, um, have you been coming up here having sex with him? And I'm like, fuck no, I ain't having sex with him in no hospital. He's, he's got half a brain. Like, I, he got to recover. She said, well, child, and who gave him the clap? And I'm like, what the fuck you mean he got the clap? This nigga had other fucking booty bitches from the neighborhood coming down there fucking him during the day while I was in school and then get rid of them out of the hospital. So he getting pussy, pussy, pussy. He, he fucking caught the clap. You got half the fucking brain, but your dicks it, it just. Anyway, we broke up after he got home. He finally came home. He wasn't right. He just, he wasn't right. And uh, one day we was laying in his bed and we was smoking an L and I was high as shit. And he started rubbing me with his hand. But see, 
that thumb died. So all of this was gone. And all he had was the ring finger and the pinky finger. And the rest of the hand was gone. So he's sitting there rubbing me with the two fingers, you know, and he's trying to caress me. And I've been an asshole my whole life. I'm just real honest. I said, nigga, you feel like fucking Captain Hook. Get that shit the fuck off me. <laughs> he's like, you a fucking bitch. I'm like, you fucking cripple. <laughs> we was just a real North Philly relationship. And then we went to the McDonald's one day, and he had a seizure in the McDonald's, and I got him home. He had messed all over himself. He had dropped his food and you know, all of that with the, and he was like, I'm fucked up, short. I ain't, I ain't no good, and your life just getting started. Don't come around here no more. And I'm like, fuck you talking about? I nursed you all the way through the hospital. You cheated on me. You got the fucking clack. You scared me half to death. You got piece of brain. You got piece of hand. I've been here all this shit. And you breaking up with me? And he looked at me. He said, sure. I'm out. I'm out the game. All I'm going to do is hold you back. Don't come back here no more. I got dressed and I left, and I never saw Anthony again. I, I never drove past his mother house. Like, even when I was driving around the city, I avoided his block so I would never run into him. I don't know if Annie's still alive. But if you are, I'm sorry. I'm still mad at you for getting the clap in the hospital. So I have to ask y'all. Were you not, did you have any fear in you back then as far as, you know, the drug game, the violence that was going on around uh, in, your, in your neighborhood in Jersey? I understood that violence. It had rules. It had structure. My home life didn't have no rules. Didn't have no structure. I'd rather be fucked over by a stranger than be fucked over by my family. Because if, at least if it's a stranger, I won't feel bad about shooting you because you're a stranger. I might think twice if you're my family. It was just easier that way. Did you see yourself ever being like, involved in a life of crime? I know that I'm a criminal. I've learned how to be a law-abiding citizen. Make you no mistake. I am a fucking criminal. I'm just good at being a criminal. I can't complain about any of the time I've spent in jail in my adult life. The truth is, if I had got caught doing any of the shit that I really did, I'd still be in jail now. So I can't be mad at a couple months in the county and I ain't got no penitentiary number when I, ch I should be doing 25 to life. Did the police know you by name? The feds know me by name. Fuck the cops. Ain't nothing but fucking security guards. So on the creation part, the music. You Saved said, my life. Who were you, you, you said there was a band that was put together or a group. Or yeah, a my group, Philly's Blunt. What was that? Me and my cousins and my girlfriends from my block, Black Ladies Unite, Philly's Blunt. This was when Blunts was very big. We was gonna be bigger than TLC cause there was more of us and I could sing. There was six girls in the group. So we had double what TLC had. So the routines, the choreography, dope as fuck. But then everybody got boyfriends and started getting pregnant. What were the ages of them? Um, that was, everybody in the group was between the age of 13 to 15. And we had a manager, and I got us booked for our first talent show. And then that get, got me a gig singing backgrounds for a girl from Southwest Philly. I can't remember her name now. She lived down... Um, 47th and um, 
and Baltimore. I was at 47th and Woodland, so I would have to go over her house and do the choreography. That's where I met my baby daddy. He was doing choreography for her too. And um, we did a Teen Summit. I was her, one of her backup dancers for Teen Summit. Yeah. And then she, um, she got fucked over by Hak Islam and nobody ever heard from her again. Hak Islam fucked her over so he could manage Maya. And Drew Hill. And then we being, being love bitches who he got all of them pregnant. He got the whole fucking group pregnant. How the fuck you, the manager, and you get every bitch in the group pregnant? We must be in. We must be in love. You remember that song? Yup. I get slime fucked all them bitches. Got them all pregnant. How old was he? I don't fucking know. He old as fuck now. He was old as dirt then. Hawk was in his 40s back then. That was in the early 90s, so. Hawk should be like damn near 70. Dirty bitch. I'm so glad my ain't gave you no pussy. You was trying to fuck her too hot. <laughs> Your dirty fucking pedophile ass. But I do know that you fuck Cisco. Hot. Nobody safe. Nobody safe. What you think I ain't know? Maya told everybody you was fucking Cisco. <laughs> it's Sigma Cell. Everybody tells Mike Tarsia everything. Because everybody gets high with Mike Tarsia. <laughs> First time I seen Grace Joe's fucking ass ball pussy neck, it was with Mike Tarsia. Because she only sing in the booth naked. That's the only way Grace Jones can record. She got to be ass naked in the booth. But yeah. So anyway, what was we talking about? Billy Blunt. Philly's blunt. Yeah, that came and went. Everybody got pregnant. And then I became a solo artist. <laughs> but I wasn't a singer. I was a rapper. A rapper. Yeah. That's where the name Jaguar come from. I was in a, I was in a, um, after Philly's blunt, I got into a group from Chester, Pennsylvania called the Zoo Click. And so everybody had animal names. But they all had like cool names and shit, Wolverine and Grizz and all. I'm like, I want an X-Man name. But they said, you want to be Jack? Jimmy looked at me. I was dating Jimmy at the time. I did a lot of dating when I was young. So I was dating Jimmy at the time. Jimmy Grizz from Fat Cat, not from Fat Cat Click, from the Zoo Click. Everybody was a click back then. And um, Jimmy was like, Jack, if you want to be in the group, your name is Jaguar. If your name ain't Jaguar, you can't be in the group. I was like, fuck it, I want to be in the group. I'll be this Jaguar bullshit. I felt like I was getting cheated. And being the geek that I am, I started studying the animal. And I started realizing how much I had in common with the animal. And then I started loving this animal. And I became that animal. I became Jaguar. I was the illest female MC on the streets of Philadelphia. I ghost wrote for Eve. I ghost wrote for Foxy Brown and she don't even know it. <laughs> Easiest thousand dollars I ever made. Fuck you, Inga. You ungrateful bitch. Frank Bank came to me and asked me ghost write for Eve before you died. And I did. I ghost wrote for a lot of people. You're welcome, Candy. And I'm talking about Candy Burris from Escape. Those early records that I wrote, those demos that I wrote down at Key Sweat Studio that your manager took and gave to y'all and had y'all front off like you actually fucking wrote them. Stole my records clean out from underneath me. I never got paid, Escape. But when, when the records made it a hit on the radio, it told me one thing. If they can steal your shit and, and it can make it on the radio, you can do your shit and it can make it on the radio. So y'all welcome for them ass cap awards and shit that you got for them early records. Y'all bitches know you didn't write. But I ain't hating. I'm happy for you.
Bravo. There's still a... No, because there's the whole in between that time after I had Giovanni and getting signed, there were the four years that I was a dominatrix and a pimp. Being a young adolescent and kind of knowing how you, you know, how you like was, did you want any pimp? Like, yes, I wanted six kids. So with that being said, uh, I had six kids. I only had one living child. Your first time getting pregnant was the time you actually had the body? No. Before? I was pregnant before then. I kept him because I lost the child. I had a baby while I ran away. I had a premature. She lived for 13 weeks. She died, sis. We buried her at the mosque in Plainfield in the backyard. Her name? Naija Nefatima Muhammad. Beautiful baby. I kept that shit. I ain't even tell my parents. All they knew was that I was gone and I came home. I never told my family about her. That was between me, her father, and the imam. And then her father got murdered right after that. So it was weird. It was a situation. I went to boarding school. I was fucking around. Akbar was dope. <laughs> He had a twin brother. They hustled in Plainfield in North, down Brick City. And he came into my life. It was a whirlwind. I got pregnant while I was at board in school and I was, I was doing shit. What age was this? 14. And um, I like bad guys. But Ak was, he was just that dude that no matter what I asked him, he would do it. I could ask him for anything, and he would just do it. Like, that was the first time I experienced that. Like, a man that's really that much about you that there's anything you could ask for. If I had asked that nigga to buy me a plane, he would have fucking hustled until he got it. Like, <laughs> and then gave it to me. Um, he was really smart, and he was very heavy on his dean. He was very heavy in Islam. His belief made me want to believe. Like just the power that he 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 drew from reading the Quran and making prayer, and we would make salat and always praying to the East, you know, it was, we were kids, but he was so on his dean. And his brother was the exact opposite. His brother, his identical twin was a fuck ass, was running around raping and fucking half of North Jersey, robbing. He had a lot of enemies. So what was your denomination growing up? Uh, I, know you said I was born and raised Seventh Day Adventist and I was rebaptizing on Seventh Day Adventist still. Um, but I really don't believe in religion. I honor the word. So people like me, we take the dean, the walk very seriously. I got pregnant, I had my pregnancy. I had Niasia when I was 28 weeks and she was over seven pounds. At 28 weeks, she was going to be huge. We was at the mosque. And one day I went to go nurse her and she was blue. And then her father got murdered six months later. After, after we buried her, 
I went home because I had been missing for like four months. So I always was missing when I was a kid. But I came home and it was like nothing ever happened. And I was doing dishes and I just buried my child but I was doing dishes and vacuuming carpets and raking up the leaves. Like nothing ever happened. Like I was never gone at all. I never brought it up. I never talked to nobody. Were you mentally prepped to be my mother at the time? Mentally. God, no. No 14 year old girl is. But it definitely it changed my perspective about what that is. I was at baby's mother for, for 13 weeks. And then um, I went to go visit I. We hadn't seen each other for like four or five months because when I came home, I knew I had to be home, you know. No. Yeah, pull up. You know what I mean? I, I got to, you know, do all the right things and because I was a runaway. So it was about four and a half months. And um, there was an audition, it was an open casting call in New York and that was my excuse for leaving. I didn't go to the casting call. I never made it to New York. I got off in Trenton. <laughs> Ock picked me up and we drove the rest of the way to Plainfield and we hung out, you know, it was just like nothing, like no time had passed. And I was leaving to go back home because I couldn't stay the night because I had to be back home. I was just going to New York for all I did shit. And he put me in a cab to take me to the train station. Of course, he caked me out, gave me money. And as I was pulling off, that's when I seen the car come up. And then four niggas um, jumped out and then they just shot him. Um, they thought he was his twin brother. Um, I had seen people get shot before. But when I saw him getting shot, in that moment, the first thing that came to my mind was, Naija gone, now he gone. And it's like this whole part of my life never happened. And so I made the cab pull around. He ain't want to pull around because they were shooting. I'm like, you better turn around. And he didn't want to turn around, so I pulled my knife out and I put it to his neck. And I said, so help me God, if you don't turn this car around, I'm going to cut your fucking throat. And um, he turned around. They got in the car and they pulled off and I, and I got to be with our it was about five minutes. And uh, he, he died on my lap. And he said, I'm going to be with her. I love you. He was going to be with our daughter. And he said, be strong. Because you're alone now. And um, I went to my people crib. I didn't wait for the cops to come. I wasn't a witness and I wasn't asked no fucking questions. So I went to my girlfriend's house, Nefertima. She let me change, shower, get the blood off me, got me some clothes. I took the train, I went home. I did dishes. Now back in. And I made beds and I did laundry. Like nothing ever happened. 
So when I got pregnant with Giovanni, there was absolutely no way I wasn't keeping him. I was keeping him. Um, I know the value of life. Niaja made it possible for Giovanni to survive. Because the truth is, is if that experience had never happened with Niaja, I would have had an abortion um, with Giovanni because I wasn't quite sure who his father was. I knew I wanted his father to be, and I knew who his father could be. His father, father 10 years older than me, too. But the guy that I was in love with was seven years older than me. That was complicated. I ended up being pregnant by Donnie. Um, I did the pregnancy. I went on when I was five months because I wanted to make sure I was showing because that rapist was still living in my house. So I figured if I was pregnant, he wouldn't fuck with me. So I went home when I was five months um, and started preparing to have Giovanni. And um, I mean, it was really wild because then there was that moment. Uh, uh, How old were you at this time? 15, going on 16. I was still fucking with John from the Bojack, see? Bojacks is a notorious crime family in Philadelphia. Real niggas. I met John when I was coming from the hospital. Anthony, the one I told you got shot in the head. So once Anthony dumped me, I was like, fuck it, I might as well kick it with John because he would always see me going to, he, he saw me going to the hospital every day. Why, why you always going to the hospital? Why you always gonna, you eat a lot of um, quarter, quarter pounds and I'm like, they not for me, you know? Because they was always up broad in Allegheny or they'd be on 15th Street hustling. So I was like, fuck it, mine as well. I didn't really understand the gravity of what I was getting into with the Bojacks. Number one, the biggest gangster in that family wasn't a man. It was the sister, Wanda. Wanda motherfucking Bojack. Only bitch tougher than my cousin Tyra in the South Philly area. Wanda motherfucking Bojack wasn't no joke. Wanda Bojack put a nigga down before a nigga get a chance. I seen Wanda Bojack rock a nigga in the fucking jaw with one shot and knock him out cold. Motherfuckers think I'm scary. I know scary bitches. Motherfucking Wanda Bojack. So I fucked with her little, her little cousin, John. Bobby was a brother. Bobby Bojack, crazy than a motherfucker. And Willie was special. They did what? They smoked, you know, they did butt naked. Willie started smoking that butt naked. I'll never forget, we was in the basement. Oh my God. House right off 39th and Lancaster on the bottom. Oh my God. So I'm not smoking this shit with them. Fuck that. I ain't smoking environment fluid. I had me a little joint, untouched, undipped. And I'm watching these niggas trip. They talking all kinds of crazy shit. They talking about aliens. They talking about Beavis and Butthead. They talk, I mean, they was just talking about all kinds of wild shit. Like they were having conversations, but it wasn't lining up. And I'm like, I'm gonna just ride this high out. I ain't gonna say shit. Next thing you know, Wooly pull out the motherfucking Glock. Loaded, cocked. One in the chamber. 
Take your fucking shoes off. Huh? Baby J, you fucking heard me. Take your motherfucker. Okay, yeah. I took my shoes off. Let me see your socks. So you know the little line at the top, you know, that goes over the toes? See, Willie said it's supposed to be at the bottom of the toe. It's not supposed to be at the top. <laughs> so he said, you see this? This how you wear socks, bitches. She got the line go at the bottom. And he's sitting there pulling my foot and showing me, let me see your motherfucking socks. <laughs> I swear to God, first motherfucker, they shit. If your line ain't at the bottom, it's going to be a fucking problem. So he's checking everybody's socks. Bobby said, fuck you, bitch, and pulled the socks up so the line went to the top of the toe. Well, so you think I'm fucking playing? Bobby, I don't get no fuck. Bang! <laughs> he shot his fucking, he shot his family in the leg over the fucking line in the sock. I said, listen to me here. Let me help y'all get y'all socks together. <laughs> I'm running around helping niggas. Get, please don't let this nigga shoot nobody else. You know, that's the Bojacks for you. You know what? We be in the car. We be chilling. Oh, we hungry. We need to get something to eat. Who got the food stamps? We ain't got no food stamps. How much money you got? I ain't spending no money on food. Go to the Chinese food store, order a bunch of food. And then next thing you know, Bobby kicking the door and Willie go in and start beating motherfuckers. Take the food after they cook it and rob the register, you know. <laughs> Fuck you ain't got the car running for. <laughs> I'm sitting in the car. I'm in the back seat. Bitch, this is a fucking robbery. What the fuck you ain't got the car running for? You didn't tell me it was going to be a rob. Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> oh, it was always an adventure with the Bojacks. Until I broke up with John. See, John wanted my baby. He wanted Giovanni to be his baby. And he was very upset with the fact that I got pregnant by somebody else. Even though we hadn't seen each other in five months, because that the last the reason why I stopped seeing them was because the last time we was together, uh, I was dressed very cute. It was very nice, and I ended the night ended with brains all over the side of my fucking face. And at that point in time, I says y'all niggas is just too comfortable with just killing people in front of me. I love y'all. Think you're cool, but I've had enough excitement. And um, John was just, you know, he wasn't very comfortable with the idea of me breaking up with him and having a baby with somebody else. So he kind of um, he kind of took me hostage in his grandma's house. And he tied me up in the basement. And uh, it took me it took me about 12 hours to get out of the house. And. um When he saw that I made it out the front door, he came after me with a gun. And this was in the middle of the day at 39th and Lancaster. Remember, baby, I showed you? And the trolley tracks is there. So he pistol with me with the gun, kicked me in my stomach, and then pulled me out and waited for the trolley to come. And he was trying to hit me in the head to knock me out so the trolley would run over me. And then this guy came out of nowhere the fuck out of John and was like, you ain't going to beat this woman to death in the street in front of me. And he picked me up and he carried me in his house and he cleaned me up and he took care of me. And I stayed with him for two days. And his name was Javon. I called him Javon the Angel, which is why I named Giovanni Giovanni. Because he didn't have to be here. That man had to intervene because John was going to hit me in the head and so he was I was going to get ran over by that trolley like I wasn't breaking up with him so I have to ask how many physical altercations would you say you were in before your 18th birthday I don't know a lot I don't know I mean for a while there 
it was weird when niggas didn't get shot. Like, damn, it's been quiet in the hood. <laughs> you know? Um, I think that that's what confuses people about me because I'm so cultured and I'm so refined and I'm so intelligent that they can't possibly imagine that that's the cover story for the real me. I guess it just never possibly crossed anybody's mind that maybe I'm a motherfucking monster too. Maybe I am a criminal. Maybe I am the worst of the worst. I mean, I, I'm the first to admit it. So I wanna, um, I've witnessed a hundred, over 150 murders in my life. I witnessed. And I've never testified in court. Anyone else testify in your area? I mean, there's some people that tried. Most people that I know that flipped died. I want to take it two different directions. Like people couldn't possibly understand the fact that I'm totally comfortable smelling exit. Don't bother me at all. Don't even turn my stomach. That's how much I've been around it. What's the worst that you've probably seen? Uh, whether it's a gunshot, physical altercation with a knife, uh, you know, a blade or something. The worst? I can't talk about that. I can't talk about that. When it comes to but I've seen... <sighs> I put it to you this way. I became a hunter and a butcher on purpose because I'm not uncomfortable being around um, severed limbs. Blood doesn't bother me. Organs, flesh, even the smell doesn't bother me. Matter of fact, the only dead body I ever smelled that made me sick to my stomach was my son. I couldn't get the smell of his body out of my nose for three months. Couldn't eat. Every time I went to go eat, I just smelled his dead body. That's the only body that ever made me sick. But other than that, I mean, I fucked around with, with dangerous people. I, I hate to be able to admit it, but I've walked in the rooms like after fresh kills, watching people be hacked up in pieces right in front of me. Like we was just cutting up a cow. And that's how I was taught to see it. It ain't no different than killing an animal. Just a different kind of animal. I think that's why people get so uncomfortable around me because they don't understand that I truly live in my base animal self. I don't see what other people see. My husband, and I, I, I had to apologize for saying it to him. I said, please don't ever get to the point where all I see you is, is a meat sack. And I start wondering how many barrels of acid I'm going to need to dissolve you. Don't get me to that fucking point. People talk about life and death. But until you've seen it, like really experienced it. I got sitting there listening to all these people online. Oh, the ashes, the ashes. You should see what I do with blood. People keep, I'm native. 
fresh kill. You take your finger, you dip it in the blood, and you become one with the animal. It's a bonding experience. I can't explain that to normal people. You know. Did you have an opportunity to, like, most girls would be disgusted by that? Did you ever have I'm a, not like most girls. Did you have, like, a girl moment? Where like, I was never meant to be a girl. I was supposed to be a boy. I've been a disappointment my whole life. I came out with a vagina, but I got treated like a boy. All the same. There's no pictures of me until I'm damn near six months old because I was wearing all boy clothes from the baby shower. My Aunt Lois had a picture. God bless her heart. My godmother, 90. She, on, she, she coming to the end. But she has a picture of my baby shower. All blue shit, Superman, Spider-Man, the Credible Hulk, all this shit, and one pink streamer. They bet wrong in a hoe. I've been disappointing people since the day I, I came into this world. What I'm supposed to do, change? So I got treated like a boy. I played with boy toys. I did all boy things. All my friends were boys. I didn't like girls. Girls was... Play with a dog. The fuck out of here. Let's climb trees and shit. You know, I, that's always been me. Is your name supposed to be like Jackie or something? Or like, was it supposed to be a boy's name? Or I, they had a boy's name set up for me. But then my aunt named me when, that, when I came out a girl because they was not prepared. Jacqueline Suzette. My dad wanted to name me Susie after my aunt Susie, who was his favorite sister, his oldest sister, the matriarch of the family. God bless that. Yeah, so thank God. Because I'd have been a mean motherfucker Susie boy. But instead, I'm Jacqueline Suzette. And... French Creole roots, shit. What um? I want to lean off the rap group experience as far as the moment you were going to be a rapper. Yeah. And leaning into. Uh, I was never going to be Whitney Houston. What the point? What the fuck was the point in trying to be the greatest singer ever when the greatest singer ever already came? Well, wait a minute, honey. What did Uncle Robin say on the phone the other day? Still alive. Uncle Robin. Oh, good news. Baby. Yeah, but what did, what did he say he wanted me to start doing again? Singing. No. What? He said, I want you to start spitting again. He said, these niggas don't know. You, yeah. you the finest female MC, period. Hands down. Mm -hmm. He said, you need to start spitting again. <laughs> so even in relationship with like Big L, mm -hmm. uh, was he already rapping? Yeah. He was already the king when I met He was already about to be the king when I met him. I was 14. He was 17. I was with Akbar. And then from Akbar after my daughter died and then I came back to Islam and I went back to Holy Tabernacle, before it was Holy Tabernacle, when they were still the answers, I got promised to Shia. Me and L was creeping that whole time. And a lot of time we spent in my car because I had Philadelphia, I had Pennsylvania t tags. So wasn't nobody looking for him in a Philly car. Creeping. I was, I was the creep master. So at what point does the dominatrix I was auditioning for Broadway plays. I was a single mom. My dad cut my baby daddy a check and told him his services were no longer needed. Thank you. And so, and that was that. Yeah, Donnie came over once when Giovanni was a baby. My dad called him downstairs, cut him a check for $500 and told him to bounce. Don't come back. 
<laughs> um, my dad was that guy. He took the check and never came back. I'd have asked for more. But as a single mom, I was raising my son with my parents. My father was the best male role model I could have asked for for my son, so I was good. Um, I worked really hard, worked really hard to build my career. And um, I would hustle money for pool on the side, but it wasn't enough. If I really wanted to break into the game, I had to be able to play the game. And in order to play the game, you got to pay your way in to the game. L taught me how to do that. But I needed capital. Takes money to make money. So it started out with phone sex. And I was a phone sex operator. Girl six. Yeah, on some girl sex shit. Um, and I was good at it. Because I understood perverts. Because there were so many in my family. So I was making $20 an hour. Just 1993, 94. I'm making twenty dollars an hour, but after the agency takes their fees, and then I pay for my time slots to be on the phone to get the money, I was really only making like eleven dollars an hour. Now, even in the early '90s, that still wasn't bad. But I, I'm just not that chick. So I started asking questions to the girls because there was phone sex lines in there on the one side. And then we had the dominatrix, and then we just had the standard escorts. Um, so I pitched an idea to the owner to start sponsoring bachelor parties. I'm like, we can get the phone sex girls, and we can get the dominatrix girls and the escorts, put a package together, they have it all in one. Full service bachelor party, and then I'll call a caterer. Boom. We bring the bachelor party to you. You know how much fucking money that, that shit made? We was in Atlantic City four nights a week. I was doing five, I was managing five bachelor parties a night, and I worked. Not only did I arrange the party, I worked the party. Kicking niggas asses, spanking them. Putting jello on them, spanking them. Man, I get to beat up niggas for free and get paid? I ain't gonna catch no case when I'm about to do to him. Shit, let's go. Was it mainly Caucasians? It was all kinds, these perverts. I mean, 65% of my client base was Caucasian. It's just a standard. Look at the demographics in the United States. It makes sense. Um, but that other 35% that was color, oddly enough, they were stranger than the white boys. And then I got lost in that, that life. And then I, I became a dominatrix full time. I started out. I would imagine someone asked you to do that. Kind of pushed it with him a little bit. Well, I was dog training. He had a dog fetish. He wanted to be a dog and be treated like a dog. So I had his collar and his leash. And I had a chain for him. And I had a little paddle for him for when he made boo-boo on the carpet or if he made pee-pee on the carpet this motherfucker would piss on his own carpet <laughs> um, I'd walk him around the apartment and he would do tricks and he would beg for treats yeah he was a dog and um you know, sometimes people just evolve. And it just, it went in a bad direction. 
So the one day I came over and I was doing, getting ready to do our normal session. And then I seen that he had the X-Lax on the table and the dog food. And he had the diaper. And I'm like, you add something new today? He said, yeah, yeah, you know, I just, I want to take it further. I want to take it further. I want to, I trust you. I know I can go there with you. So I crushed up the X-Lax and the dog food and I put it in the bowl and he eat it. And he, I put the diaper on him and then I walk him. And then he make the boo-boo in the diaper. So I take the diaper off, then he pees all over the carpet, and I got to beat him. Bad dog, because he's pissing on the carpet. And then um, he wanted me to shove his face in the diaper so he could eat his own shit. And I looked at him, I said, you know you're human, right? Like, you're a human being, dude. I'm not doing this to you. I'll give you an extra thousand. I don't know. Listen to me. You, you should get therapy. Not even you deserve this. Like this. I don't know what you're going. I'm not doing this to you. You're a fucking human being. And he said, please just make me eat it, mistress. Make me eat it. Make me eat it. Then he offered me 5000 extra. I was already getting paid 1200 for two hours. He wanted to put five on top of that. And he always tipped me out 500. I say, no. This pussy went and got 10 grand out of his bedroom. Please do it for me. You're the only one I trust. That pussy was about to pay me 11 thousand twelve hundred dollars with a five hundred dollar tip to make him eat his own shit yeah no I didn't take the money I left I said to myself if I take this money my humanity is over I'm not a human anymore I'm an animal too because all money ain't fucking good money Sucks. That sucks, though. Just, wow. Yeah, I always keep them at the bottom. Shit, man. I'm just thinking about it. I'm going to keep them right at the bottom. <laughs> just, wow. He shot his own cousin in the leg Good, over socks. He was high as fuck? Yeah, they was high as, they was high as fuck on wet. Shit. Them niggas had been through like three or four dippers. Shit. He was zooted. They shot his cousin in the leg over socks. And we had to call the doctor, and the doctor came, took the bullet out, patched him up. Fuck no. That gun had bodies on it. (laughs) Yeah, we didn't do a lot of hospital trips. (laughs) Niggas, Niggas had doctors. That's the beautiful thing about living in the northern cities. Everybody works under the table. Yeah, you don't get too much of that out here. Yeah, the hospital's the no. best man. I, I, that's why anytime they ask me, I'm like, all my shit is done in cash. Like, I... Shit, when my ex-boyfriend shot me. And we went to the hospital together. I ain't tell them he was the one that shot me. I said I caught a stray and I did, but he was the one that shot the bullet. <laughs> you know. So I have a question then. Um, when what during that dump, do you have a do you understand the psychology behind a fetish? Oh absolutely. Yeah, so you know probably what chemically or what's the Oh yeah. You know it's all dopamine. It's all dopamine induced and triggered. I watch it online. A lot of people online don't even realize they got online fetish. Being online has now become a fetish. Yeah. 
it qualifies. A senseless thing that brings nothing into your life, but yet you have to have it. Who the fuck falls in love with a foot? You know, it's a special kind of motherfucker that wants you to shave all your body hair off and wear children's underwear and dance for them with, pig, with a wig with pigtails and shit. So I was going to ask, if you ever have to get in costume too? Oh, absolutely. I was always in character. Um, we had this one client, wonderful old white man in South Jersey. He was a corporate executive at a pharmaceutical company, retired with a um, golden parachute, divorced his wife of 35 years, cut everybody a check, told him to leave him alone. He went and got himself a halfway decent apartment. And um, he dedicated his retirement to um, getting um, escorts and dominatrix smoking crack. And so, you know, come over and we play the dress up. I'd have to do his makeup. He liked very, very, very goth vamp eye makeup. And very, very, very red lips. And I'd get him dressed in his, his undergarments and then put on his gown. And then I would put on a tux. And we would ballroom dance for a half an hour. That was his cardio. And then um, he would start smoking crack. And then I would start bringing the girls over. So I was, listen, no, listen to me. This guy, he started booking girls Thursday night at 6 p.m. And we had girls going out there in eight hour shifts until Monday morning. He was never alone. As soon as one girl was clocking out, the other girl was showing up. And all they had to do was light his crack pipe and, you know, help him play with himself in his women's clothes. I'll never forget there was this one time his, his testicle got lodged because he had his thong on too tight. <laughs> And I had to call his doctor. <laughs> his old ass man with his balls stuck inside him because his drawers is too tight. <laughs> you know, a lot of times it'd be hard not to laugh, you know. The shit that these motherfuckers do is so goddamn ridiculous, you know. You try not to laugh like, motherfucker, are you serious? You know, But well, you're paying me. So what got you out of that lifestyle of making it? So I had a bad week. I evolve real fast in the life. Like I do with anything. Like anything that I do, I'm going to be amazing at it. Like I'm going to be the best that ever did it. That's just my personal standard. So when I came into the game, I knew I wanted to be the top dominatrix in the city. Or at least in the top three. And for a black girl, that in the early 90s, that was hard to accomplish because a lot of them white men didn't trust dealing with black girls because of black rage and they were afraid of getting black mailed. So I became a very trusted worker. Three fifty dollars an hour. 1990 fucking four. 95, I was making three fifty dollars an hour. I was making 10 racks a week. And then when I started going back to doing bachelor parties again and then taking private clients, because my private, when I, when I went through the agency, I was 350 an hour. When I went private, I was a thousand an hour because I'm assuming more risk. And I had a driver. He was my driver and my bodyguard. His name is Mike. I call him Mickey. He calls me Asia. 
That was my mistress name. Mistress Asia. Ain't that odd that I chose that name? My dead daughter's name is Nia Asia. So that's interesting. You, you, said you, you said there was a week that was pretty bad that got you out of that lifestyle. Because the money's good. Yeah. But it was enough just for you to say I'm done? I paid him $200 a night. He worked for me six days a week. And I tipped him out. That man was making $1,000 a week off of me alone. And I didn't mind when he worked with other girls. He's actually very cool with that prostitute that I was telling you about, the Brian McKnight prostitute. She still fucking, she still pissed at him because he loves me more. <laughs> She sold her pussy, and all I did was, was flash mine. And I made more money than her. She was always mad. I told her, this is, this is the sexiest thing you could ever have. You learn how to pimp this. You keep your pussy to yourself. But I forgot about that night. When we went in that bachelor party, the pussies tried to fucking short me. I ran out to the car. All I had on was a thong and a bikini top and five inch stiletto wedges. Five inch. And I'm in a, essentially in a bikini. I goes out to the car, get the back. I already had the gun in my bag, and Mickey had my bag. I said, I'm going to just start hitting these motherfuckers, and if anybody tries to touch me, shoot them. <laughs> Yo, when I came in that fucking party and I took that shit, I said, what That nigga fucking came off his feet. Yo, here's your money, now just go. <laughs> How the fuck do you argue with a crazy black bitch in a bikini fucking hitting niggas with a fucking bat? With a big ass fucking bad boom with a gun in his hand ready to shoot anybody that try to touch it. I've always been this. So. That last week, three things happened. We kept getting this guy. The agencies was calling each other and alerting each other. This guy was strange. He would just call and call and call and call and call until they sent someone out. But the last two girls that went out never came back to work. I drew his call one night because he stopped calling for escorts and he started calling for dominatrix calls. And he refused to come on site to the dungeon. He insisted on a home experience paying double. See, we could take private calls, but you got to pay. And you got to pay for potential hazard pay. So that call was five grand for an hour. It's five grand for an hour. So me and Mickey went. He wouldn't answer the door the first time. He called back four hours later. I had already let Mickey go for the night. I was just going to be manning the phones and making sure all the girls made it back in safe. And the call came up again. And all our other girls that were doing dominatrix services was booked up for the night. I called the owner and told the owner, I think we need to flag this guy. He said, we're about to come up short on one of those bachelor parties. One of the girls lost the bag. You got to take that call. I'm like, what do you mean? I got to take that call. You're the, only, you're the only one that's left. Everybody else is booked. It's $5,000. Take the call. 
I'm like, I'm telling you, I think we need to flag this guy. And I already sent Mickey home. He looked at me, he said, Asia, you have a gun. I mean, you want your job, don't you? So I went back out at 3.30 a.m. in the fucking morning. And I had a bad feeling about this dude. I had my gun. I was wearing my, uh, these patent leather thigh-high boots and I had my gun is inside my boot. Safety off. One in the chamber. We at the door. He's inside. I'm on the other side of the threshold. Some started whispering in my ear and said, do not cross that threshold because you will not come back out. So he keeps insisting that I hurry up and come inside and go downstairs to the basement because he got it all set up and I'm going to love it and I'm going to want to rent his space out and I'm going to want to work there and he has food and wine and grapes and all of it. Like he's selling it so hard. I haven't even made it across the threshold. I step back. And I said, I think you don't understand what this is. I'm the boss. You don't tell me where I'm going. Or when are you going? And then I put my hand inside my boot. And I grabbed for my gun. And I guess he noticed it. And he said, are you armed? And I said, are you scared? I don't think this is going to be a good fit. I said, then pay my $500 cancellation fee right now and I'll go. You haven't even come inside. I'll give you a $500 cancellation to me. You just got to come inside. I said, no. Once again, I don't think you understand how this motherfucking shit goes. And then I pulled the gun out my boot. And I got it sitting on my leg. Like I'm tapping it on my thigh while I'm standing there. I said, you hand me my $500 cancellation fee. He said, I want to give it to you, but you have to come inside. And I took the gun and I went like this. And I went like this. And I said, fuck it. I make thousands. I don't need 500. And I walked off and I got into the car and I drove away. And he ran out as I was pulling off and was standing on the lawn with his hands up in the air. Like, why? The next morning... There was a woman found dead. She was a dominatrix. She was cut up, wrapped in plastic. They found pieces of her floating in the Delaware River. It was the next girl that came to his house. They, had him, they finally caught him and arrested him. He had been cutting up bitches all up and down the eastern seaboard for two months. So I evaded a serial killer. That was the first thing that week. Then I had to work a double at the Voyeur Club where the dungeon was. I had to manage the whole thing and this is a very, very, very elaborate operation. You walk in the door, you got a midget, a midget fuck show. Literally, midgets having hardcore raw rough sex the second you walk in the door. I mean, you don't know, like, how do you prepare for that? The midgets dressed in like patent leather with pussy out fucking shit. This little fucking midget dude with the chaps on and his ass out and, and midgets. <laughs> Biting each other and shit. Fucking midgets. The main chick that worked for us, we called her It. That was her name. It. And um, 
It was kind of fucked up that one Halloween. No, because it was a Michael Jackson themed sex party. And so they had it in a bondage, you know, chained up and shit. With a mask on. And they had objects for you to hit her with. And they were playing Michael Jackson beat it. Well, her name was it. And they, you were supposed to beat her. So beat it. And he had my, beat it, beat it. Motherfuckers just beating the shit out of this fucking midget. She's, ah, ah. That's how you walk in. Welcome to Wonderland. And then there's the main voyeur floor where the live sex shows happened. And the audience, you know, you have to pay, you know, for your seating area. Um, the higher up you went, because there was a balcony, the balcony was always the most expensive. We charged $2,000 for the night for balcony seats. Well, no, because now you get a bird's eye view and you're allowed to film. Only in the balcony. So you pay $2,000 for the night. So it was a three-way gangbang with three guys. And that was the main, that was the show on the main floor. The guy that was getting fucked was one of the guys that raped me in junior high school. So now I'm sitting here watching the guy who gang raped me get gang raped for pay. And this is at my work. That's a fucking head trip. I was drinking drink, um, Jameson from the bottle that night. Because I'm like, and you raped me for free and you get paid. I don't know. So that was number two. Thursday, all hell broke loose. The top dominatrix. She trained me. Excellent. I cannot say her name because I love her children. <clears throat> See, her number one client and her had fallen in love. And so he built a dungeon in his house so she could have an office there and she never had to leave. He put her name on the deed. They were going to get married. But see, the problems with those kind of relationships is they always go too far. They were heavy into autoerotic asphyxiation. Like she was a pro at it. She taught me. She snapped his neck and killed him while they were fucking. I'm going to try to explain this as best as I can. They were into this weird, erotic, satanic Santa thing. So they had a Christmas tree up. And it had like pieces of shit on it. Monkey balls and like weird anal stuff. And, um, you know, the star, the angel at the top. It was the devil fucking an angel. That was the tree topper. And um, she was dressed up like some kind of insane elf with the crotch out. And he was in a Santa diaper hat. And they had a wall mount. So he was up on the wall. In, you know, back against the wall. She had licked 
rigged the Christmas lights up so it could wrap around his neck. And then she had it levered so she could pull it and it would snatch his neck. So she would climb on top of him and be riding him on the wall and be yanking at the same time and choking him. I mean, this shit was brilliant. She's fucking the shit out of this dude and choking him off. I don't know what happened. She went too far. Snapped his neck clean. She called us. We came to come get her and come clean up the scene. And she, she refused to leave. I said, we got to go before his body temp starts changing. And call 911, we got to get you the fuck out of here. I'm not going anywhere. It's my house. Y'all want some coffee? She went upstairs and made coffee. I'm looking at old boy. Like, does this bitch realize this is a dead body hanging here on this wall and she killed him? This could go for first degree manslaughter. Maybe she killed him for the will. Her name had just went on. Like, why? She not getting that we need to go? While she was making us coffee upstairs and we're trying to figure out what we got to say to get her the fuck out of the door, she called fucking 911. And told him to come get him and bring a wagon. Y'all said that? Now it's too late. I ain't do nothing wrong. Look at the smile on his face. She gets arrested for second degree murder. And charged with first degree manslaughter as well. And a handful of other charges. I quit. <laughs> I'm done. My mentor is fitting to go to jail for killing her boyfriend, which she was happy to do because he died with a smile on his face. I evaded a serial killer by the hands on my chinny chin chin. And I watched my rapist get raped for, fa for, for fucking money at my job. And I had to stay and watch because it was my job. That was my last week in the life. <laughs> Want to know how that case turned out for her, though? She drew the wrong judge. He was a client. It could have went smooth. It could have went real smooth. He was one of our top clients. This motherfucker liked to wear bra and panties up underneath his robe with nipple clamps and shit while he's sitting on the bench judging motherfuckers like he's a real whole weirdo. Circuit court judge, you know who the fuck you are. If I walk into his courtroom now, whoever's on trial is getting all charges dismissed. Just if I wink. <laughs> so... Could have went sweet. She ended up getting 15 years. Ask me how. I don't fucking understand why we got to do this. Why? We can just do it like we always do. We can go into the back. We can just go into the back and work it out. You know this shit is a farce. Now, meanwhile, the jury has seen pictures of the crime scene. Satanic Santa shit everywhere. A diaper under the tree filled with human feces. For ambiance. She looks like an insane elf. Red lipstick smeared up the side of her face. On some look, whatever happened to baby Jane? <laughs> These are the pictures that the jury's seeing. And this poor old white man. Like this. With a smile, ha tongue. Hanging from a wall. 
I don't understand what the fuck is your problem. This is the best night of his goddamn life. We should be celebrating him. How many people get to die doing what they love? <laughs> She's yelling this at the jury and threatening to expose the judge as a client. 10 years. Oh, well, don't be a pussy about it. Fine, bitch, 15. <laughs> She just got out two years ago. The world has changed a lot since she's been away. She ran into some trouble while she was in jail and had to do some more time. Yeah. It made me start questioning humanity and my humanity. When I first got into Dominatrix, it was for the money. It became cathartic for me. I got to work out a lot of my demons on these sickos. But then I started thinking and seeing everybody and everybody just looked like fucking sickos. What the fuck you into, you know? Fuck going on a date. I'm looking for your pervert. And a lot of times I found it. There's a line a psychological line you have to cross in order to fully commit to that life. You have to be able to stop seeing human beings as human beings. They have to become objects or animals or just money. Yeah, I had to get away from that shit. But I made enough money to finance me and to bankroll me so that I could spend more time focusing on my music. Truth is, in those four years that I was in the life on and off, I made three quarters of a million dollars cash. Um, I gave 250 of it to my mom and my dad for my son. You're watching yourself Yeah. I couldn't take him. I couldn't drag him through all the shit that I was fucking into. Shit, it was bad enough when we got shot. When the car got shot when he was a baby. We was up um, Erie and out, um, Erie, Erie and Germantown Avenue right there, Broad and Erie. I was dating a not so nice guy. People knew that I was his woman. Some of his rivals bumped in. They wanted to send a message. So they started shooting up my car. And my son was in a car seat. A bullet literally just missed Giovanni's car seat while I'm getting cheesesteaks. So I really didn't feel comfortable having my son in the street with me like that. Because I realized I'm a target all the time. Um, So you traded, you got out of that life and then music. Yeah. The next thing, yeah. I'm just curious. I got a job at Wawa. Oh. And I started working a square job for $9.50 an hour. You know how fucking humiliating that was? Those paychecks. I'm working doubles and after taxes. I'm lucky if I get to keep 500. I was used to making that in an hour. Y'all yeah, fucking humiliating that is. Then the bitches started talking shit. Power 99 on, because I, I, worked, I worked third shift because it paid the most. So, girls talking, oh, such and such on the radio. Oh, I wonder what they like. Oh, he all right. Oh, I wonder what she all right. Oh, well, he all right, she all right. You don't know all these people. I really do. No, no, you don't. Because if you knew all these people, you wouldn't be here working with us. And I was like, you know what? Great point. I had signed up for a double shift. Because I was trying to cake up fast. I had three jobs. I was working at Wawa. I was working at Victoria's Secret. And I was working at Hex. 
all at the same time. So I was working 90 hours a week because I was trying to find a way to at least be getting legally legit a G a week after taxes. Which wasn't bad money back in the 90s. A G a week in the 90s now is like three to four G's a week. So I got all these hours. I'm working 90 hours. Just so I could clear twelve hundred in a week, and I'm used to doing that in a half a day. Couldn't gamble no more because I was a gambling addict. I just bought a bunch of new clothes. Got um, I bought a microphone. I bought an MP for my boyfriend because he was making beats. So I only had like sixty five dollars in my account. So I, I started booking myself for doubles to try to make up for the money that I just spent. Um, so I quit. <laughs> oh, what are you gonna do, my manager? You gonna run off and go, so you can go be Whitney Houston? I said, no, I'm gonna go be me. I said, the next time I see you, I'm gonna come back here and you gonna make my sandwiches. A year later, I pulled up wearing a chinchilla coat in a brand new ML 500 Sports Edition, brand new off a lot, Mercedes Benz. It was an Eagles game coming on. I came to pick up hoagies for me and my dad, chips and cream soda. I walks in. This was like right after we had done the Chris Rock show. And everybody was talking about it. And then, I got, you know, I got the best man and all of that. I walks in. All the girls, it's Jacqueline. Oh, my God. I saw you in there. Oh, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? So the manager come out. And he said, girls, I'm taking this lady's order. And he made my fucking sandwiches. And he said, I never, made, I never met anybody that made me eat my words. He said, you look fabulous on the Chris Rock show. I was proud to tell everybody you used to be my star employee. See, whatever I do, I'm amazing at it. At the Wawa that I worked at, I ran the coffee center and I did, I, I did all of the prep for all the sandwiches. I made the fastest hoagies and I had the most popping coffee center when everyone would come in. Cause see, I got OCD, so I don't like motherfuckers coming in dirty and up my shit, and I gotta keep cleaning after motherfuckers, cleaning after motherfuckers. So you know what I did? I served everyone their coffee. They would come in, they would put what they wanted in their cup, and then they come by, and I pull, I pour. And my station stayed clean, and it moved fast and efficiently, and the register went like clockwork. Hot coffee and a butter roll, hot coffee and a butter roll. I used to run through about 150 of those in about 25 minutes. I ran my shit so efficiently, it didn't make any sense. They wanted me to do management. They wanted to train me for management for the store. I just do great at whatever I do. That's how my daddy raised me. But yeah, you made my sandwiches. And then that's right, that's when the roots in me. Yeah, what was yeah. the introduction as far as your, what would you say is your kickoff into the music business? Like, Interning in the Philadelphia International for my Uncle Kenny Gamble. I grew up with Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. I grew up around Patti LaBelle. I watched Phyllis Hyman record Meet Me on the Fucking Moon. I've been around greatness my whole life in one way or the other. You don't take that back as far as interning? Yes. I mean, the interning was the interning. But because of that internship, it put me in league with Gerald Levert at 15. And he was my mentor and writer. And then later he became my lover and we talked about getting married and then he dropped dead. It's so funny when I watch all of these bitches argue about who Gerald Levert loved the most. Like, Apparently, Kim Whitley and Sherry Shepard got issue with Monique over Gerald LeVert. Gerald LeVert ain't getting no fuck about none of y'all bitches. And least of all, Mickey Howard. 
He loved you, Mickey, but Mickey, he told me you was fucking clingy. You was clingy as shit. And now Candy Burris want to talk about how she was with Gerald LaVert. Everybody wants to be with Gerald, even Deanna Williams, Kenny Gamble, baby mom. You still mad. You still big mad that he loved me. I was going to head up his back line. His last album, he had finally gotten out of hock with the company and they was actually going to have to pay him for it and own his own masters. He dropped dead before it was released. Anybody who doesn't believe it, you can call down to the Palm now. When I had to cancel our dinner reservations when he was going to publicly propose to me in Philadelphia at the Palm. I had to cancel those, uh, those dinner plans two days after he died. I forgot. I found out that Gerald was dead after doing a Nina Simone tribute concert with Forrest and Belial in New York. And I was on my way back to Philly and I was on the train and people started calling me and they started saying Gerald is dead. And I said, you a motherfucking lie. And then I called Big Joe. I called him Big Baby, his personal bodyguard. And I say, say it ain't so, Joe. He said, I can't tell you that, baby girl, because it is. His funeral was fucking heartbreaking. It was fucking heartbreaking. And I sit here and I listen to all these bitches, all these fucking bitches. Did I finally erase it? I used to have his number in my phone. I think I finally erased it. I kept Gerald's number in my phone for many years and sometimes I would call it and one time I called and a woman answered and I said, did you know that this was Gerald Avert's phone number? And she said, no. I said, how lucky for you. That man loved me and when he died, I truly felt alone in this business because he was the only, he was the only one that protected me from the, from the monsters and from the wolves. And, and Gerald died and I was on my own in the game. Were you recording or doing shows and touring at the time? Ghost writing for him. Me and Scott Storch grew up ghost writing together. For, uh, that's how me and Scott got together. Scott's a part of that. I mean, he's something. he's something. I know he like used pussy. He like everything brand new but pussy. That nigga got to spend, he'll spend, just so he can be the first one that walked into a restaurant, he'll spend big bread. But the pussy got to be ran through. We got into an argument one time, me and Scott, and he said to me, I don't fucking know why you don't want to be with me. I said, because I consider it an insult. And he said, you consider me being with you an insult? I said, yeah, because you only fuck with whores. I ain't a whore. Fuck you, Jag. No, I won't fuck you. Bitch. I'll never forget when that nigga was running around with clip-on earrings. Four carat clip-on earrings. Because he was too lazy to get his ears pierced. Then he started dating the Heather Hunter. And, and, I, and got mad at me. Because I laughed at him when, when I told him. Because I, I said to him, I was like, you know that bitch, only, all she going to do is bring her work home with her. He said, what? I said, all that bitch gonna do is bring her work home with her. And then he came in the house and seen her fucking three dudes. <laughs> well, you wanted a porn star. <laughs> that was after fucking Paris Hilton fucking scammed him into spending $40 million on her. That bitch was worth more money than him. Why was you spending all your bread? Because I, I walked up to her. The night that Suge Knight got shot. And I walked up to her in the bathroom. We was all having dinner in Nobu. Right there in the Shore Club on Collins. And I walked up to her in the bathroom. And I said, she said, what are you doing? I said, I just want to see if it's true. She said, what's true? I said, everybody say you, you smell like dirty bed sheets. They right. You smell stale. You know, like you've been fucked through or something. 
you know, I don't care what you got to say, you fucking nigger bitch. I'm with Scott, and I don't care if you don't like it. I said, you know, if I didn't want to get arrested, I said, I don't want to get arrested. I said, but I'm, I'm about to choke the fuck out of you. Call me a nigga one more time, bitch. Pop, 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 pop. This bitch opens up the bathroom door, looks out, comes back in, messes up her hair, and then runs out screaming, hoping to get pictures taken of her by the paparazzi. I fucking lie to you not. This is how fucking fucked up Paris Hilton is. She made it out to the cameras before they rolled Suge Knight out. And he's the one that got shot. Ah! Ain't nobody else running. This bitch was the only one running looking for a camera. And she lucky them pops came because I was about to take her ass in that stall and work her up. Get no fuck, I'll fuck you up in no boo. And then saved by the shots. And then the next thing you know, I come out, I'm standing right there because, the, you know, the, the dining hall is right there. And then there's the long corridor and then you walk down and then the entrance out in the Collins. The bathrooms is right there along that walkway. So that's when I seen him rolling Suge and Suge was on his stomach and his ass was up and there's this big red spot. I said, God damn, Suge, they shot you in the ass. <laughs> I said, God damn it. Man, I'm walking you. I'm telling you, it was like a scene from The Wizard of Oz. Ding dong, the wicked chick is dead. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, you hear shot, shot, I got shot ass. Everybody was so excited. <laughs> I've never seen people so happy to see somebody get shot before. But MTV video, video Music Award time in Miami back then, it was always some wild shit. But yeah, Paris Hill made it to the camera for sure, did. And he the one that got shot. Fuck you, Paris Hilton. And I wish you and your whack-ass mama would stop lying. You know y'all the ones who taught the Kardashians how to do the mother-daughter sex tape. You know they got it from you. Kim was your assistant. Them Kardashian bitches ain't got an original head. Thought in their head. Paris made that shit up. The first time I seen her sex tape, Scott played it. In the studio, on the big screen, it was like, that's going to be my girlfriend. And he, and, she, and he did. I give him that. A night in Paris. <laughs> Only cost you $40 million in your dignity. <laughs> but you know what? I can't hate. Because to be able to say that you got $40 million to throw away on a rich bitch, you made that $40 million. Facts. I just wouldn't have wasted it on that whore. As you were ghostwriting uh, LaVert, Scott, how did you get into a situation where you're taking part of the roots? Like, how, how, who... I never wanted to be part of the roots. I wanted to build Black Lily. And Black Lily was an entity of the roots crew. More importantly than that, I wanted to work with Richard Nichols. And the only way you get to work with Richard Nichols is if you're a part of Watch Your Bag Management. It was a cat. They needed me for street cred because Malik wasn't around anymore. Malik was done with the shenanigans. He was with them for how long early on? He was with them until the day he died. How many years prior? Uh, From the beginning. Without Malik B, there is no Grammy. Without Malik B, there is no record deal. Tariq was a fledgling writer. Malik never ran out of words. Imagine what that's like. You're struggling. Four, five days to get 16 bars, and this nigga wakes up from a nod on, on pancake and syrup and come out and fucking spit 36 and go back to sleep. I don't know, I guess that's how you justified stealing his lyrics so you could be called one of the greatest rappers. He didn't remember, he, he said them. <laughs> 
He was so high sometime. Black Lily was something that you wanted to see. It was an all women's event. And I knew if I put that event on my back and I pushed every last one of them motherfuckers that was in that show. See, the thing with Black Lily was it was everybody against Jag. Because nobody wanted to perform after me. Nobody wanted to perform after me. You know how many gigs I didn't get as an opening act because the headliner was afraid to go on after me? Over a thousand. I've counted in 20 years. A thousand, no, you can't be on this tour because you terrify the motherfucker who's headlining. Imagine that. I don't give a fuck when I go on first or last. It's going to be the same show. You strive to be the best, though. I strive to be the best me. I don't give no fuck about everybody else. Like, I think that's the one thing that I love about Charleston. I'm so worried about what the fuck I'm doing, I don't even see who's hating on me. I'm worried about my business. You should be worried about yours. But they all try to compete with me. And they get mad because I don't compete with anybody but myself. How old are you at this time? 22. Five years after the last gang rape. A year and a half out of the life. With a six-year-old kid and no father. And yet, with all of that working against me, I still never made anything less than $2,000 a week. My mom had a box, a shoe box in her closet filled with cash, 50s and 100s. It was, it was for my lawyer just in case I got booked. I kept $50,000 in that box at all times. And if she needed anything, she'd just go get it out the box. And then I would replace it. Imagine what it's like to be 19 years old and your mom say, well, I'm coming up a little short on the mortgage and I need a new washer and dryer. Can I get it out the box? Just go get it out the box, mom. And then you come back and the box is full again. My mom had a box with $50,000 in it for 10 years. And the box always had $50,000, no matter how many times she went in it. At your highest, uh, what would you say you brought in or you had on you a year, uh, your highest grossing year? Legal or otherwise? Otherwise. Otherwise money? Street money? I make a half a million a year easy. If I'm really pushing it, I can do 1.3. But it's all liquid, it's all cash, and I can't. So I can, all I can do is move it around and manipulate it. I mean, the truth is, is, if I wanted to right now, I can make a phone call and have a million dollars cash here in four days. I don't worry about money because I am the money. Money chase me. I don't chase it. My husband would get mad at me. We need this, we need that, we need this, then go make some money. What do you mean just go make some money? Let me show you how it's done. Send me a thousand. When? Tomorrow? One o'clock? All right. How many times have you seen me do that, honey? Honey, how many times have you seen me just pick up the phone and tell somebody to give me fucking money? <laughs> My husband be getting mad because every time we be coming up short 
and I won't go get no money and I can. Want to know why? Because if we everything we say we are, we should be able to survive without fucking money. That's the baddest motherfucker in the room that can live a five star life and you wouldn't even know it. Shout out real ass street stars, nigga. Moolah. Hey.